very crucial to have scientific knowledge about COVID-19. And there is a lot of curiosity in everyone's mind currently to know more and more about this virus. How SARS-CoV-2 virus enters inside our body, how it interacts with normal cells of body, what kind of immune responses are generated during viral infections, how our immune system fights against COVID-19, how vaccines work and protect us, how can we acquire long-term immunity from this virus, and specifically, how antibodies and memory cells are generated so that the reoccurrence of infection can be prevented, what are the implications of the emergence of new viral mutations, novel international and homegrown viral variants? Do they have a role to play when considering vaccine effectiveness? These are some of the most common questions that come to our mind when we think about COVID-19. Young researchers, students, and people from non-science groups are also taking interest in COVID-19 immunology currently. So we at the Department of Biotechnology, Dr. Shelly Tomer and myself, we have organized this virtual symposium at IIT Roorkee under the aegis of Indian Immunology Society to provide you more information regarding COVID-19 immunology. Experienced researchers from different research institutes of India as well as abroad will deliver lectures on this topic today. Our speakers and panelists are renowned researchers in immunology, virology, microbiology, and vaccine biology. Let me briefly welcome and introduce all the panelists present in this symposium today with us. Professor Shahid Jamil is a senior virologist and director, Trivedi School of Biosciences at Ashoka University. He is chairperson of the scientific advisory group of the Indian SARS-CoV-2 Genomic Consortia, launched and coordinated by the Department of Biotechnology in coordination with Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, ICMR, and CSIR Government of India. Professor Vinita Bal is a senior immunologist from National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, and currently visiting faculty at ISER Pune, who is extremely noted for her views on COVID-19 research. Professor Raghavan Vardrajan is a biophysicist and senior vaccinologist working at IAC Bangalore, who is also a co-founder of MinVax, which is now developing a homegrown heat stable COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Prabhutta Kundu, co-founder and managing director, Premus Biotech Private Limited, is spearheading research on COVID-19 vaccine candidate, Oravax, which can be taken in the form of an oral capsule. Professor Manideepa Banerjee from IIT Delhi, who is working on protein inhibitors against SARS-CoV-2 for drug development, and is also exploring virus-like particles as vaccine candidates against COVID-19. We also have with us Dr. Rajneesh Giri from IIT Mandi, who is working on SARS-CoV-2 drug development. We have Professor Hem Chandra Jha from IIT Indore, who is actively involved in COVID-19 sample testing at Indore and is performing genetic and immunological studies pertaining to SARS-CoV-2 strains. Dr. Upasana Ray, senior scientist and deputy head of infectious disease and immunology, at CSIR Institute of IICB, Kolkata, who is studying various aspects of COVID-19 virology and therapeutics. Dr. Sunil Raghav, senior scientist at Institute of Life Sciences, Bhubaneswar, who is working on the interface of genetics and immunology for understanding ways to combat COVID-19. We are happy to have Dr. Amit Avasti, associate professor at THSTI Faridabad, 
whose lab is contributing to bridging trials of the Russian vaccine Sputnik and is performing SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell efficacy assays in India. We also have Dr. Nimesh Gupta, head vaccine immunology lab at National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, who is working extensively to determine the quality and durability of immunological memory with the emphasis on T cells in SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. Dr. Dipyaman Ganguly, senior scientist of immunology and inflammatory disorders at CSIR IACP Kolkata, who is working on various aspects of COVID-19 pathogenesis and immunology, along with plasma therapy trials in Indian patients. We also have Professor Arturo Kasadewal, Distinguished Professor and Chair, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Department of Medicine and Infectious Diseases, Bloomberg School of Public Health, John Hopkins University, Maryland, US, who is pioneering and investigating the use of convalescent plasma from recovered COVID patients as means of passive therapy in critical patients. We are also happy to have Dr. Amrendra Kumar, research scientist at the Department of Pathology, Ohio State University, USA, who is developing immunomodulatory compounds to mitigate COVID-19 associated hyperinflammation and is working to understand immune responses induced by COVID-19 vaccines in cancer patients. We at IIT Roorkee believe that listening to the talks from these speakers will benefit the audience and accomplish the intent of this virtual symposium on COVID-19 immunology organized by the Department of Biotechnology under the aegis of Indian Immunological Society. We hope that information shared today about COVID-19 immunology will help you to understand more about this virus and will specifically motivate young researchers to pursue and conduct immunology research in future. We also hope that it will help to facilitate many collaborative studies and exchange of ideas. I would now like to invite Director IIT Roorkee, Professor Ajit Chaturvedi, to kindly say a few words and address the audience and speakers participating in this symposium. Over to you, Professor Chaturvedi. Uh, thank you, Professor Soma. Uh, I'm extremely delighted that IIT Rurki is celebrating this uh, International Day of Immunology under the ages of the National Society of Immunology to organize this very important and very relevant, pertinent symposium on COVID immunology. Uh, we are all in the midst of this big pandemic, uh, which is going on for now close to one and a half years. And uh, everywhere the talk of the town is COVID and people are looking at academic institutes, research institutes, hospitals to come up with better and better solutions, better methods, better technologies to be able to address this gravest challenge on mankind that recent history has shown. We know that mankind has faced several challenges over the last several millennia, but the kind of challenge that we are witnessing today is unprecedented, maybe because it was of recent memory, that is why we have that feeling, but we are feeling that yes, this is the kind of uh, human misery and human tragedy that reminds us of several things, and it is good to remember them today. The first and foremost thing that it reminds us is the oneness of mankind. It is the oneness of human beings. It is the unity of human beings. I think today the virus does not differentiate which country you belong to. 
it does not distinguish the color of your skin it does not distinguish the language that you speak it does not distinguish any other kind of discriminatory profiles that have evolved over the period of time so today we have to remind ourselves that all these divisions that we enforce these are artificial divisions it is time that we relegate these divisions to the background and focus that mankind is one humanity is one and all human beings need to unite together against this huge adversary the invisible enemy that is causing so much of untold misery and damage to the entire human civilization second thing that i am reminded today is that uh, the spanish flu that happened pandemic caused by a virus and more than a century later i am not sure how much we have been able to mitigate the impact of a virus driven pandemic if you look at the details that are available of the spanish pandemic whether in terms of mortality whether in terms of human suffering it looks like as if we are going through exactly the same phase it looks like that it is not in the history books but it is something that we are witnessing today with our own eyes and ears does it mean that over the last 100 years uh, we have not made any progress uh, sometimes we believe we have made huge progress our science has advanced our engineering has progressed uh, we have new drugs we have new testing methods we have new trial methods Uh, we have new products uh, then why is it that the impact is almost similar as if uh, as as what happened a century back i think that is something that we must ponder over uh, this virus also reminds us that not only in terms of divisions of humanity but also in terms of divisions of disciplines we need to remove those borders i think it it tells us that if scientists work alone doing science and if engineers work alone doing engineering or technologists work in an isolation trying to develop technologies mankind will not benefit will not progress the with the amount of progress that is possible if engineers scientists technologists they come together they work together we transcend these boundaries these artificial departmental boundaries and try to address real problems i think we will make more more progress i think we will be able to address such future challenges in a better fashion in a better manner than what we are witnessing today in fact today we are reminded also that the best nations the most advanced nations in the world they were also very badly hit in some sense the uh, the virus has shown that how timid we are how small we are it has shown that we cannot afford to be arrogant in any manner regardless of my citizenship regardless of my country regardless of my economic well being regardless of my intellectual prowess the virus has shown that all of us are very timid in front of it and this only means that we need to come together with lot of energy lot of vigor lot of renewed enthusiasm and learning from what are the things that we can do better and as i said that we can do better in terms of coming together in fact today or we are also thinking that why not instead of trying to understand the virus in full detail which is taking a lot of time which is taking a lot of resources and still we are not able to understand it in parallel can we not be a more data driven society that is artificial intelligence and data science driven what this ai and ds technologies are trying to do is they are trying to address the gaps which science is unable to fill so instead of trying to wait for the scientific answers to come can we look at the data and from that data draw meaningful conclusions and all those conclusions we can we can take decisions we can implement products whether in terms of drugs vaccines testing whatever you say it so i hope that uh, the data scientists the people who do machine learning the people who do artificial intelligence 
they are more driven to this important area. Uh, I know all of us are driven to it, but some people, I hope they are getting driven more and more so that we can solve problems in a shorter period of time and we can give meaningful solutions in a shorter period of time. I was looking at the, the kind of things that have been, that have posed the biggest challenge to managing society or managing institutes in the last one year. And if I have to pinpoint one thing that to me looks to be the most important, most critical, if that could have been done, then I think this pandemic, the course of this pandemic could have been controlled significantly. Of course, it is a wish list. It is a, it is something to say that I wish for it, but, but there is a feeling that maybe it is a low hanging fruit, which if with combined efforts, we can address it, we may be able to solve it. And that fruit that I'm talking about is our ability to just test. I'm saying even if we forget the drugs, even if we forget the vaccines, which takes so much time to do the science, to do the uh, productization, to roll out the production lines, to do the distribution supply, all these things are very, very time taking. And then of course, a lot of public debate, financial resources, everything is involved. If we can focus on getting a very good diagnostic tool, which is just quickly can identify that this person is infected with this virus or not. And if that test can be quick, it can be cheap, it can be reliable. I think the other two parts will become less important. The main difficulty in controlling this pandemic has been the inability of the human race to be able to quickly isolate individuals carrying this virus. If we can quickly isolate individuals carrying this virus, the spread can be very, very much controlled. If the spread can be controlled, the need for the drug vaccine, everything comes down. We can, we can wait for it a bit longer. But because we are not able to test and give results in time, what is happening is that the virus is spreading and it is spreading in a, in a exponential fashion. We are not able to isolate those people. In fact, many times we are not able to uh, we are not able to uh, prevent the infected individuals from infecting newer cases, partly because uh, it is still below the detection range. So the tests are failing. There is a false negative report coming, even though the person has the virus. And tomorrow, the, if you do the test, the test will come out. Secondly, is that if the report is coming five days later, then by that time, this person has infected more people. So this ability to confine the virus to a small geographical area or to confine the virus to a small subset of individuals, I think will be the biggest enabler. It is the biggest empowering thing that can happen if we can do this very quickly, very efficient, efficiently, and we'll be able to change the course of this pandemic. But I think, uh, I know people have been trying for it. Maybe it is too difficult. I don't understand viruses. I'm not from... Uh, this discipline, and I know that today's symposium is focused more on immunology rather than testing. But as a person who has been involved in trying to manage an IIT through this one year pandemic, I felt that this was the biggest handicap. This could have been the biggest enabler, a quick, efficient test. If we can focus on this and, and come out with good solutions, I think that will be, uh, that will be a game changer. Uh, but maybe it is too difficult. Maybe that is why it is not happening. But then uh, drugs and vaccines are also not easy. Nothing is easy. I'm sure that today's uh, deliberations will be very, very enriching because the range of speakers is truly very, very impressive range of speakers and covering almost all the topics of uh, COVID immunology. Uh, so there's a lot of things to learn from the speakers today. I hope the audience will be glued throughout the day, trying to get every piece of wisdom, uh, knowledge, and awareness that, awareness that we can gather from these speakers. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Soma Rohatgi, Professor Shalik Tomar, and Professor Prabhinder Kumar for having uh, hosting this very important workshop, having taken up the responsibility to celebrate this uh, International Day of Immunology under the aegis of the uh, National Society of Immunology. And, uh, and I'm sure that given the facilities that exist at IIT Roorkee, whether in terms of animal models, whether in terms of our ability to carry out clinical trials on human patients because of our MOUs with, with the reputed hospitals, uh, whether it is Ames, Rishikesh, Jolly Grant, 
and and other centers i am sure that uh, our our colleagues are making putting their best effort but today maybe everybody get something to learn which can be a game changer maybe let us look at one drop of ocean one drop of wisdom that you get today which can trigger a chain of thoughts we can which can lead to a quick testing method and which can lead to maybe a better drug maybe a better vaccine whatever can happen i hope this this can come out of this today's deliberations i wish all the speakers go away with something useful and we all should not lose our morale we should continue to be uh, focused on the job at hand if we if we do that in a in a, in a, in a uh, with with full energy with full vigor i am sure that the pandemic will be behind us sooner rather than later thank you very much i thank you our honorable director professor ajit chaturvedi for his enlightening and kind words good morning to all the distinguished speakers panelists and the participants of today's virtual symposium on covid-19 immunology on the international day of immunology myself shelly tomar welcome you all with determination and faith in science and research that we will soon overcome sars cov2 pandemic we here at iit roorkee have a very strong virology immunology and structural biology team we are working in collaboration with various national and international research groups with the focus on delivering structure based antivirals and immunotherapies at present we are working on drug repurposing for targeting the key virus cov2 virus specific enzymes that is proteases polymerases and the virus entry step on this we are collaborating with professor manidika at iit delhi who will be speaking and sharing her research work the lead small molecules that we have are being tested with uh, uh, with the help of our collaborators at ivri bareilly and at karolinska institute sweden for sars cov2 immunotherapy our team at iit roorkee is working on structural engineering of nano bodies and also on virus like particles in collaboration with drdo lab gwalior we at iit roorkee will soon have bsl3 virus containment facility to uh, handle sars cov2 and test these antivirals and nano bodies we are also preparing ourselves to grip and tackle in future for handling various infectious viral uh, outbreaks in our country with this i request professor pravindra head of our department to please address uh, the participants thank you professor shelly uh, honorable director professor chaturvedi respected uh, dean sri professor manishri khande our uh, distinguished panelists uh, dear colleagues and participants very good morning to all of you i'm sorry for the initial technical problems i was not able to come in a panelist i was in participants and uh, so for that i'm really sorry so first of all i wish my personal best wishes to all of you and your family in this difficult time and i also expect as my uh, gratitude to uh, all the health workers doctors nurses you know we all are going through such a difficult time and our health team and all the people are helping us i think professor soma has mentioned uh, dr person panda and deep jyoti kalita from aims in the panelists but they couldn't come but i am telling you that they are helping in this northern part of india like anything professor panda is like nodal officer of aims rishi case and he is doing wonderful job so many people like you know just sitting from there he is helping us uh, iit roorkee students faculty members staffs providing his prescriptions so he couldn't come here but uh, we really salute him and uh, his efforts uh, now i welcome you all for this uh, one day uh, virtual symposium and i really thank professor soma and our efforts to bring all the distinguished uh, uh, speakers panelists here it would be really really helpful uh, dr soma i mean this is uh, your team has done good you and uh, dr shelly so i mean uh, our department is really proud of you and uh, in this time in difficult time i really thank all the uh, panelists 
that they could take out some time. I know that everybody is uh, uh, so busy and it's uh, very, very, very difficult for all of us. But still, you know, I could see all the uh, great scientists, uh, distinguished scientists here. And uh, Professor Soma has mentioned about each of them. They are like uh, top uh, people in, uh, in this area working. Uh, our department, since the outbreak, has intensified uh, efforts to combat this disease, as Shelly mentioned, Professor Soma mentioned that we have a very strong team of structural and computational biology. We have uh, immunologist Professor Soma, Professor uh, Pranita Sarangi, Professor Singh, R.P. Singh, and uh, microbiologist team Professor Navani, Ranjana, and like you know, uh, all you know, bioengineers. Our department has made good progress uh, in making uh, masks, sanitizers. So. Uh, a department also has made uh, very good efforts uh, in the drug discovery area where Dr. Shelley has mentioned that our group is working on uh, key enzymes, uh, replication enzymes like uh, uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, we are working on proteases. We are working on methyl transferases. We are uh, using, as Professor Chaturvedi has mentioned, AI based uh, tools to identify the uh, drugs available which are FDA approved drugs and how they can interact with these enzymes. And I'm sure that Shelly has mentioned that you no, know, we are trying to test these things in Carolin Sika as well as in DRD Gwalior. So department is making good progress at this moment. We also thankful to our institute that, uh, you know, they had visionary uh, idea that before starting this thing only, they supported department for uh, this PSL3 facility, which is going to come up very soon now. So I'm sure that no, we will not have to go anywhere for testing the uh, compounds once we have this facility. It will definitely uh, uh, intensify our efforts immediately once we have this you know, facility. And maybe I'm sure within a month or so, we'll have this thing here. We have very good facility of uh, immunology, uh, this animal uh, biotechnology group, and uh, we have animals here. Uh, Chaturvedi mentioned that no, uh, he's also supporting us all the time whatever we want, department wants. So uh, we are getting all the uh, support from his side and from our Dean Srik is sitting here. So he is also, I uh, know we have great team. At this time, we got this uh, MOU with AIMS Rishikesh, Jolly Grant, IVRI, and uh, this is helping a lot. I mean, I'm really thankful to Professor Manish Sri Khande, who's uh, uh, really supported whenever we go there, like, you know, he's supporting us. And because of that, you know, uh, as Professor Chaturvedi mentioned, that it's a team effort. All doctors, uh, scientists, engineers have to come together to fight with this disease. And it's not a fight, simple fight. It's a fight between good and evil. And how it's good and evil? Because, you know, vaccine has come, but you see that new variants are coming. The variants we have to fight with, like, you no, know, so we have to, vaccine is not enough. One vaccine or two vaccines or 10 vaccines are not enough. We have to have drugs for it. So uh, this fight will go on. And uh, as Professor Chaturvedi was mentioning 100 years ago, sir, I would like to say that this will continue. This is a fight. And then we have to, all scientists have to always come up with the new idea new therapy and we have to uh, but you know these bacteria and all these viruses they are pathogens they will also very they are very smart they will also try to become more smarter so our community scientific community has to really work hard and all the people across the world are working in this direction our department i'm i'm really proud of that like now our department is making great progress with the uh, you know international and international level only, and then like I'm sure, in uh, within a few years we will be, uh, you know, you will see that you no, know, this is not one day business. I think it it will continue, and we have to keep doing our efforts, uh, all the efforts to uh, combat uh, with these sort of things. More viruses will come, and I'm sure that these days this immunology world, each and every household has learned. Everybody knows what is immune system now, what is, uh, you know, immunity, what is innate immunity. And I'm sure that uh, uh, this kind of symposium will help more. I request our scientists that we should also console our colleagues, our family members. 
like in the night, middle of night, one of my colleague who's a soccer player and called me up and he was having breathing problem. And he was really scared that how to get admission, but no, we have to, uh, you know, overcome this fear. We need to, we need to think that how we can tell that now our immunity is good enough to fight with this. I kept on consoling him that no, your innate immunity is good and we need to don't worry about it because panic situation bring our immunity down. And once we are, you know, uh, uh, we, we try to understand that we are eating well, we are sleeping well, we are not taking each stress, then I think we can overcome with this fear. So, and it would really help all of us. So uh, with this, I would, uh, uh, I would say that uh, I'm looking forward to hear all the great discussions, presentations today uh, from uh, panelists and speakers. And I'm sure their insight would be helpful for us to exchange the ideas, to start more collaborations, to enhance the more interactions with the uh, national and international level. And uh, I'm again thankful to all of you. And uh, I welcome now Professor R.P. Singh. Professor, I request Professor Singh to start the session, chair the session. I think there was some technical connectivity problem with me. Uh, so, uh, Professor Singh uh, is the microbiologist and immunologist. So, so he would start the session now, like chair the session. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Praveen Kumar. Uh, I welcome again uh, our honorable director, Professor Chaturvedi. Oma, Professor Shaili, Pranita, Professor Manishi Kande, and all the distinguished panelists. So, uh, before actually, like, uh, we start the session one, so uh, she did session one. So, we have got a very active and dynamic new researcher with us, Professor Rajneesh Giri from IIT Mandi, who has uh, very kindly you know, agreed to give a new kind of introductory talk on the SARS COV2. So let me introduce Professor Rajneesh Giri from IIT Mandi. So Professor Rajneesh Giri is, is, a, is a, an active you know, kind of virologist from IIT Mandi, and uh, he is working on the proteomics you know, of the SARS-CoV-2. He has uh, shown that there are 34 proteins in the SARS-CO2, and uh, how you know kind of they are involved you know kind of in uh, in uh, interacting with that of the human defense and immune system. Now, he is also trying to unravel that uh, what are these uh, innate and uh, cell mediated immunity that actually are going to be involved in fighting with the SARS CO2. He is also trying to understand the disorder regions and dynamic you know, assemblies to the SARS CO2 genome. He has uh, shown that the C terminal region, which actually span from 130 to 180 residues, in a specific, you know, NSP1 protein of SARS-CO2 is increasingly disordered. Also, he has explored the contribution of C-terminal region of annular protein and C-terminal region of spike glycoprotein. So, his uh, findings has also suggested that annular protein C-terminal peptide forms the amyloid aggregate. So, I would uh, request uh, Professor Rajneesh Giri we have roughly around say 15 minutes of time, and uh, he is going to briefly talk on the understanding of the SARS CO2 by focusing on confirmations, intrinsic order, and aggregation. So I request Professor Rajneesh Giri to kindly you know, present his talk. Thank you very much, Professor Singh, for this kind of work. Uh, I can share my PPT. So, 
my PPT is visible to all of you. Uh, I think right now, no, maybe you have to again. Uh, now I think we can see your PPT. So you please uh, can go in the slide to move. Yes, sir. So, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Sutta, for giving this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, this is the little amount of work what we did since last one year. Um, roughly, uh, excuse me, yes. So, mainly uh, my lab focuses on investigating the disorder, the unstructured reason among the proteome, uh, proteome of the virus. Uh, because there are two ways to understand the structural biology. One is to understand what are the rigid structures, what are the um, uh, conserved structures, and other way is to understand what are the reasons which don't form the structure. In fact, uh, uh, in fact, why uh, this is important? Because what happens that uh, there are only 34 proteins in the virus, and we have more than 20,000 protein, proteins. So you can you can imagine that how very limited pool of proteins of the viruses are able to win our quite well established defense systems. So definitely there is a lot in the proteome. There is a lot information and a lot of mysteries inside the proteome that could lead to means that could be due to the structure of the protein and due to also the disorder of the protein. Since uh, a long time, the disorderness the uh, I would say the, the long loops, turns, um, these have all have been uh, not investigated with detail. But uh, recently, in last two and three decades, it has been found that there is a structure function paradigm. Means disorder is also functional. So that has broken that uh, structure function paradigm, and uh, there is a disorder function paradigm which has emerged. Um, but before going to, uh, to that direction, let's understand what are IDPs, what are the disorder proteins. So you can see that there is a uh, laser pointer, yes. So you can see that this is the structure function paradigm. So for, for every uh, for function of a protein, it needs to be structured. That was the structure function paradigm and very well established since seven, eight decades. However, recently it has been found that even the proteins which, are, which don't form a structure, they are also functional. For example, the P53 transactivation domains. Most of the transactivation domains in the cell are disordered. Uh, you have several other proteins which are disordered. Even your nucleic acid protein in the virus of SARS-CoV-2, uh, it is uh, mainly disordered with uh, uh, with two to three uh, conserved structural reasons. But largely, large part of that protein is also disordered. So they are mainly uh, composed of your uh, hydrophilic amino acids and uh, in viruses they are widespread means uh, there is no fixed rule based on the amount of data what we have uh, what is available uh, they are many are ordered and many are disordered so but in multicellular organism they are more disordered so in sars cov2 system uh, the first study what we started on uh, basically 15th January 2020 was to investigate the amount of intrinsic disorder in the whole proteome. And for that, we started the computational study. And in the computational study, what we did that we compared the <clears throat> we compared the uh, proteome uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, this 2009 and and coronavirus, uh, this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, version, and bad coronaviruses. And we found that this, if you see this nucleic acid here, this nucleic acid is mainly disordered by analyzing this protein, percentage of protein intrinsic disorder from PonderFit and percentage of protein intrinsic disorder mean with the uh, five other predictors used. And and also there was variation in the conformations, uh, means uh, of different uh, different viruses. Like you see this case of, uh, you see uh, this is a SARS-CoV-2 proteome uh, situation. This is SARS, uh, uh, 
this is human coronavirus to on three version and this is the bad coronavirus. Similarly, with the charge hydropathy plot also in the quarter three, you can see that mostly disordered proteins are here and uh, uh, this nucleic acid is disordered. While if you see this ORF9, it has operation in different biases. So these viruses have variation in the uh, conformations. Um, even in the SARS-CoV-2, to human coronavirus to some three version, to bad coronavirus versions. Means although they are very close in sequences, they are conserved sequences mostly, but still there are differences. So uh, when we covered this first story, which was actually very lengthy, uh, uh, it was at a six pages long manuscript and more than 34 uh, figure results, but uh, I would go more uh, fast to the experimental portion. So let's find out the insulin disorder in as many as proteins and possibly experimentally. So <clears throat> we first started this thing on NSP1 uh, because uh, when, what I meant that even when we understood the SARS-CoV-2 system, so the SARS-CoV system of 2 3 has helped a lot. Even in vaccine designing, even in drug discovery, and uh, most of the structural biology, or the, or even the disorder biology. So we read NSP1 there because this is the non-structural protein. There are uh, 16 non-structural proteins. So starting from all of them, uh, we covered. There is um, on NSP11 we have focused on envelope. We have focused, and also we have focused our study on spike like protein cytomegalism. So we investigated disorder uh, function paradigm, structural heterogeneity of NSP1 C terminal disease, conformational dynamics of NSP11, conformational dynamics of spike cytoplasmic reason, because so far nobody has focused on this, and this is the first study what we have done, and how these uh, protein protein interactions play the role in virion assembly. But mainly I'll focus on the first four uh, uh, aspects. So this SARS-CoV-2 NSP1 system. Uh, this is basically responsible for suppressing the host protein synthesis. And, and, and this one is, uh, it inhibits the host gene expression. But our goal was to investigate the structure. And to investigate the structure, what we found, uh, particularly the disorder, because what happens that we have the facility for the disorder structure uh, uh, identification, like very simple techniques like CD spectroscopy and all this. So some of the part of the NSP1 uh, N-terminal residue structure, which you can see in the ribosome, it is um, actually this particular uh, region is structure. But what about the, the question was the other domain? Like this is the domain you can see NSP1. This is 1 to 180 amino acid long. And, and in, in N-terminal region, there are uh, two structures available now uh, on the PDB. And uh, they are the structures in isolation. But my question was, what about the structure of C terminal domain 130 to 180 amino acid long region in isolation? Uh, in our first bioinformatics study, what we published in the that cell, uh, there the prediction has shown the bound uh, was on the boundary. Means uh, if it is more than 0.5 score on disorder propensity, it is disordered, and if it is less than 0.5, uh, ordered or the structured or the residue structures. But it was on the boundary, and so on bioinformatics basis, we cannot say. So that's why we synthesized 130 to 180 amino acid uh, C terminal region uh, uh, from Genescript USA. And uh, uh, we got the peptide, and we found that in the CD spectroscopy, it is giving the result, it is giving the negative electricity at nearly 200 nanometers, 195 to 200 nanometers. And that is uh, uh, that is an indication of the protein having secondary structures of a disordered or loop-like uh, conformation. Because what happens that for alpha helix, you need 208 and 2, uh, this 222. For beta set, you need 218 nanometer. But this is actually uh, 200, uh, 195 to 200 nanometer range. This is actually the sim uh, signal of a disordered uh, structure. So there is no structure of NSP1 C terminal region in isolation. I am talking about in isolation, when we take the protein in physiological buffer conditions in isolation without any partner or without anything. We have also investigated its propensity to form a structure because what happens that when we are talking about the disorder function paradigm and particularly if you 
functional paradigm uh, then mostly what happens that many of protein they change the function disorder to order and that's how they function some of the proteins of idps they even but the idps change the conformation and that's how they function so we check the conformational propensity in sds we check the conformational propensity in trifluoroethanol which is a very known helix inducer so it has changes from disorder to alpha helical conformation in dop lipids we found no structural changes uh, secondary structure changes in dopc there was some uh, some changes but not very significant and we cannot say that yes it is a change but we cannot also say that it is not a change so <clears throat> also we had taken that uh, uh, study on temperature dependent and generally what the idp is so compactness in the structure when they are heated because their free energy landscape has a very different kind of energy uh, situation we have uh, taken the 3d uh, uh, folding of this one uh, using this Uh, fluorescence emission lab uh, lab emission analysis and uh, by your lifetime decay curves and we found that there is a uh, uh, there is a blue shift in uh, nsp1 c c terminal region in the presence of sds and tfe as compared to liposomes and these all have confirmed the compactness and tertiary structural changes of the disorder so so this was a folding aspect on this Further, we have taken the time resolved and isotropy decay analysis because since this peptide was having tryptophan, so it was quite easy for us to do the fluorescence experiments. Uh, and the correlation uh, uh, time theta one, which was a faster correlation time, was observed to be around one nanosecond in all conditions with this folding condition, present, which where we are uh, purposefully making it folded in presence of helium reducers. And your uh, Second correlation was observed to be 200 nanoseconds. So this all has to that at higher concentration of SDS, TFE, and all this. Basically, when we induce the structure, they represent a global conformational dynamics of NSP1 cytoplasm, uh, cytoplasm, uh, cytoplasm, uh, cytoplasm reason. Uh, Professor Giri, this is sorry to interrupt. Uh, simulations. Uh, Professor Giri, sorry to interrupt. We have you know around say yes. three minutes of time. No, I'll request and yes. please conclude. You know, in in three minutes of time. Thank you very much. Just I will take a couple of more minutes. Uh, let's say three fine, to five. Fine. Okay. Thank you. All right. See you soon. This was the model structure. We performed the molecular dynamics simulation for 500 nanoseconds, and uh, we performed the simulations at different uh, conditions also. And uh, so this was the MD simulations, and this study that this SARS-CoV-2 NSP1C tunnel region. Is actually intrinsically disordered in isolation. So this was recently uh, published in this uh, current research in biological sciences. Next story was this uh, envelope protein C terminal region. So here, this is the SARS-CoV-2 system. Uh, this uh, this structure came here, uh, which where it forms pentameric ion channel in uh, SMB. Our question was, what about this 41 to 70 residues? And We found that this is actually intrinsically disordered in isolation, but very much um, from beta site, alpha helix, and other structures also. Like you can see that in trifluoroethanol, it forms alpha helix. In SDS and other things, it forms beta site also. So it has the conformational propensity in different conformations. Here we have also found the aggregation propensity, and extensive set of experiments. of course microscopy and also this tst uh, di ans di, ns uh, binding which binds to the hydrophobic resistors and also the, there was we found the disorder to beta site structure was gained and this was the fibrils it forms so this this is having a very significant dynamic very very different kind of uh, mixed up dynamics of this nsp1 and this uh, envelope protein site analysis so this was our work here Next, we also studied the NSP11 dynamics of SARS-CoV-2. NSP11 is a very small peptide, 11 amino acid, and we found that this is also an intrinsically disordered. Because what happens is that we are working on dark proteins, so one by one we are taking up all aspects. We found that NSP11 also forms cytotoxic aggregates, amyloid aggregates. 
These are the FM images and TAM images. You can see the fibrils. And one of the surprising thing is there, it aggregates for having different kind of uh, cytotoxic behavior with different cells. Like uh, with the neural stem cells, as a, uh, no, sorry, not no, neural cells, neural cell line SHY, uh, Y5Y. So it has a different uh, cytotoxic profile. While the HERG2 cells, uh, it has a, a different uh, cytotoxic profile. And the last story is one minute will take. Uh, what is our most recent discovery is uh, spike glycoprotein. Spike, no, that is very important uh, stuff. We know that it is a structure, but what about the cytoplasmic region, which is actually what happens that in the virion, if you see outside the virion, this is a spike, but what is the inside? The inside is actually that 35 or uh, uh, 42 amino acid uh, long cytoplasmic region. What is the confirmation of that inside one? Because that is something which is anchoring that spike to the virus. And this is the most important study we did. So we did this transcendent helix predictions, which is, uh, and uh, we we took the CC top prediction, which was uh, suggesting that these are the um, section uh, This is transcendent helix. So we investigated for 42 to 1273 residues, which is cytoplasmic tail. Although there are also some predictions saying that it is 1235 to 1273, but here we did the model and then we performed the simulations up to one microseconds. We found that after one of this is this one. We performed more uh, investigation with different frames, uh, uh, very different methods, so LPS, CHAMM, ROMAX, and all these methods we used. Uh, and ultimately we found that it is intrinsically disordered. And the most exciting part and of my talk is, this is spike cytoplasmic reason, 1242 to 1273, which inside the analysis is actually intrinsically disordered. This is what we have proved using this CD spectroscopy also. So this is one of the significant discovery what we made and uh, soon we will to revise our preprint, the first preprint. So thank you very much. Uh, 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 thank you uh, to IIT Mandi for this opportunity and thank you for uh, uh, Soma and uh, colleagues and Pravindra and Sally and all uh, who has organized this conference. Thank you very much. If there is any questions, I will be happy to take it up. So uh, I think uh, we are running short of time. Thank you, Professor Giri, for a very nice illustrative and informative talk. And uh, I think it was a very nice presentation hmm. talking about NST1 and disorder regions of similar proteins. So thank you very much. And uh, I think you know we are running short of time. So I would uh, you like uh, we would go ahead with our uh, session one. And uh, <clears throat> So, now, thank you very much. Uh, uh, in, in our session. Thank you very much, Dr. Giri. So, we have got uh, our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Shahid Jami. And uh, Dr. Shahid Jami is uh, known to everybody in the field. But let me uh, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Shahid Jami. So, Dr. Shahid Jami is a well renowned biologist of international field. He is currently the director of Trivedi School of Biosciences at Ashoka University, Sonipat. Most recently, he served as the Chief Executive uh, Officer of the Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance from April 2013-2020. Dr. Jamil did his PhD in Biochemistry from Washington State University uh, and also his, uh, and his postdoctoral research in molecular biology from University of Colorado Medical School. Served as the leader of virology group at the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology University for over 25 years, where his research focused on the hepatitis E virus at ICGP. Dr. Jamil's research was funded through the extramural grants from Government of India, Welcome Trust Foundation, and Infectious Disease Grant from NIH USA. He has published over 120 peer reviewed papers and served on the various review and advisory committees of Government of India and WHO. Dr. Jamil is an elected fellow of all the three major Indian science academies. Dr. Jamil has been awarded the prestigious Shanti Sinopatnagar Prize for Science and Technology, one of the highest Indian science awards for his contributions to the medical sciences in year 2000. So with this, you know, I welcome Dr. Jamil and uh, invite him for his keynote address, Dr. Jameel. And uh, I would you know, request all the speakers because 
uh, you have around say sir 20, 20 minutes so i would request you to kindly you know kind of you know uh, deliver your uh, keynote address in, in in 20 to 20 25 minutes thank you very much dr Jalil, please thank you dr singh uh, uh, thank you roma shelly and others for the invitation uh, let me share my screen and quickly go ahead. So uh, I changed the topic of my presentation a little bit uh, because I thought it would be good to give you an overview of uh, what has happened and what's going on. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, just somebody shout yes or no. I think uh, we can see your slides. Sir. Yeah, it is. Okay, a wonderful. All right. So I will talk about uh, the COVID-19 situation in India. Now, this graph is very familiar to many of you, uh, and this shows the global picture uh, right now of uh, how many infections have happened and where in the world. So a couple of things to note here. I mean, we are almost approaching 150 million infections around the world and over 3 million deaths uh, so far. Uh, India has the second highest numbers of infections uh, and we have we did cross the 18 million mark uh, as many of you slept last night uh, but the, I mean that's very worrying uh, and as I will show you what is even more worrying is the rate at which our cases are rising and of course if cases are rising deaths are also rising and we have crossed 200,000 deaths what you will notice in the yellow graph at the bottom is that the global pandemic uh, sort of kept increasing to a point somewhere around early 2021 uh, and then it showed a dip uh, but then from about the end of february it's going up again and what uh, you know the India is, is really contributing very heavily to the second rise uh, because we are now pulling somewhere around 50% of infections around the world. And that again is something very worrying. So here is uh, the kinetics of the outbreak in India compared to other countries and you will see that uh, our caseload uh, started rising we peaked out around mid september and then it started going down and it kept going down down we went through the sahara and diwali and you can see this little blip happening bihar elections it kept going down and down till we reached around mid february when we clocked about 10,000 infections per day. And since then, it has been really a phenomenal rise as, as you will see from this curve. <clears throat> so this is what I was telling you earlier. If you notice, uh, the new cases added yesterday in the world are roughly uh, 650,000, out of which more than half, roughly 350,000 come from India. Uh, similarly, uh, if you look at deaths, uh, if you look at deaths, uh, the new deaths that have happened yesterday, roughly 9,000 deaths uh, all over the world, over 3,000 have been in India. So about a third of the deaths, about half of infections in the world currently are happening in India. If you look at the other numbers uh, of what happened in other countries yesterday, you will see that we are putting out very high numbers and, and obviously the number of deaths in India have also been very high. All right, so these four uh, charts essentially show you uh, the progression of the pandemic in India. Daily cases I have already shown you how after mid-February we have seen this really phenomenal increase that is still continuing. And obviously, even if the case fatality ratio, which is the number of people dying from those with confirmed infection, remains the same, which is roughly 1.1, 1.2% uh, at this time, 
the number of deaths have also increased. And the, num the, the death graph is shifted by about 10 days to two weeks from this graph. And obviously that is because a person who is infected today, if that person has to die, will die in about two weeks. But equally worrying are the number of active cases that are rising. Uh, and you will see that the number of active cases are going up. Uh, they're going up roughly at the rate of, uh, they're going up roughly at the rate of about, uh, uh, about four, four and a half percent every day. And that sort of a rate is very, very worrying. Uh, and, and then if you look at new cases versus new recoveries, uh, new cases shown in orange and recoveries shown in green, you notice that there is a difference between these curves. The new cases are far outpacing new recoveries, and that is why you have this rise in active cases. Okay. Uh, now, uh, looking at various types of data, confirmed cases, deaths, tests per million. This is really broken down based on uh, based on states. Uh, and while uh, Maharashtra is still pulling the highest numbers of cases overall, the trend in Maharashtra has been over the last uh, couple of days, possibly last week or so, that the uh, daily cases are, are dipping. Uh, the, the important number here is the test positivity ratio. The test positivity ratio of India right now is 20.5%, which means that every fifth person that you test at random is positive in the country. And that again is, is very worrisome. Uh, in Delhi, for example, uh, sorry, in, in, in Delhi, every third person uh, you test turns out infected. Uh, and uh, the outbreak has really grown in, in uh, places like UP, uh, about 3.5% daily growth in cases. Uh, as far as vaccination is concerned, uh, we have vaccinated only 9% of people with one dose. And this number is even smaller, roughly one and a half, 1.6% uh, with two doses. Uh, so while the growth in in number of cases is is very rapid, the uh, rate of vaccination hasn't been that great. If we start looking at active cases, uh, and the only thing that I want to show you here uh, is sort of uh, shown here, the highest daily act growth in active cases look where it is coming, the northeast of India. This is a part of India that uh, has the least developed healthcare facilities, uh, and this could really be a problem in the coming days. Now, uh, you've heard a lot about this fact figure called R value. Uh, R value is, sorry, R value is something that tells you about the growth of infection. So uh, an R value of one essentially means that on average, one infected person will infect another one person. Uh, and that is when uh, the outbreak is stable. A number below one means that the outbreak is going down. A number above two means that the outbreak is increasing. So India is uh, pulling out uh, our value at this point, roughly 1.45, almost 1.5, which means that we are on a, on a growing curve. But if you look at uh, states like Assam, Bihar, uh, you look at Delhi, they're all above two. Uh, you look at uh, uh, Orissa, they're all above two. Uh, and you know that's that's again very very worrisome that the rate at which the outbreak is growing in uh, in many parts of the country. Now uh, I showed you mortality data, which yesterday showed about three thousand deaths over the country, and here is an argument why India's daily COVID 
uh, mortality data really does not make any sense to me. Uh, this is data from the World Bank, which of course is based on, on what the country shares with them. And the happy thing you notice on this is that since 1960 to 2019, when data is available, India has shown a consistent drop in mortality. Uh, this is natural mortality. I mean, number of people who die uh, of natural causes. So our data is roughly 7.2 deaths uh, per 1,000 people per year. Now, if you translate that into deaths per day for the entire population of the country, that works out to be about 27,000 deaths. Now, the seven day uh, uh, mortality average, seven, seven day moving average for COVID-19 deaths uh, is uh, this figure roughly uh, 2,600, which is essentially only 10% increase in daily deaths over the normal deaths in the country. Now, it, it doesn't make sense that if you just have 10% increase over daily deaths, how come uh, crematoria and graveyards are really so full? How come people are waiting to get their uh, near and dear ones cremated or buried? And this just doesn't, doesn't make sense. And I think that's the reason that I, 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 I feel that the mortality is heavily undercounted. And I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, and I'll tell you from a very personal point of view. This is my cousin who died last week. Uh, you know, he had COVID. He was tested on uh, the 13th of April. His RT-PCR sample was given. And he died on 23rd. For 10 days, his PCR result hasn't come. In fact, it still hasn't come. Uh, so he was not really counted as a COVID death just because his PCR result was not in the system. And I believe this is happening to a lot of people. Uh, people are dying. Uh, the system is under tremendous stress. Uh, test results are not coming and uh, therefore uh, they are not being counted as COVID casualties. Okay, so let's turn to something that uh, we understand a little better, uh, which is the biology and the genomic diversity uh, of the virus. So as you know, uh, this virus uh, most likely emerged uh, from a bat due to a spillover event that happened uh, sometime last year, uh, possibly even earlier, and the virus, uh, you know, that the virus uh, spread in the human population, adapted to humans, till it uh, broke through sometime in December in Wuhan. And this is based on the fact that the highest homology to the COVID virus is to a bat coronavirus, uh, which was isolated in eastern China uh, in 2018. But the homology to the first SARS virus is only around 80% to the MERS virus only 55% and to the common cold coronavirus is only about 50%. I think much will be said during the symposium about the uh, genome organization and also I will not get into the genome organization just to tell you that uh, 30 kilobase RNA genome uh, which makes anywhere from 24 to 27 proteins but most importantly coronaviruses are a group of viruses uh, that carry a gene uh, for an exonuclease protein. And unlike all other RNA viruses, coronaviruses have a way to repair uh, the errors in replication. And it is because of this, the rate of mutation in coronaviruses is the lowest of all RNA viruses. This picture you're very familiar with. Uh, the surface of the virus is dominated by one protein, which is the spike protein, and the spike is present as a trimer. Uh, the trimer comes together, uh, and this is what binds to the receptor for the virus to enter. So uh, the spike trimer binds to ACE2 receptors present on the cell surface, and it is through this that the virus enters. Now, if there is anything that interferes with the binding of the 
spike protein to the ACE2 receptor, for example, neutralizing antibodies, then uh, this entry is inhibited and uh, those antibodies are protective. <clears throat> now, genomic diversity of this virus, and this has been calculated mainly based on measurements for the SARS-1 virus or the mouse hepatitis virus, which is also a coronavirus. Uh, the evolution rate is uh, about uh, 10 to the minus 3 per nucleotide per year, which essentially translates to something like 2 to 3 nucleotides per genome per month. Now, that's a, that's a really low rate uh, compared to other RNA viruses. Uh, so the question is, why are we seeing so many mutations? We are seeing so many mutations because Remember, almost 150 million people have been infected so far. And, uh, you know, the virus has had tremendous opportunity to replicate in the human host. That's why we're seeing so many, uh, uh, so many uh, mutations. Uh, now, mutations, as you know, are random and mutations, uh, you know, only those mutations are seen that give any advantage to the virus. So if you start looking at the virus that came out in 2019, which is the uh, which is the Wuhan virus over here, this virus has diverged very significantly in the past one uh, year, a little over one year. So this uh, Wuhan virus shown on this tree with with dark blue color uh, is, is still there, but is not there's not very much of it shown in the in the density curve here almost 99 percent of the virus that is now circulating is something other than the wuhan virus so the question is what is it in late january a mutation took place in the virus which we call d614g and this mutation made uh, the virus more fit it allowed the virus to outcompete the wuhan virus and therefore 99% of the virus that you see circulating in the world today are descendants of the original D614G uh, mutant virus. And that's what is circulating uh, in 99% of the time. Now, uh, of course, the virus has diverged significantly over time. We also see variants of concern. So, for example, this is B117 or the UK variant. Uh, this one here, uh, yeah, this one here is the South African variant, and this one is the Brazil variant. And when you put it on a radial graph, you see it uh, a little better because things that are closer to the periphery are more recent emergences. So here you have the UK variant, which emerged in December and has uh, spread quite effectively. You have the South African variant and you have the Brazil uh, variant of concern. <clears throat> so here are these three variants of concern. Uh, the, the, the UK variant, which we call B117, the South African variant, which we call B1351, and the Brazil variant, which we call P1. And as you will see, the UK variant has really spread, spread quite effectively around the world. The countries marked in black are ones where there is community transmission going on, uh, and the ones that are shown in, in slightly pinkish color are the ones where the, the virus is not yet circulating widely in the community, but it is there. In India, the story is a little different for uh, the UK variant because in certain parts of India, this virus is circulating very effectively in the community, whereas in most parts, uh, it is not in, in it's not circulating that effectively. Okay. What about the Indian variants? We have heard a lot about these Indian variants and something called the double mutant. Well, firstly, the double mutant is quite a misnomer because what arose from a double mutant is what the press calls a triple mutant. Uh, and actually, the double mutant and the triple mutant are the same virus. Uh, this is the B1617 lineage, 
which is characterized by two key mutations. This lineage has 15, 15 different mutations, out of which there are six mutations in the spike protein. And when I say mutations, I mean only non-synonymous mutations that make a change in the protein. Uh, so out of those six, there are two that are in the receptor binding motif shown in this trimer structure. One is this mutation called L452, which was first seen in the mink population in Denmark, and then it was seen in the in in humans in California, where it spread very effectively in Southern California. So this allows the virus to be more infectious, enter cells better, and uh, replicate better. The other mutation is the E484 mutation, which uh, allows the virus to escape certain neutralizing antibodies. And this is also one of the defining mutations which is found in the South African variant, but is missing uh, from the UK variant. Uh, another mutation seems to be emerging in West Bengal, which is called B1618, uh, which again has this E484 mutation, uh, which uh, is there in 617, which is there in Brazil and South African variants. Uh, so far, the uh, 618 is restricted to India, but 617, which was first found in India in December 2020 in Maharashtra, has now spread to several other countries uh, in the world. So uh, this is the current genome sequencing effort by this group of 10 labs in India called the INSACOG group, uh, which has sequenced uh, roughly 20,000 viral genomes since mid-February. And as you will see in this map, uh, you know, multiple types of viruses are, are found across the country. So if you look at the northern part of the country, for example, if you look at Punjab, if you look at uh, Haryana, also partly Delhi, you find that the UK variant uh, is quite dominant. In Punjab, for example, 80% of the virus circulating in Punjab is the UK variant. Whereas if you go westwards, if you look at Mumbai and uh, Maharashtra, uh, you find a lot of 617 there, but you also find other mutations. If you go to West Bengal, you find multiple uh, variants there, and I'll show that in a bit. Uh, so that's the situation of the country. There is no one uniform variant population across the country. Different regions have different uh, viruses. Uh, the 617, which is the dominant uh, lineage in India, is roughly found in uh, 16 or 17 states uh, so far. That's where sequencing has reported it. Okay, so if we concentrate on Maharashtra, for example, and do a time series, you will see that uh, as we go from October last year to March this year, the proportion of uh, this uh, B617 virus has increased quite significantly in Maharashtra. And this is possibly one of the reasons for the surge that we see in Maharashtra. In uh, West Bengal, however, the situation is a little mixed. Uh, in, in West Bengal, you, you still have a lot of 617 virus, but there is also this emerging lineage of the 618 virus, uh, uh, which is not found yet in other parts of uh, other parts of India. And it is uh, this kind of picture, which is really very worrisome. If you look at the uh, tree map, let's say from West Bengal, uh, you see a lot of different variant lineages. You find a lot of different mutant viruses circulating in Bengal. And this uh, as, is, is something that we have to worry about because Bengal is still going through an election you still witness uh, a lot of crowded rallies and you still have a, have a super spreader situation uh, in, in West Bengal. Uh, so this uh, state is something to watch out for and how the virus moves from here to other uh, parts. Sorry for interesting, Dr. Jamil. Can I, may I request you please yeah. conclude in uh, two minutes, please? Thank you so much. Yes, I will. I Thank will. You. Thank you. Uh, so vaccines, I will not say much, except you already know the different types of vaccines. So I don't have to explain to this audience uh, the different types of vaccines. Uh, 
and this is a list of all the vaccines that have uh, the leading vaccines and and uh, the vaccines that are in the testing pipeline and approved uh, i would really like to address this question would current vaccines work against variant viruses so if you look at the structure and if you look at the mutations within the structure uh, the defining mutations in the 315 351 which is the south african uh, variant virus uh, suggest that this virus is evading immunity uh, and uh, clinical trials of a couple of vaccines have also shown much reduced efficacy in uh, in south africa but here are two good pieces of news from india uh, this is a paper that was that came out in uh, Bioarchive on 23rd of April, which looks at the neutralization potential of CIRA from Covaxin infected, uh, co Covaxin uh, vaccinated people against uh, 617 and the UK variant 117. And you will notice that the print titles are similar. Uh, they are a little reduced for the, uh, B1, uh, the 617 variant and almost the same. Uh, for the uh, 117 compared to the vaccine strain. So uh, the you know, people who got Covaxin are likely to control 617 reasonably well. And the same uh, result, sort of result, uh, early result has come from Covishield vaccinated CIRA, where uh, Covishield also protects from uh, 617. The vaccination rate in India, if you see, has uh, over the last uh, two weeks or so, uh, several weeks actually, has, has fallen. Uh, and this is something which is worrying. Uh, how much uh, vaccines do you need? So if, if you want to vaccinate 20% of your population, uh, and if you're giving 20 lakh doses a day, uh, then you'll take nine months to vaccinate 20%. So at this point, it is estimated that we need at least 75 lakh doses every single day if we are going to vaccinate all eligible uh, adults 18 plus by the end of this year. Uh, so you can imagine what formidable task that is. Okay. Um, finally, how long would the second wave last? Uh, well, uh, this seems to be one of the more accurate uh, models. Uh, and this suggests that the current wave is likely to peak somewhere around the end of the first week uh, of, uh, uh, of, of May. Uh, and at peak, we will have somewhere around 5 lakh, uh, 4 to 5 lakh, possibly more, 6 lakh uh, daily infections. And finally, this we this wave uh, is likely to die out by about July. Well, only time will tell what what happens. So finally, do masks help? Yes, absolutely, they help. Uh, they protect you from infection uh, and transmission both. Uh, should we continue to wear masks after vaccination? Yes, absolutely, because all vaccines will reduce virus load. They will not prevent infection. They only prevent disease, and therefore uh, you can still transmit. I think that's the end of it. Uh, I will be happy to take questions if we still have time. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Jamil, uh, for a very uh, informative and thoughtful talk. I think uh, we have time for maybe maximum one or two questions. And uh, there is a question uh, to Dr. Jamil from Gitanka, and uh, she is asking that is it the effective multiplication of the virus due to the initial lapse in requisite measures of containment contributing to the emergence of mutations in states like Maharashtra and West Bengal, or is it the genome of individuals in these states providing some advantage to the virus to mutate? Well, uh, we we still don't know uh, whether uh, whether host genetics is playing a role in this. I'm sure host genetics is playing a role in this. It's just that we haven't really understood it fully. Uh, so uh, I don't know the answer to your question. I have just one query to you, Doctor Jimmy. Like you know, uh, it was very nice to see that in the mid-February there was you know kind of 
very significant drop in the certain number of cases, but all of a sudden, you know, kind of it started increasing. So, is it, you know, kind of that new variants must have come at time and I think people actually were more free and they did not take, you know, any precautions. So, that led to a very sharp rise in the number of cases. Yes, I think that's the most likely scenario. I mean, the mutants don't just emerge out of the blue. They they emerge and they circulate at low levels. And there has to be some threshold point at which they break out in the population. Uh, remember, the 617 variant was first seen in December uh, in very few cases in Maharashtra. Uh, and then it lied low and, and exploded. Uh, that was also a time when we were not sequencing enough, uh, so we didn't know. Uh, by the end of December, after 10 million infections, India had done only 5,000 genome sequences. So we were sequencing at very low density. Uh, what we probably see now is a combination of better sequencing effort and, of course, the virus has really picked up in the population. So, yes, I, I think it has to do with a mixture of complacency and uh, new mutations. We were just caught completely unprepared. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Jameel. Uh, I again, you know, thank you uh, for sparing time and joining to us, you know, and giving a very, you know, kind of valuable and very, you know, uh, significant and informative talk to us. So, thank you, Dr. Jameel. And now I think thank we would go with the, uh, thank you. We would go with our uh, next speaker. I think Dr. Uh, Vinita Bal is with us, and uh, I would, you know, kind of introduce Dr. Vinita Bal. Uh, Dr. Vinita Bal is a visiting faculty at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Pune. And prior to this, she had worked at the National Institute of Immunology in Delhi as a senior staff scientist for 26 years. Over the past three decades, her research focus has been on understanding pathways regulating the fate of T-leukocytes in immune responses. Dr. Paul did her MBBS from Pune University and MD in Microbiology from Hafkin Institute, Bombay. She did her postdoctoral training at Royal Postgraduate Medical School in London over the past 25 plus years as a faculty at NII and since 2010 also as THSTI, Faridabad. She received funding from both national and international agencies like Welcome Trust UK and India, India US Vaccine Action Program. Dr. Vinita has worked as an immunologist in the areas related to the infectious disease epidemiology, diagnostics, innate immunity. Dr. Vinita has also served as a member of the Prime Minister's Task Force for Women in Science under the Ministry of Science and, and Technology. So uh, I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Vinita. And uh, now I, I request Dr. Vita Bal for her keynote address. Thank you. I think Dr. Bal, your, your speaker, I think is mute, so please unmute your speaker. Your, yeah, please unmute your mic, please. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think we can hear you now. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Is there an echo or this is all right? I think it's fine. Okay, okay sure. I uh, thank you, Pro uh, Professor Singh, and also Roman Shelley for inviting me for this day long celebration of Immunology Day uh, with COVID 19 as the focus point. And since so many speakers are going to talk about uh, the uh, uh, COVID, I thought I would take a slightly different perspective, which is related to COVID, but it is not directly linked to COVID. And that is why the title of my talk is Vaccine Development, Use and Failures, a Broad Perspective. So this is going to be a problem, I think. Sorry, this is not moving forward, so I probably will have to 
stop sharing and go back to this has happened before. So if I Is this no. big enough for you to see? Uh, I think we, we cannot uh, see the slides. No, you want it slides should be shared from this side. You can do that. Okay. Uh, because when Soma, I, I think, uh, if, if you have the slides, you know, can you please share the slides for Dr. Girita Bhav? Let me see. Let me try it once. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah we can see now. Okay. Right, we yes. can see. So are we okay to go ahead like this? Yeah, that is fine. Can. You can. Uh -huh, fine, fine. I mean, if, sure. that is that is good for us. No problem. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the slides are also moving. So I'll move on. So uh, the vaccines are supposed to work in a certain fashion. So they are expected to trigger immunological memory without producing the disease for which they are supposed to work. There is. They are also expected to produce long-lasting memory. And this vaccine development is normally based on identifying essential protective components of the natural infection. For example, Dr. Jamil mentioned spike protein and the mutations in spike protein creating problems with how much protection the current vaccines would give. So spike protein in SARS-CoV-2 is the essential component which is used for building vaccines and targeting uh, uh, that for uh, generation of the immune response. So these are sort of prerequisites for a good vaccine. And what we have seen uh, in the last one year is that uh, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, those to prevent SARS-CoV-19, uh, COVID have been developed in less than one year. And the, if you compare that with traditional vaccine development trajectory, I'm sure the, uh, the audience here is mostly of the students and uh, you will also probably not remember when you had your childhood vaccinations, but all of them, practically all of them took 10 to 15 years to develop as this table shows, as compared to what we have seen in the last one year, that there are five, six, 10 different vaccines which are available for sars cov these vaccines, mind you, are completely safe as safe as the traditional vaccines have been. There are always a small minority side effects which are more worrisome, but there is no difference between the traditional vaccines and the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines as far as the safety issue is concerned. The difference lies in the third bullet point that I have mentioned. Immunological memory for the traditionally developed vaccine generation is evaluated by long term follow up. And that is normally the case. However, immunological memory is memory generation is not evaluated for the SARS CoV 2 vaccines. What has been done is that after the second dose of the vaccine uh, for around six to eight weeks, the vaccinated individuals or placebo treated individuals were followed for development of the disease. And that is immediately after vaccination. Immunological memory is expected to give you a longer lasting response. So that's the difference between the vaccine, uh, two kinds of vaccines. And this slide essentially summarizes why the difference. Typical vaccines are, uh, are normally developing as an information in the laboratory, in a research laboratory. And if there are tissue culture based or in vitro based information that seems to suggest that yes, this is likely to provide an angle or a clue for the vaccination, then there is a move towards a preclinical testing in various animal models. This is serially followed by phase one, phase two and phase three clinical trials. And after that, the, the um, manufacturing process begins and then the vaccines are licensed. This is, as I said, is a serial sequential processing that used to be followed and that normally took about 10 to 15 years. This time for SARS-CoV-2, I know this, this uh, gra um, f uh, graph is also meant for drugs and I'm using it for vaccine, but the principles are the same. So forget about repurposing of the uh, drugs, but 
the, the leads that are there that were there based on the sequence were simultaneously put in use for the preclinical component as well as for the large scale clinical trial and the most peculiar thing was there was large scale manufacture undertaken at risk even before the license was emergency license was provided so that was that is why before the end of first year after the uh, epidemic began or pandemic began the vaccines could be rolled out under emergency use the next point is about now vaccine use we looked at the vaccine development now vaccine use there are strengths and limitations while one is using vaccine and the primary aim of the vaccine at uh, when they are used at a large scale is to achieve herd immunity this herd immunity is a word that came into common parlance during the last one year us immunologists for immunologists knew about it but nobody really took, talked about it so the herd immunity is supposed to provide protection to non immune individuals due to the presence of immune individuals in the same group so these immune individuals need to be present at a very high frequency and the immunity could be because of the vaccine or immunity as in the current state can also be because of the active infection as in sars cov2 infection so achieving herd immunity is an ideal target but that doesn't always succeed and that actually if it can be succeeded it's a strength of the vaccine usage but there are other points also which are more of limi uh, limitations for the vaccine use reaching out to define population and there are many administrative hurdles most of you young people must have heard that from 1st of may the government of india has announced that every individual about the age of 18 is eligible for vaccination and at the same time you are hearing that there isn't manpower trained for giving vaccines there isn't enough vaccine so these are the kind of administrative hurdles that i'm talking about and those are the limitations there is also something called vaccine hesitancy and this is due to potential side effects as well as misinformation and this misinformation uh, i'm sure uh, what what people talk about as the whatsapp university is a major major contributor to this misinformation the easy access to the uh, media has actually gained momentum in generating vaccine hesitancy there is also frequency of boosters and i won't talk about that uh, because of the time constraints these are the seven reasons i have listed uh, for vaccine failure so after looking at the development and use now i'm going to talk about the failures and i'll take a look at these points one by one so the first point is about variability in vaccine efficacy in different geographic regions the first bullet point gives examples of bcg typhoid vaccine and polio in india all these three vaccines work suboptimally in the sense they do not provide protection to every um, individual who has been immunized for a long long period bcg might provide bcg is a is given at birth practically and for first 5 years it provides a significant protection but not after that we see very many people suffering from tuberculosis around us in the community the same is true for typhoid vaccine as well as polio and the reason why i'm talking about geographic regions is all these vaccines in the developed world provide very very long term protection so there are problems about efficacy based on the geography and it's not geography as in highland lowland but it is what we see as host environmental interactions and coexistence of other infections which are the third and fourth bullet points here and it's a short lived or long lived immunity which is a problem with lower immunogenicity compounding this programmatic failure i won't get into the details because i already referred to that uh before i started on these 6 7 points so the third point is poor vaccine design and which may not be focused on protective immune response and this is where the spike protein reference i made to sars cov 2 virus is important the current vaccines for sars cov 2 are all focused on the uh, spike protein primarily because spike protein 
is the one which binds to the receptor and if that binding can be inhibited then there is a protective immune response at least as far as the antibodies are concerned t cells we will not get into in this short talk but uh, out of the three four points that i have mentioned look at the last point there are traditional typhoid cholera vaccines there was recent kumbh mela where you people have been more or less located maybe not located because everybody might be home i don't know that but in general uh, it is what i'm talking about is that once upon a time when there were big events like kumbh mela typhoid cholera vaccine injections were a must they were made out of killed bacteria unfortunately later on we realized that these typhoid cholera vaccination strategies are poor in terms of outcome because there is no gut immune response which is generated by these vaccines and both typhoid and cholera are uh, injection infections which we acquire uh, by the oral route and the response is also dominantly th2 kind which i'm sure you will get to know when you start learning immunology and th2 response is quite useless to control for example typhoid inside your body so that's a poor vaccine design example there is also a poor vaccine design which results in not covering all the subtypes and this is where uh, the the example i'm giving again in the last bullet point is that it of hpv vaccines or say meningococcal pneumococcal vaccines so hpv is human papilloma virus vaccines these vaccines are used for uh, 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 immunizing young women and also men to pre prevent cancer caused by human papilloma virus and there are some strains of hpv which are more commonly carcinogenic but once the vaccines were developed people scientists realized that other strains are also gaining importance in development of cancer as a result the original hpv vaccine which was only primarily consisting of uh, two subtypes 16 and 18 if i am not mistaken they, the scope of the vaccine had to be expanded so in a sense it was a poor vaccine design not covering all the subtypes of hpv which were prevalent in causing cancer same is the logic for meningococcal vaccines and that is why the, the uh, scope had to be expanded and in a sense we can uh, call it as poor design because it did not cover all the subtypes there are also parasite factors which change the equations between the host and parasite interactions which contribute to vaccine failures in a sense so as as uh, dr shahid jamil was saying sars cov 2 is an rna virus it does not it is not as prone to mutations as hiv or some other uh, rna viruses are but at the same time he also showed you a graph of uh, where the mutations uh, are, are happening and the original wuhan strain is no longer the important strain infecting the populace so obviously there are mutations uh, if if a uh, pathogen is prone for mutations then one needs to think about whether a given vaccine will remain efficient as the virus progresses through multiple layers of mutations and that's something that one needs to worry about it also is uh, a, an important point where in the last bullet point which talks about it where multiple forms of the parasites exist in the host and hence there will be different antigenic targets both malaria and filaria malaria is caused by the malarial parasite and filaria is is a worm uh, infection and in both these cases defining pro protective immunity in itself is harder and the host parasite interactions with multiple antigens create more problem for uh, for um, for having a very effective uh, vaccination the sixth point that i'm mentioning here is the immunosuppressive nature of the virus and again i will mention only as a representative hiv human immunodeficiency virus this targets the host immune system directly you we know very well that the cd4 t cell counts are a critical laboratory parameter 
to evaluate HIV AIDS um, infection and disease. And macrophages are also important because they also get targeted, leading to uh, HC, uh, immunosuppression. So if immunosuppress virus is immunosuppressive, then uh, if, if there is a preventive vaccine, of course, it, it would be useful. But developing vaccines becomes somewhat of a uh, problem in such situations. This is the seventh point, and I'm going to dwell a, dwell a little more on this as compared to other points. And poor or inadequate development efforts contribute to uh, near absence or near uh, absence of availability of vaccines also. And the, the first bullet point says, how much is the need for vaccine development? For example, in many developed countries, typhoid and cholera are non-issues because the whole country is supplied with clean, portable water supply. And that because of which fecal contamination of these uh, bacterial pathogens leading to diarrhea and the disease is a non-existent phenomenon. In such a case, if there is no vaccine available, it doesn't matter. But in India, we do need it. But the point is that developed countries do not need such a vaccine, whereas we do need it. So who needs vaccine is the second important point. Are people of all ages needing it as, uh, as we see in the present scenario of the SARS-CoV-2? Is it the case that people from all over the world are needing the vaccine? As we have realized all uh, in, in again in the present pandemic situation, or is it the case that people from deprived sections of the world are needing the vaccine? That is where the example of typhoid came into picture, and so also malaria and filariasis. I won't go into the details, but if poorer sections of the globe which means underdeveloped or developing country population is primarily in need of the vaccine. Are there enough efforts put in to develop a vaccine is a question that I'm asking here. So that is because where will the money come from for such vaccine development? We desperately need a very, very good vaccine for malaria. Malaria is rampant in Africa. It is also true uh, in, in rampant in, Ma in India, in Southeast Asia, and it's not the case that there are no vaccine efforts done. But have you, has anybody heard about Kalazar and are there vaccine development efforts that anybody has heard? Hardly any. Nothing on a global scale or nothing on a wider scale. And this is because there is no profit. Poor countries do not necessarily manage to provide so much of money, and that is why there is a problem. So uh, at the last bullet point, again, I'm uh, skipping the one before that, but there is a global international effort even for COVAX, something that is described as COVAX, so that people all over the world, whether rich or poor, developing countries or underdeveloped countries should get vaccine. That was the idea. Unfortunately, all of us have seen that there is a, a major problem of vaccine access to very many countries all over the world, and those fall into this poor countries who do not have enough financial resources. And this is the last slide that I'm going to show. And this is simply to show you, I have looked at the data about clinical trials for certain diseases, and those diseases are listed here. COVID, malaria, Japanese encephalitis, influenza, dengue, polio, TB, and leishmaniasis. And the first uh, reference in the PubMed that we know of uh, was appears in 1948. And I have done this evaluation until January 20, uh, I'm sorry, Feb March 2021. So this is up to date information. And for different diseases, there are total citations in the PubMed. What you see is that on the right hand side is the average citations per year. Obviously, COVID is a one-year-old disease, so it has very many citations, 587 to be precise, until that uh, point uh, when I looked at the data. And it is even more at, as a frequency than all diseases put together. Look at the short bars. Japanese encephalitis, 
and leishmaniasis. There are other diseases also. Malaria also is somewhere as 20, 30 uh, citations per year. What does this indicate? That the efforts to get vaccine in place and for use are huge, humongous for COVID-19. They are also very, very high for influenza. Both these are diseases also seriously affecting the developed world and they are very minimal in Japanese encephalitis and leishmaniasis primarily because these are the diseases of the developed world. So the vac when we talk about vaccine failure, this is the failure, the very clearly seen one as a success and the other as a failure, which results into poor vaccination strategy. Thank you very much. I'll stop. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you Dr. Ball, uh, for, for a very nice presentation. Uh, we have time for uh, maximum two questions. So, uh, Dr. Ball, I have got uh, you know like uh, uh, a query from you rather than a question, because uh -huh. whatever, whatever vaccines actually are in the market for different types of you know like diseases, so uh, they are very effective, and I think they provide the long term you know protection. And I think the different companies claim that maybe uh, fifteen to twenty years. Now, yeah. in your presentation, uh, you have mentioned that uh, uh, one of the you know, kind of problems with the you know, vaccines which are there for the COVID-19, so they might be having the short-term memory. So, I mean, what is your sort of you know, comment with respect to, because these are new vaccines, so I don't know whether we can comment that how long protection we would expect from the COVID-19 vaccines. You are right. We cannot... We cannot comment on how long the protection would last. The point I highlighted was immediately after second dose of vaccine, when what Soma and others would know as the effective phase of the immune response, even in that phase itself, this evaluation was done because we as population globally was desperate to get the vaccine in place. So that is why this was pushed. And I, the point I, I highlighted was the safety was not compromised, but based on the immune response evaluation, it was released for emergency use in good old conditions. When the 10, 15 year duration was required, the vaccine response or the protective response was evaluated for a period of three to five years. And some vaccines actually protect for three to five years uh, after the course is complete. That information would emerge for SARS-CoV-2 vaccination. It will not, it is still not available. What people are saying that those who participated in phase one trial, for example, which was last May, June, they are still, most of them are still showing protection, which means they are probably at least the protective capacity may last for one year. But as we go down uh, the pandemic, we will know for sure how long this lasts is and also the variants would contribute in telling us whether the vaccination made with the original spike protein uh, is is actually going to provide us protection so this is something that's an ongoing process and there isn't an answer that anyone can give right now as a final answer so uh, can i ask, I think, can I ask yeah please, one question? Uh, please go ahead please so, Dr. Vinita, I wanted to get your opinion on the phenomenon of uh, uh, like original antigenic sin, something like that. That suppose uh, we sitting in India, we are uh, like exposed or getting naturally infected with the strain of virus which is floating here. And then uh, after a year or six months, suppose we get infected with another strain from US or uh, UK, like uh, their uh, variant. So, do you mm -hmm. think... Uh, do you think we will have like something of a hyperinflammation or antibody dependent enhancement or our situation may get worse? Like what is your comment on this? Uh, a very, very uh, clear answer based on data is not possible. That is because I keep saying SARS-CoV-2 infection is, an evol is evolving in the sense our understanding is also evolving. Of course, we know a lot more than earlier. And many people were infected in the past with um, common, co common cold coronavirus. And uh, 
uh, Dr. Shahid Jamil did show that there is only 50% sequence homology with SARS-CoV-2, and there is a lot more with SARS-CoV-1. But people who were infected even with SARS-CoV-1 many years ago have not shown what you are worried about, that is antibody-dependent cytotoxicity, uh, antibody-dependent enhancement, and hence risk of the disease getting worse. That we have not seen, and even post-vaccination, uh, it wasn't the case that everybody who was vaccinated was first tested whether the person was negative, meaning already infected or not. So anybody who is healthy has been given. So in that sense, also vaccines, first dose of vaccine served as a booster for many people. Based on the literature, we do not see that there is ADE as a major problem, antibody dependent enhancement, which seems to be the case for dengue. There we really have to worry about it, but it seems this is not the case. And coronaviruses, meaning common gen uh, coronaviruses, of course, some protection would be offered. People have also looked at those who were infected with SARS-CoV-1 as well as MERS, and there are at least T cell responses which are um, cross-reactive which are detectable but whether when you talk about original antigenic sin and so on whether how protective they will be is is a matter of actually doing investigations and collecting data you know very well in India we are not good about data collection Shahid also mentioned death rates so we are not good about data collection I don't need to reiterate even on this point there isn't good enough data, not just India, but possibly globally. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, is there, are there any other questions? So if there are no questions, I think then uh, I again uh, thank you, know, Dr. Vinita Ball, for a very nice presentation. Thank and uh, thank you, Dr. Ball, for sparing time and uh, joining us for this event. Thank you. Thank you. So our, uh, I would uh, I think our next you know, kind of speaker is the Professor Raghavan Bharatrajan, and uh, I think he's with us here. And uh, let me I, introduce. I'm him. not able to share my screen. Achha, achha. Uh, I think, uh, 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 yeah, yeah I think it will be done. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, let me introduce Dr. Uh, Raghavan Bharatrajan, and uh, Professor Raghavan Bharatrajan is an Indian biophysicist and faculty at Molecular Biophysics Unit, IISC Bangalore. He did his doctoral studies at the Stanford University and postdoctoral studies at the Yale University. Dr. Raghavan started his academic career at ISC Bangalore in 1992. At ISC, he is known for his research in the field of protein structure and protein folding, and his contributions in the developing vaccines and drugs for treating influenza and HIV. He served as an investigator for the DBT IAVI program, jointly organized by the Department of Biotechnology and International AIDS Vaccine Initiative for the development of HIV vaccines. Professor Varad Rajan is a former JC Bose National Fellow of the Department of Science and Technology and an elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and the Indian Science Academy. He is the recipient of the prestigious Shantisru Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology in the year 2002 for his contributions to the biological sciences. He also serves as the chairman of the scientific board of the pyramid uh, Novo Bio Biologics, a, a Bangalore based research platform engaged in the development of biological drugs. Very recently, his group has initiated work on immunogens derived from the spike glycoprotein of SARS-CoV-2, the positive agent of COVID-19 pandemic. So with this, you know, I now request Professor Bharat Rajan for his presentation. Thank you. Uh, well, Rajan, I think we, we, uh, we can see your slides, but I think your voice is not clear. So slides are visible to us, but I think your voice is breaking. Yes. I think slides are very good. Uh, 
uh, I think maybe uh, like an activity at your end might be a little weak. So uh, if you want to, maybe you can like uh, go the slides and maybe you, you try to see off your video, maybe it might help. What I can do yeah. I think maybe you can start okay. with this hope that uh, we can is it better you. now? I have switched off my video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it is better than before. Yeah, it is better now. We can see your slides and we can also hear you. Okay, very good. So thanks for the invitation. Um, and now don't know why the slides are not moving. Okay, so this is the uh, just a schematic of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I'll be talking about work that's been ongoing in my lab on. Uh, Raghun, can you do it slideshow, please? This is we are seeing something which is which is a very small image of your uh, slide. Slide okay, make so a slide. It, it is slideshow. So it I is not for the display for us here. Use use that button. Use slideshow. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, you see the full screen now? Yeah, now, okay, now. now I can I can see I can see the full yes. screen. Yes. Yeah, it is better now. Okay. So this is the uh, uh, coronavirus, and on the surface of the uh, coronavirus is uh, just a second is this spike, right? And the antibody uh, response really targeted against the spike protein. And the way infection happens is the uh, virus binds to the cellular receptor is two. And that leads to a series of downstream events, which eventually lead to viral entry into the cell. So there's fusion of viral and host membranes and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, now, even advancing my slides is a bit difficult. Okay, so this is a summary of existing clinical trial data. There are a number of different vaccine modalities and overall uh, the neutralizing antibodies have been similar in humans as they've been in small animals. They've been low for the inactivated virus and adenoviral vectors, similar to convalescent sera, better for mRNA vaccines and highest for the subunit vaccine uh, from Novavax. And largely high neutralizing antibody titers are associated with higher protection. Now, this is important because recent mutant strains are a major concern and there is a, a reduction of neutralizing antibody activity against mutant strains, especially the uh, South African strain. The good news is that relatively no, low titers of neutralizing antibodies are sufficient to protect non-human primates from uh, lung disease. And we still don't know the correlates of protection in humans, though certainly the uh, neutralizing antibodies will be important. And virtually all current formulations require refrigeration or freezing prior to uh, administration. Sorry. Uh, so these are the variants of concern. Shai has talked a little bit uh, about them. Now, I highlighted the mutations in the receptor binding domain, okay? Because this, the major fraction of neutralizing antibodies are directed towards the uh, receptor binding domain. So the South Africa variant has these three mutations in the RBD. The B.1.6.17 has two of them, and one of them is at the same position. So for the UK variant, neutralizing titers are largely unchanged in convalescent sera from uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccinees. Uh, whereas for the South Africa variant, there's at least a tenfold drop in neutralization uh, titers, and many uh, Convalescent sera show no neutralization against the variant. So this is a big deal, actually. So 
our candidate is the receptor binding you know this is a problem actually because i have these things okay so this is the spike protein this is the rbd and so shown in colors are regions where different neutralizing antibodies monoclonals are known to bind and as you can see essentially the whole surface of the rbd is a target for neutralizing antibodies so, uh, now in my screen part of my screen is covered by something which i can't get rid of is my screen visible to other people the full screen yes yes it is okay so i have something that i can't see it anyway so the uh, we have previously designed glycan engineered rbd fragments which were highly thermotolerant and elicited good titers of neutralizing uh, antibodies so now uh, I will talk about some recent oligomeric RBD designs. Okay. So if you look at uh, the spike protein has three different RBDs, which are located at different uh, relative regions in the spike. So what it was, we took a It's currently a very fashionable in uh, vaccine design circles. So this is the first one, the trimeric RBD, the disulfide link trimer. Just ignore these molecular uh, numbers there. But it's a which gets used as the trimeranthidone. And this is the nanoparticle conjugate. Uh, just to show you that the conjugation of the RP to the nanoparticle has uh, in now when we um, uh, so this just summarizes the rationale it's known that oligomers should improve immunogenicity but you don't want an immunogenic trimerization or oligomerization domain and we also looked at uh, nanoparticles for, for this uh, purpose so we carried out negative stain of the uh, matrix cartilage matrix protein RBD conjugate. You can see it forms very clean trimers uh, by negative stain EM. And then we looked at uh, thermal stress. Now, uh, this is when we expose the molecule in solution to transient thermal stress of about an hour. And you can see, all, and then cooled it down and all the way up to 70 degrees, you can see that the material is quite stable. When we lyophilized it, uh, we could keep it for uh, uh, very long times, uh, up to a month, okay? And it retained the uh, capability of binding ACE2 uh, by SPR, and the thermal transitions were also preserved. So the lyophilized material could even be subjected to boiling point temperatures in the lyophilized state, and when we cooled down and redissolved it, it bound perfectly well to the ACE2. So this is fairly unusual and re remarkable. And this is not a property of all trimers. Uh, so this is uh, when we took the other trimerization domain, which was more heterogeneous. You can see that with increasing temperature, it loses binding activity. And upon lyophilization also, it loses activity. So when we next looked at the immunogenicity of these uh, uh, oligomers in mice, so what we saw is uh, there's a bunch of data on this slide, but what we saw is that uh, compared to the monomer, we got a log increase in, uh, um, in uh, antibody binding titers. And the same was true of neutralization titers. So they also went up considerably. We expressed it in CHO cells um, as well, and that showed equivalent uh, properties. When we, uh, compared the different oligomeric constructs, 
these are neutralization titers. This is a log scale. So they're in, you know, about the 20 to 30,000 range. If you look at convalescence era in red, these are 100. Okay, so we've gone about 200 fold higher than convalescence era. And convalescence era is where the Chadox and the, uh, the inactivated vaccines are. Uh, this is a uh, nanoparticle neutralization. African virus, pseudo virus, and you can see that there's a very small drop in neutralization titer uh, for the. Uh, this is transiently transfected uh, material, CHO cells. Uh, this is the uh, um, the coslated IZ trimer. This is the nanoparticle, nanoparticle bit larger drop, and this is in human convalescent sera, where actually most show no neutralization of the South African virus. Uh, with the high titer sera, we get a very large drop, uh, uh, more than a log order drop. Okay, so this is a pretty uh, worrying thing, um, but fortunately our data are not are encouraging. So we were able to show significant neutralization of pseudo virus containing the three RBD mutations, and most convalescent sera lost the uh, neutralization. Okay. We also looked in guinea pigs at the immunogenicity. And here also we saw a reasonable immunogenicity. So these are the uh, titers after uh, the, 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 uh, um, the first and the second boost. These are neutralization titers. They went up a little bit. Um, these are the drop against the South Africa virus. So in guinea pigs, the drop is a little bit higher than mice. It's about a four-fold drop overall. When we immunized with the whole spike ectodomain, the drop was considerably large. And the RBD, at least the trimer RBD, the drop is a little bit less. We need to do more experiments to, uh, you know, to see if this is a real effect or not. So relative to sera elicited by the spike ectodomain, our trimer RBD sera showed a smaller drop in the titers. So, now, if we compare how the immunogenicity of our formulation versus things that are uh, already in people, okay, or we look specifically at things that had been tested in mice, and in the same study, what was the neutralization titer in human convalescent sera? Because different people have different neutralization assays, and they all have, uh, therefore, different values in human convalescent sera. And then in green, which is the most important data, is the ratio of the mice immunogenicity to that measured in human convalescent sera by the uh, people involved in the particular study. So you can see again that the Moderna is about tenfold higher, the Novavax is uh, you know about maybe twentyfold higher, and we are, if you look at the green bar, about two hundredfold higher. Okay? And uh, these are the viral vectors which are not don't do uh, so quite so well uh, in comparison to uh, human convalescent sera. And this is an inactivated virus, which is again, so these are 10 to the zero is one. So these are equivalent to the uh, convalescent sera. So, um, and it's already known from previous uh, studies that the immunogenicity data that you get in mice are highly predictive of the titers that you get uh, in humans. Okay. So we uh, next carried out hamster challenge studies and uh, shown here are those uh, results. So we challenge hamsters uh, at in the BSL-3 facility at IOC with a very high dose of 10 to the 6th uh, PSU of replicative virus. Um, these are just the immunogenicity data. So in hamsters, for some reason, the titers are quite a bit lower than mice and guinea pigs. Uh, 
but we still do see reasonable amounts of neutralizing antibodies uh, in the you know, 10 to the 3 uh, uh, range. And this is now the weight of the animals, the unchallenged healthy animals. This is the weight of the virus challenged animals, and this is of the vaccinated animals. So we get a transient weight loss, but then the animals start to recover. These are various clinical scores, and so all the animals were sacrificed at day four. And by day four, basically, their clinical scores have returned to baseline. And uh, uh, this is my immune cell influx. So, uh, overall, from uh, clinical disease. So, these slides, this panel at the top is uh, the histopathology from uh, uh, the unchallenged. Which is again, this is, I should say, also, this is a quite a high dose challenge. So, this uh, 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 formulation confers protection against high dose challenge in uh, Syrian golden hamsters. Okay, so now, um, so I'll uh, wind up here, so we have plenty of time for questions. So, as you're all aware, there are a number of uh, different vaccines which have been granted approval or authorization in various geographies, and uh, these recent mutations are a big concern, especially the uh, uh, three RBD mutations which are present in the South Africa virus, which uh, give neutralize, which leads to a big drop in uh, uh, neutralization titers, and with many convalescent sera completely lacking neutralization against the, the new South African virus. And this is of particular concern because the current vaccines which are deployed in India elicit neutralization titers comparable to those which are there in convalescent sera. Of course, neutralizing antibodies are not the only mechanism of protection, as uh, Vinita said, uh, T cells are very important, and so it's likely there will certainly be a, a substantial degree of uh, protection in vaccinated people, even with these vaccines. It's just that the lack of neutralization is certainly a major concern. So our current oligomeric for formulation is highly immunogenic and thermotolerant, which should not require a cold chain. The neutralization titers in small animals were about 20, that is in guinea pigs, and 300 fold in, in the mice, higher than in convalescent sera, showing much better immunogenicity than virtually all current licensed vaccines when compared in the same animal model. And the mouse sera show potent neutralization again. So even though there's a threefold drop, the titers are still really quite high, uh, much above what are present in convalescent sera against virus containing these uh, three uh, RBD mutations. We have permanent cell lines which are ready for process development, and we believe that such thermotolerant RBD derivatives show great promise to uh, combat COVID-19 and should not require a cold chain. Now, of course, the most important part of the talk is all the people who did the work. So these are the people in my lab who are responsible for all the, uh, 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 the uh, immunogen design characterization. Samir did a major part of the uh, immunogen design for the monomers and trimers. Rajmani, Dr. Rajmani Raju was responsible for all the hamster uh, immunizations and challenge studies. Uh, and uh, we got uh, the virus uh, and the virus challenge was uh, standardized by uh, him and Dr. Shashank uh, Tripathi, who's uh, uh, a new faculty member at IAC. These are the uh, people in my lab uh, Dev Jyoti made the uh, uh, mutant pseudovirus, the South Africa virus, uh, and all of these people have contributed in a number of different ways. Uh, Ishika Pramanik from uh, Dr. Somnath Dutta's lab did the uh, EM studies. Some of our initial pseudoviral assays were done at Professor Stalin Raj's lab on the monomeric proteins. 
the CPE based assays were done at THSTI by Shendra Mani uh, Shankar. And the uh, pseudoviral assays, which is essentially the bulk of what I presented, was done by Sahil uh, in uh, Dr. Rajesh Ringe's lab at CSIR in tech. So this was really uh, made a very important contribution to our work. Uh, and in fact, everybody here has made very important contributions. All the guinea pig and mouse immunizations and the serology work was done at Minvax, the uh, uh, IAC incubated startup. And these are the people who have uh, contributed very substantially to uh, all of that work. All the human convalescent sera samples were provided uh, by a collaboration between Dr. Rajesh Pandey at CSR IGB and the Max Super Speciality Hospital. Our initial work on the thermotolerant monomer was published in JVC last year, got quite a lot of attention. And this is part of what I have talked today is in a bioarchive uh, uh, stuff that is uh, you, you can look at if you're interested. The funding came uh, uh, from to get us started from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and also a bit, bit of funding from the uh, PSA's office to develop the hamster challenge study model. So with that, I would like to stop here, and I will be happy to uh, take questions. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Bharat Rajan, uh, for, for a very elaborate and very presentation. We have time for, I think, uh, two questions. So, uh, uh, anybody who can ask, we have time for two questions. So, uh, Professor Varad Rajan, actually, uh, like, uh, please forgive me, I'm asking like a lay person. Although I have worked in uh, Dana Farber for around five, six years, you know, in immunology, but uh, I'm a lay person. Fine away from you. So uh, my question is that, uh, you know, if you take the case of the RNA viruses, you know, and uh, HIV actually goes under extensive mutations. And I think there are so many different uh, forms of HIV which are known to us. And likewise, you know, like COVID-19, we are saying that there are you know, some mutations which are taking place. Of course, you know, we do not have a final vaccine for the influenza virus. So my question is that, you know, like, uh, are we able to you know, recognize that, you know, what are those uh, molecular mechanisms, you know, viruses, like uh, these RNA viruses are using for, because we know that RNA polymerases are different, you know, but, uh, you know, like RNA polymerases can itself, you know, kind of mutate their own genes sometimes and uh, it might give a very different strain. So what is the information sort of we have with respect to the mutations actually? which probably are the like the regulators of these mutations. You know, do we have some information with respect to the molecular mechanism or uh, any hotspots, you know, what, what, you know, kind of, I mean, of course, they resist the immune system and mutate, but do we have some other, you know, in-depth knowledge with respect to mutations in the RNA virus? Okay, I mean, that's a very general question, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm not probably the right person to comment on it. HIV, of course, has a far, far higher grade, grade uh, far higher, higher mutation rate than SARS-CoV-2. And I think the thing with the SARS-CoV-2, the reason these mutations are cropping up is simply because it's infected, A, it's infected such a large number of people because it's a respiratory virus, and B, uh, because of recombination, because, you know, these all these multiple mutations cannot have come by, uh, uh, you know, one after the other in a single virus. So, and I think no one anticipated that there would be so much recombination. So that's with the particular case of SARS-CoV-2 because it's a non-segmented virus. So flu, you know, is a big problem because it's segmented. And so you can have a very large scale antigenic uh, shift in addition to the drift. Uh, certainly I did not anticipate this level of uh, rapid genetic di diversity accumulating uh, in, in the present case. So, yeah, I mean, it's not a very good answer to your question, but that's, that's all. No, no, thank you very much. No, at least, no, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, any other question, actually? Uh, so, uh, if, if there are no questions, can, no, yeah, can, I ask, can I ask one question? Can yeah, I please go ahead. Please yeah. go ahead. So, Dr. Raghavan, because you have shown data with the mouse and hamster models, 
I want to ask your opinion about the best uh, uh, system which you think in your opinion and whether you would like to like what is the plan to whether people uh, in uh, uh, labs uh, who are doing preclinical studies should they aim for mouse uh, or hamsters or or like uh, the necessity for non-human primate model for testing uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine candidates? Yeah, so you know, it's, NHPs are good for immunogenicity, not for I think challenge. Uh, and of course, then it's expensive and it takes a long time to get permission to to do those studies. So uh, uh, mice, the uh, thing is, you either need mouse adapted virus, uh, or you need the ACE2 transgenic mice, which are in a bit of a short supply. And the people who make the mouse adapted viruses don't share them. So I think the you know. Well, not good, but the, uh, the basically the South African and some of these new variants are naturally infective in mice. So uh, if uh, you know we are able to get them from within India, then we can do uh, mouse challenge studies. Hamsters are, on the whole, a very I think a good model for pathogenesis for immune responses and vaccines. I don't think they're such a good model because the uh, immunogenicity in hamsters we find is quite different from mice and and guinea pigs uh, so but they are you know to show protective efficacy there's certainly a readily available model which doesn't require anything fancy other than a bs73 facility so you know i think if you have good mouse immunogenicity data and regulators want some challenge data i think that's that's sufficient to go into humans okay thank you so much thanks a lot so uh, thank you, Professor Bharat Rajan, and uh, thank you, you know, for joining us on all this occasion. We are very thankful. To you. Thank you. So now I think we we move to our next speaker, and uh, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Prabodh Kundu, and uh, let me introduce him. Dr. Prabodh Kundu is a co-founder and managing director at Prema's Biotech, located in Gurgaon, India. He holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from IIT Bombay and has interest in protein engineering and bioprocess development. Dr. Prabhu began his career at BioRed before moving to the Ranbaxi. In his most recent role as an entrepreneur, he co-founded Prema's Biotech along with his team in 2006 with investment from a group of UK-based Angel investors. In his 20 years of professional career, he has authored numerous publications and has multiple patents to his, his credit. He is an active member of Confederation of Indian Industries Biotech Group. At Premas, he manages multi-group specialties, including manufacturing, marketing, and business development, with keen understanding of the bio market in India and USA. Under his leadership, Premas Biotech has partnered with global companies such as with Jerusalem-based Armament Pharmaceuticals. The manufacturer for oral insulin, which he has successfully cleared, which has successfully cleared phase 2B trial in USA. Recently, Remas Biotech, in partnership with Armament Incorporation, is working on COVID 19 vaccine candidate term uh, Oravax, which can be taken in the form of an oral capsule. So, with this, you know, I, I welcome and uh, I invite Dr. Kundu for his presentation. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your very kind introduction and generous. And uh, thank you to the organizers. Can I be heard, sir? Uh, am I yeah, audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear and see your slides also. Thank you so much. And I'm deeply grateful to the Indian Immunological Society and the IIT Roorkee, including Dr. Shoma, for allowing me and inviting me to give this presentation. So today, I will talk about the perhaps the world's first triple antigen virus like particle against SARS-CoV-2 that we developed. But before that, if I could get the indulgence, I'll just introduce my company for maybe a minute or two so that many people do not know us while we've been around for quite some time. As a company, we primarily work on proteins. That is what our uh, genesis has been. And we've been building technologies and platforms that have been partnering with breakthrough technologies globally. Uh, we've been about 15 years. We have now presence and very happy and proud to say we have a presence being an Indian company uh, globally. Uh, we work with some of the largest pharma companies all over the world. We have about 170 people with over 100 scientists 
We have a GMP facility. We continue to grow. Uh, from a protein point of view, because this is you know a scientific session, we've done a lot of proteins, about over 750 different types. Uh, we have six molecules in clinics. As uh, Sir mentioned with Oramed, we have oral insulin for the first time, uh, nearly 100 years after insulin has been discovered in phase three in the US to be delivered orally. And uh, we're very happy to be their partners. And there has been general progress and growth thereof. I uh, put out a list, I'll, I'll share my slides, so they'll be there for many of the students and others to look at it. But safe to say, uh, what we are really now pushing forward is the virus-like particle against SARS-CoV-2, both from the intramuscular point of view and oral point of view, and I'll cover both. So as a company, we, we took a very early position on the SARS-CoV-2 and said, uh, we would like to be part of most of the development that is there. And whatever we can do, uh, whether uh, sitting in India, we would do the best. Uh, we've tied up with a lot of people to supply the antigens. We are the only company in the world to have both the M and E as well. And now uh, we are going into the phase one clinical trial, as well as work with some of the companies here, like Tata's, who've come up with the Feluda uh, detection kit and all. So we've been hand down involved with SARS-CoV-2 in multiple ways. Coming to the vaccine that we've developed, it takes me back to about January when I was in the US at that time traveling and one of my colleagues called me up and said, you know what, there is a new pandemic that's on the way. And we looked at some of the data and the three surface proteins are all membrane or membrane type proteins. And I said, oh really? And the reason I say this is because we had a long history. We've done over 60, 70 because one of our major focus was, can we do difficult to express proteins? And we've built technologies around it. And I said, okay. And that's when I asked one of my colleagues is, can we do all the three together? And they said, why? I said, you know, we've worked on certain animal corona vaccines and viruses, and we do know spike mutates. And this is around February last year. Now, why don't we take three of them? He says, okay. So we took spike, membrane, and envelope. As we all know and have seen now over the various conversations today and talks, spike mutates. However, membrane and envelope does not. And perhaps as we saw, one of the reasons that could be possible is that Covaxin actually is protective against mutations is because being a whole virus, it allows you to see uh, the immune system, all the surface proteins. So we took the three major surface proteins, spike, membrane, and envelope, and we designed our virus-like particle. And we expressed it in yeast. And why did we take yeast? Because for 12 years, very quietly, we've been working on making this tremendous platform and making it amenable for uh, membrane protein expressions. We can make and create three proteins recombinantly inside that uh, expression system. And remarkably, we have been able to uh, control through molecular biology and biochemical engineering, the stoichiometry. Even here, when we look at the VLP, and I'll come to that a little later, we've been quite successful at maintaining the stoichiometry between S, M, and E. Of course, yeast is well known. It's very safe. It's been uh, a vehicle for both human and animal health vaccines, and it can be scaled to thousands of liters, and we know how to do it. So how does the molecular biology happen? We, in our vectors, once we cloned all the three proteins, in the endo endoplasmic reticular space, we made sure that there was a heavy traffic of both the S, M, and E, which meant because there was crowding of the ER, it was getting pushed out into the Golgi. And being a protease deficient strain, which we had obviously knocked out, both PRB and PET4, the heterologous protein expression did not, you know, happen, break down. And then they all went into this space called ERGIC, which is the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi intermediate complex space. And this is where the virus actually matures, the original virus. So all we had to do was make sure that we made enough protein in the ER and Golgi space there, and they would then mature out into the virus-like particle. And this is, was a theory we had proposed. 
And it was remarkable that once we saw the cryo electron microscopy picture, the cryo TAF, uh, we were delighted. And we have now conducted subsequent studies to show, and I will talk about it later, that it indeed has all the three proteins there. The spike is actually processed into S1, S2 because yeast has a natural Kex protease, and we have actually promoted that. And we are very, very grateful to Dr. Monidip. I believe she speaks after me at IIT Delhi for allowing us and helping us with such beautiful pictures. And you would indeed agree, this is indeed a beautiful picture. But when, when you think of it, so what would the immune system see? It would see this aggregation or com coming together of these three proteins in this virus-like particle, and it would going to react to it. The, the liquid formulation that we have is obviously at two to eight degrees centigrade. However, uh, one of my colleagues one day said, what happens if we dry it? And luckily she didn't talk to me because as a protein person, I would have sort of you know half committed harakiri because we can never think of uh, lyophilizing a three protein VLP, thinking of all the problems. But however, she took help of one of my colleagues and they dried it. Once they dried it and it could be brought back well, upon hydration, to a similar virus-like particle, we were quite thrilled. And that's how the oral formulation started taking place, where we start, spoke to Aramed and we said, look, in your oral formulation, you have all the excipients that we make and we know the technology and you have insulin. What happens if you just take insulin out and put in the VLP and they got excited. We started a company called Auravax and uh, the big data is extremely exciting. And I'll cover a little bit there. So, what was our path to clinical trial? You must understand three protein VLP from a vaccine point of view, development point of view is very challenging because you have to justify the presence, position, and the utility of all these three vaccines, uh, antigens. And data was coming out. Today we can say, yes, we have a protection, we have got mutations, but last year, 12 months from now, there was very little data, even reagents were not available. So what we did is we made the clones, we did the expression studies, uh, we carried out manufacturing development, we did all the formulation analytics, and then we got approval at sequential steps from the government of India. GLP talk studies are going on. And of course, there's a phase one study that has been designed. This is for the intramuscular, uh, which we'll be conducting shortly in India. Uh, the benefits of having it in an East platform is numerous, and I'll cover that a little later. Let's look at some of the clone and CNC data. We have obviously scaled it up beyond this, but I'm just for the sake of understanding, showing you how data is represented when we go into CMC. We show a sort of consistency of production, three batches. There is a process of purification. Being a very large VLP, we are mostly purifying based on size discrimination rather than charge selection. We did try charge selection, but it was difficult. So we went ahead and did work based on size selection. Uh, very happy to report that if you consider about 20 micrograms as a dose, we are making significant amount of doses, maybe 6,000 doses per liter. Uh, the production being yeast is hardly five and a half to six days. So everything is sort of working on your side to make something which is scalable, something which has a safe force, and something which is very productive. Then, of course, we did a lot of biophysical characterization, DLS, SEC, uh, looking at the host cell protein, host cell DNA, and so on and so forth, to make sure that we get early approval and making sure that the risks are reduced. Then we did, of course, uh, peptide mapping. We showed that it has all the three proteins. Not only that, S1 exists, and so does S2, M and E. Then we went ahead with uh, some mice studies and now the GLP studies. In the non-GLP mouse studies, while it is non-GLP, we carried out extensive studies to look both uh, horizontally and vertically at the doses as well as the number of doses. And we found that even when we give them even three times the intended or four times the human intended dose, there is no change in uh, temperature nor body weight. However, we got extreme very high humoral response against the specific IgG response against the, whether it's the VLP alone or VLP with squalene as one of the uh, adjuvants or VLP with al hydrogen uh, against uh, the human convalescent sera. Uh, 
uh, and knowing fully well that mice has a significant less amount of IgG. And then more interestingly, we got you know, a very high response or adequate response against each of the three antigens that were there. Uh, then we carried out PRNT assays uh, with the help of THSTI, and we also carried out neutralization assays using the GenScript kit. We got very good neutralization, and we also saw long-term protective. Here I've just shown 110. We've gone beyond 180 days. To also just look at how the VLP would interact with the human convalescent patient sera and blood, and because these were early days, we wanted to see whether the T cell repertoire, um, sorry, I must go back a little. I didn't show data. We did a lot of analysis on all the blood types and of the mice and the individual immunocomp uh, components of the cells. T cells, B cells, every sort of cell was analyzed by facts and everything which was supposed to be okay was okay. And an only thing where we saw a little bit of increase was in the B cells, which were in the lungs and which is protective in nature. Uh, on the other hand, what we did is when we took uh, patient sera versus healthy controls and convalescent patient blood, and we incubated with the VLP, the convalescent patient sera had never seen this VLP, and the fact that they would proliferate against it was very heartening for us. Then again, we saw that the uh, T cell proliferation induced a very healthy IF and gamma response. So that gave us a lot of good data to approach the regulators and say this a not only would be safe but please allow us to move very quickly into uh, clinics and based on this data and coupling with the fact that we were able to dry it lyophilize it what happened was um, some international com companies and countries are looking at actively giving us a direct phase one approval for going into uh, for the oral so without taking much time, I know I rushed through a lot of data, but I'm happy to take as many questions later on to give you a little summary of the liquid, which is that the VLP expressed as near virus like surface features as per the cryo TM. The host being yeast is very safe. It's a very high producer and it's highly scalable. The cost of goods, which is very important, are projected to be low or very competitive globally. Um, just to give you an example, the vial was much more expensive than the cost of goods. There's a huge potential for a low cost abundant supply of the vaccine doses. My study shows that it's very safe. It's quite immunogenic and it generates significant or a potent neutralizing antibody response. The high antibody titer in both immunized mice correlates with even humans and with some of the humoral immune response we saw also in mice, which I have not shown here, a T cell response. Uh, we also saw the human convalescent patient sera react to this, and uh, we see protective efficacy as well in, in the data that we carried out. Now, what's the future looking like? While we have the liquid formulation, we have recently formed a company called Auravax, and uh, Auravax is a joint venture between Premise and Auramed. Premise is virus-like particle, and Auramed's oral delivery system. So it's going to be a capsule. It's a soft gel capsule. Uh, very happy to say while I was waiting to for my turn to speak, we just got approval uh, from one of the agencies to start manufacturing uh, the doses that will be given to humans. Uh, so we will be the only oral candidate now targeting all the three antigens. Big studies which we carried out in Israel showed that uh, we got very high IgA uh, response from the nasal washings as well as colon washings. Uh, we found it to be very safe. It is highly immunogenic as well in pigs. And just to give you how many doses can be made is if while we don't have a 20,000 liter fermenter, um, a 20,000 liter fermenter would make about 30 million doses, intended doses, which means, and there are multiple 20,000 liter fermenters even in India. And yeast has been something that people have been working with. Uh, so we believe that if it is possible and we can show quick turnaround in the clinical trials, the oral dose may, and if, if and only if it is efficacious in humans, may offer a tangible alternative 
because it's also room temperature stable. So it would do away with sort of the hospitalization or the hospital medical improvement. Millions of syringes and you know things and plasticware would be eliminated. Uh, you would be able to take it hopefully in the comfort of your home without going out and standing in line. And uh, this is what keeps us awake. And uh, despite significant toll, uh, I am uh, also infected right now, but I'm getting better. Uh, we continue to work uh, to try and make this happen. So what's our way forward? The intramuscular, as I said, we'll, we'll be completing GLP talks shortly, and we will be approaching the control drug controller's office for a phase one approval to allow us to get into phase one. The oral vaccine, the pig study, uh, a more elaborate one is going on, but we apply to various countries. It's called the IMPD document to allow us to present data and get uh, accelerated uh, approvals to go in. Right now, whichever country and partners allow us the rapid progress into phase one, uh, we will be going ahead and uh, trying to see. And uh, nothing of this, I'm only the speaker as uh, Professor Raghavan said. Uh, there's a team of over 60 people, 70 people at premise, uh, who are continuously day and night working on this. But I'm grateful to IIT Roorkee and the Indian Immunological Society for giving us this opportunity. We we try and do our best. Uh, to IIT Delhi, Dr. Manideepa, for your help in the cryo microscopy. THSTI, Dr. Shankar, thank you so much for getting us some of the data. And to, if I may point out to one of my colleagues, Dr. Nupur, who had the insight to dry a VLP. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Andrew. Uh, I think we have uh, time for maybe two or three questions. So, if I may, can I ask a question? Yeah, please, please go ahead. So, uh, my question, or uh, like I'm trying to understand. Uh, uh, Dr. Prabhuda, that uh, uh, for flu vaccines, it has been shown that a flu shot is usually given intranasally. So if you can, uh, maybe like uh, if you have a dried VLP, what is your comment on using it for an intranasal uh, vaccine rather than a uh, oral vaccine? Very good suggestion, ma'am. Uh, in As you speak, there are people who are requesting uh, the license from us to try that out as well. As a small company, we cannot try everything. You must understand resources and we must somewhere try to be very laser focused on our goals. So we would be very happy to partner or you know, discuss. And already people have asked us. So thank you. So uh, I think Dr. Kundu, I have got uh, maybe two or three queries from you. Uh, I think uh, approach, you know, using, for example, a VLP, I think is a very promising approach and uh, where you can load actually the three antigens, you know, S, M, and E. So, uh, since, you know, kind of most of the vaccines have been directed against the S and spike protein. So, are you, you know, kind of in your formulation, are you going to put, you know, sort of more sort of models or concentrations of S compared to M and E antigen? Or the, you are putting into equimodal ratio? Uh, for, for using it to practice. Right. <clears throat> so uh, we are allowing nature. See, in nature also, when this uh, RNA virus infects a mammalian cell, we are not controlling the S, M, and E stoichiometry. Uh, a, this is a pleomorphic virus, so the size and shape can change. And B, that stoichiometry, but there is a natural stoichiometry which is there, which means how much of S, how much of M, and how much of E will come together within a range. Incidentally, sir, very happy to let you know that we allowed that natural stoichiometry to take place inside the yeast cell. It doesn't bud out. We have to lyse the yeast, but we get about a thousand copies of S. We get about a range of, I mean, please don't hold me to it. It's between thousand and say 1100 or, you know, there is a range of plus minus 5%, 8% of S is to M is to E. S and M is the highest, E is obviously the lowest, which is between 20 and 40 um, copies inside the VLP, which is very similar to what was reported to SARS-1, because yet SARS-2 data is to come out. Um, we are one of the few people who are reporting this ratio, 
but let us see. So you are right, sir. We we don't put equimolar ratios. We allow the natural ratio to be represented. Now, now second, you know, kind of thing, you know, you have pointed out that uh, spike protein is more, you know, kind of prone for mutation as compared to M and E. Any sort of, you know, kind of molecular, you know, sort of reason we have that why US protein, you know, is more mutated, you know, because you said the M and E probably they don't mutate. And I think this is an RNA virus, so uh, you know, like uh, it probably can target any of it to, to get mutated. True, sir. Uh, first disclosure: I'm not an immunologist, not a molecular biologist. So, but I did pose this question to Dr. Jamil because he, 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 we, and him do talk a lot on many of the things. I, I, I tremendously look up to him, sir, because S1 handshakes with ACE2 receptor, and that is the primary mechanism of infection. Therefore, it is obvious that there would be a lot of human or anatomical pressure to sort of avoid that, because if that is the road which is getting blocked, then what is the other road that remains open? And many of these mutations coming from a pure protein point of view, if you see, is either a neutral amino acid becoming charged. So which means, that what is the virus trying to naturally do is increase the strength of binding between ACE2 and itself. And hence, either the antibody remains uh, useless in terms of its ability to you know, dislodge it or block it. What are we trying to do is, and why do we think M and D? Because M and D is are not under population pressure as such, because it's, it's assumed that they don't have a role in the infection or the progress of infection. Though I do know that people are looking at E protein as a therapeutic target because it forms the viroporin pore. And um, our logic was it's like having a three insurance policies. While S may mutate and the affinity or the avidity, the polyclonal response may come down, the antibody response against M and E is actually quite there. And we took 100 uh, serum samples from THSTI of convalescent patient sera, which were 0 to 6 days uh, RT-PCR, 7 to 15, 15 to 22. And we again titrated it against all the three antigens to prove our case that a three antigen uh, merit is there. It's interesting, the highest immunogenicity is against spike for the first 15, 20 days. Later on, M and E starts kicking up when N starts waning. So I don't know. It's only a our theory looking at the blood samples that maybe M and E have a delayed immune response later on. Uh, that's all we can say right now. And uh, I think my last question would be that, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, of course, mutation is a big problem for even COVID-19, I think. So uh, I know that, you know, WHO has established some centers, you know, around the globe, you know, I, at least, I think in 110 countries. And uh, they are primarily because they were studying the human influenza virus, you know, for the mutation. Now, also, you know, I think uh, more than 6,000, uh, like, genome sequences have been deposited from India itself, you know, about COVID-19. So, uh, my question is that, you know, like, uh, do we know some hotspots, you know, probably which are mutating? And uh, if, you know, kind of we can identify, the, like, three or four more, like, major mutations, is it possible to go for designing a peptide for the vaccine? Because we can probably design a vaccine with four like a uh, uh, peptide isotypes, you know, which probably would be representing those four mutants. Is there any effort, you know, kind of being taken in terms of designing a peptide vaccine for COVID-19? Tackle all these mutations. Uh, I'm sure there are. There are 164 efforts being made globally, which are in clinical, preclinical. So I'm sure somebody is doing it. But what is more interesting is what we are doing is in six weeks, we can change the S because it's a, it's a simple cloning exercise in our system. So we have the Yuhan S we can bring in and we have actually, and that's why we are deeply interacting with BIRAC on this is we are now putting in multiple there. So like a polyvalent influenza vaccine, it's very easy to generate in our platform. And we are very, and we will be interacting with a few of the speakers here or the, the speakers later on. For doing challenge studies and all. So if I can Sir Shari Kumar has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Dr. Kundu, I think very interesting talk and very promising result. We are hoping soon we'll have uh, the vaccine, VLP based vaccine in the market. 
uh, just a quick question because there's already this uh, chimeric virus technology out there. So what about chimeric virus like particles? Do you think the chimeric virus like particles will give a better antibody and T cell response? I mean, offhand, I, I haven't I haven't seen the data that they have presented yet, so I cannot offhand. But my simple answer is this is not a race. If anybody comes with anything which is better than anything which is out there, he or she or that technology should be promoted and lifted up. I mean, if I may say a rising tide lifts all boats, you know, it's not selective. So if that is true, then let it's not about if my VLP or there. If that works better than ours, given the pandemic it is, ma'am, I would be thrilled. No, no, the question is, what do you think? Do you think the chimeric can work better or same or, you know, um, what's your comment on it? As I said, I'm not the right person to be honest with you okay. because I haven't seen the data, but okay. but if somebody knows and it works better, God bless. Uh, because it, at IIT Roorkee, we are working on some chimeric virus like particles with alpha virus and see if you know we are making a combination. So we are on it. So uh, maybe I'll talk to you later and uh, please, please do reach. Yeah. Like we know that some, the Pasteur Institute has reached out to us for the M because it seems the M can be put into another VLP sort of thing. And you know, there are discussions going on using E and M and you know, beyond the S and N. So there is. Sure. OK, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I know my next speaker is there. So, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, if there are no sure. questions, you know, I would uh, thank, you know, Dr. Kundu for uh, like encouraging, I would say, and promising talk and very elaborate presentation. And uh, thank right. you for spending time and joining uh, with us, you know, on this again. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. So I think our uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Mani Deepa Banerjee. And uh, she's already here, so let me know kind of introduce her. Professor Mani Deepa Banerjee is an uh, associate professor at Kusuma School of Biological Sciences at IT Delhi. She did her PhD in chemistry from University of California, San Diego, USA, and postdoctoral studies at the Scripps Research Institute, Lodula, California, USA. She started her academic career as an assistant professor at IT Delhi from 2010. Her current research interests include engineering the flock house insect virus into a nanoparticle or chemotherapeutic drug delivery and structural function study of the host cell input by non embedded viruses like hepatitis A. She has published over 42 papers in peer reviewed journals. Her lab at IIT Delhi conducts extensive research on viruses. The main goal of her research is the host virus interactions and virus mediated regulation of the immune response for developing effective antivirals. Currently, Professor Mani Deepa is leading teams on computational prediction of possible novel COVID-19 structural proteins inhibitors from as a vector indica, that is the mean, and is designing virus-like particles as vaccine candidate against novel coronavirus. I now request Professor Banerjee for her presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for the very generous introduction. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Shoma, for organizing this conference and uh, for inviting me uh, for a talk. Uh, let me now try to share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible to everybody? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can see. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you. So, um, uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to present actually falls in the area of COVID immunology uh, per se. Uh, but as I understand, uh, this uh, virus like particles was, uh, it was discussed previously uh, by Dr. Kundu. I'm, I'm sorry to have missed uh, his talk and it will also be discussed later. So I would just uh, take this opportunity to reiterate uh, the, the potential of virus-like particles as uh, very effective vaccine candidates and uh, really, uh, which is more my interest, really excellent tools for understanding uh, the initial stages of virus-host interaction. And this is particularly important for uh, viruses that are BSL-3 or BSL-4 type because, uh, you know, a lot of initial studies on trying to uh, 
understand the, uh, the manner of interaction of the virus with the host or uh, to identify inhibitors can occur in the uh, in the BSL-2 facilities or BSL-1 facilities using the virus mimics that are virus-like particles. So, uh, so I'll touch upon this uh, as, as a part of my talk. I understand I have maybe 15 minutes. Um, so uh, without further ado, and I think this was discussed uh, again in the previous talk. Uh, so virus-like particles are essentially virus particles without uh, genome. And uh, although it is wrong to assume that virus-like particles do not have any um, any nucleic acid, because typically these are made by viral proteins which have the ability to self-assemble, and many of them have uh, regions that are positively charged, which has to be neutralized by the presence of either tRNA or rRNA from the heterologous expression systems where these are made. But, but typically these are made by uh, viral proteins capable of self-assembly, which results in the multivalent display of antigens that are very similar to the native virus. And as a result, these uh, elicit uh, strong humoral or CTL responses. Um, and the uh, commercial potential of virus-like particles as vaccines has been established in the past and currently being established. Um, the virus-like particles of hepatitis B virus or human papilloma virus have been used as very effective vaccines. Uh, so that is not in question. And also because these uh, particles lack the infectious genome, so there are no safety issues associated with them. Uh, now, the, the easiest type of virus-like particles to make are, are those which are generated from, uh, which are based on non-enveloped viruses because these are relatively more stable. And these can be generated by expression of the main capsid protein or, or you know, one or two capsid proteins in a heterologous expression system. And uh, these can be generated easily and these are relatively more stable. But when we come to enveloped viruses, uh, the situation is a little bit uh, difficult because typically enveloped viruses contain uh, glycoproteins that are embedded in the lipid envelope. And then uh, there are other uh, proteins like uh, some kind of a matrix protein which holds everything together and then nucleocapsid proteins which, which bring together, the, which packages the genome. So, so in order to make virus-like particles of enveloped, corresponding to enveloped viruses, we need some pre-knowledge of the requirements, basic requirements for assembly. Uh, here, of course, uh, the uh, chimeric VLPs uh, become very important because there are several examples where uh, the glycoproteins are used uh, in conjunction, uh, glycoproteins from a particular infectious virus are used in conjunction with the base non-enveloped virus-like particle uh, for stability and also to, to ensure multivalent display. Now, when we talk about uh, VLPs of enveloped viruses, the choice of expression system becomes very, very important uh, <clears throat> to ensure that there is correct post-translational modification because this part is, is very important for the immunogenicity of the VL, eventual immunogenicity of the VLPs. And the establishment of purification strategies becomes difficult, particularly for viruses that are pleomorphic, meaning they have a range of, they come in a range of shapes and sizes because here size dependent, density dependent purification becomes difficult or becomes difficult to establish. Um, so when, when it comes to SARS coronavirus 2 uh, particles, uh, I think you're all aware that these are enveloped particles that are pleomorphic. The, um, um, the diameter falls between 70 to 140 nanometer. And there are four main structural proteins, which are, um, as, uh, as has been discussed previously, <clears throat> the spike protein, which is the main antigenic determinant and is required for all the initial work uh, to get the genome inside the cells, including receptor binding and membrane fusion. Uh, then there are two proteins, which are membrane and envelope proteins. Uh, the membrane protein is the most abundant protein in, in the viral envelope and it directs the assembly of particles by interacting with uh, all the other major structural proteins uh, like a spike and nucleocapsid and the en uh, envelope protein. And the envelope protein is a very small integral membrane protein which is involved in uh, promoting the um, 
um, assembly and particularly the budding and release of, of virus particles. So um, the uh, this is a very common theme in a lot of enveloped uh, viruses or enveloped virus families which use uh, a protein like the envelope protein uh, and channel forming protein to ensure that uh, the virus budding is, is seamless and, and progeny viruses can be released effectively. And then there is the nucleocapsid protein which associates with viral RNA and the <clears throat> presence of this nucleocapsid protein in, in vaccine candidates is a little bit of a controversial subject because in case of the previous SARS coronavirus, it was shown that the N protein may be responsible for lung immunopathology. But, but recently it has been shown for the current pandemic virus that uh, inactivated viruses which contain the N protein do not seem to induce a lot of lung immunopathology as was shown uh, effectively in case of PicoVac, uh, which is an inactivated virus uh, vaccine. Um, also, this, this controversy regarding whether the N protein is required or whether it is dispensable for formation of VLPs. So, work from Pauli Roy's lab in 2004 on the previous uh, SARS coronavirus had shown that just the presence of M and E is sufficient to form, um, I'm not sure if my cursor is visible, uh, sufficient to form these particle like uh, structures. And then the presence of uh, S on top of M and E results in the production of these uh, these particles, which look very much very much like uh, native uh, viruses. Um, however, later on, it was shown that the presence of the nucleocapsid protein is important to improve the yield of VLPs, and it, it results in the increase in yield in in several uh, several forms. Uh, so when we started generating our virus-like particles, our goal was to generate something as authentic as possible, as close to the native particles as possible. And we wanted to use the mammalian cells, as uh, we know that these generate the exact post-translation modification or close to exact. However, these are very expensive and the yield is typically low. So we ended up using all four structural proteins, M and E as these are necessary for generating the particle, S because it gives the, uh, the antigenic characteristic to the VLPs and N so that the yield can be increased. So this is our uh, strategy for uh, generating the constructs, the expression and purification. So we co-express all four structural proteins, uh, sp uh, spike, membrane, envelope, and nucleocapsid. Uh, and uh, by, by transfection in HEK293 T cells. We are still sticking with adherent cells, but very soon we'll be moving to XP293 uh, cells for, for uh, higher uh, yield. And uh, the VLPs are uh, bud out in the culture supernatant. From there, we have uh, worked out a purification protocol. Typically, VLPs are purified by some kind of gradient purification, but that is, does not really translate very well to industrial scale. So we have worked out a method where we first uh, pellet these on a sucrose cushion, and then we purify this by an optimized ion exchange uh, purification protocol. And then we characterize it by using various methods that I'm going to show in uh, uh, right now. So what we see when we do the ion exchange or we carry out our ion exchange protocol is that typically we get uh, an illusion peak, which is uh, very, very consistent. So this uh, comes out at uh, around the same uh, solute uh, concentration at, at uh, uh, in, in multiple purification steps. And then we also have a flow through fraction and the flow through essentially appears to consist of multiple, uh, um, multiple different uh, types of material and some of which in, in dynamic light scattering seems to have fairly high uh, molecular uh, weight or, uh, or uh, rather size, whereas the elution peak appears to be fairly consistent from, from batch to batch. Uh, we have shown using um, uh, Western blots against uh, uh, using anti-S antibody, anti-N antibody, and anti-M antibody that we get the uh, corresponding bands in, in the elution peak. We do get S, N, and M. Interestingly, in the flow through fraction, although we do get cross reactivity with the S and N antibodies, we do not get cross reactivity with the M antibody, which kind of shows that perhaps the flow through is just an aggregate of different uh, fractions of spike and nucleocapsid proteins. 
now we did structural characterization using um, negative stain and cryoelectron microscopy. So in negative stain electron microscopy, we find that we get a range of uh, particles with a different size range. It ranges from uh, 70 to 140, a little more uh, in, in terms of diameter. And when we do cryoelectron microscopy, then we clearly see the presence of these uh, spike-like projections that you see here that are shown in, in arrows. Now, what has been very interesting for, uh, for us uh, in, in terms of uh, physical char structural characterization of these particles is uh, the virus itself is supposed to be pleomorphic, meaning it has a range of shapes and sizes. In, in case of the VLPs, though, the ones that we are generating, we see them as predominantly uh, circular in shape, although the diameter does vary. And we, we really don't have an explanation for it, but we think it could be because of the lack of the actual the native genome. Perhaps the presence of the native genome is is uh, is what promotes uh, pleomorphicity, but this is not something that we have addressed or we clarify. Uh, now, this is just to show you the consistency of production. So in multiple uh, different cycles, we get the same uh, type of um, ion exchange profile, DLS, Western dots, and, and uh, the particle uh, shapes and sizes. And um, our, cons our uh, production currently is, uh, if we uh, sort of uh, project, it's around 12 to 15 uh, milligrams per liter, which is pretty good consisting the mammalian expression system. Now we wanted to confirm, apart from the structural analysis, that the proteins are actually present in the right conformation in our VLPs. So we, we do see in ELISA assays that the VLPs have maximum cross-reactivity to the anti-prefusion spike trimer CIRA, so anti-CIRA against this. Uh, then a little bit less for the anti-RBD CIRA and, and much less for the anti-nucleocapsid CIRA, which makes absolute sense. Uh, given the organization of these uh, different components in, in, in the virus. Also, we, we did um, this uh, ELISA assays with different types of uh, spike and commercially available spike antibodies. So spike polyclonal against the S1 seemed to have more binding capability than a monoclonal against an S2 region, which is relatively hidden or expected to be relatively hidden. So this all shows that our structural proteins are in the right conformation in the VLPs as we would expect. And given that they are in the right conformations, we also see significant binding to the uh, to a construct, which is the human AC2 receptor in conjunction with FC of IgGs, uh, which also indicates that the VLPs are uh, are functional, functional in the or structurally appropriate in the sense that they can be functional in terms of receptor binding and and other uh, other activities. Now, currently, we are carrying out immunogenicity studies in conjunction with THSTI, and our first round of data. We are currently doing uh, booster shots, but in our uh, first round of data has shown that the VLPs in conjunction with uh, 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 types of like uh, uh, alum are showing uh, fairly high immunogenicity, just the VLPs on their own are showing uh, related, uh, relatively good immunogenicity as one would expect because of the multivalent display, but in conjunction with the adjuvants, the immunogenicity is higher. Uh, now we come to uh, what we want to do with the VLPs. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the characteristics of the VLP show that they can be relatively good uh, vaccine candidates. Uh, however, also the native like VLPs can be a very good tool to try to identify or try to understand what goes on in the early stages of virus host interaction. Uh, so we, we looked at uh, essentially uh, the association of uh, VLPs uh, with various cell lines here. I'm presenting the data corresponding to U87 MG cells, which are uh, glioblastoma cells, uh, neuronal cells uh, of epithelial uh, origin. And we showed using an anti-spike antibody uh, coupled with an Alexa uh, dye that VLP shows significant binding to the surface of U87 MG uh, cells. Now, uh, interestingly, um, the uh, very recently or sometime last year, uh, in addition to um, AC2, another receptor for uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 particles were discovered, and this receptor is neuropilin. 
and uh, neuropilin is uh, supposed to promote the uh, entry of SARS coronavirus 2 in, in cells in conjunction with AC2 or in cells which have very low levels of AC2. So U87MG cells are, do not contain a lot of uh, AC2, but they do contain substantial amounts of, of neuropilin. So we, we showed that actually neuropilin is present on the surface of these cells as opposed to our control cells, which are HGK293 T cells that have neither a lot of neuropilin nor AC2. And we, we tried to monitor and the process of monitoring the entry of these uh, BLPs in, um, in um, uh, U87MG cells. And we showed that in, in uh, contrast to HGK293 T cells, which do not contain the neuropilin receptor, in U87MG cells, there is significant uh, binding. So this is data at four degrees and then uh, data at 37 degrees. So at four degrees, we show that there's significant binding of the particles to the surface of the cells. And then at 37 degrees, uh, on co-staining the cells with uh, endosomal, endosome specific dyes, uh, around, um, at around at a 30 minute time point, we start seeing a significant co-localization of our BLPs with, uh, with the uh, endosome specific dyes, showing that they are uh, following the same pathway that the, the actual virus is, is supposed to follow. Now, this scan or this uh, process can be utilized to identify for initial identification of inhibitors of virus entry. And here, uh, among other things that we're working on, we have been working with a small peptide, which is called TLIP1. TLIP1 is a CENTR uh, type peptide that binds to a neuropilin receptor. And we wanted to see whether the presence of this peptide or co incubating cells with this peptide would prevent the uh, binding of uh, VLPs to cells. And we found that indeed, uh, when we use TLIP1 at a ratio of 7 is to 1 compared to VLPs, we see significant reduction or almost an elimination of the binding of um, VLPs to cells, showing that uh, this can be a, a starting point to try to identify inhibitors of virus entry. Uh, now, another aspect of VLPs that we are uh, at this point following up is to uh, see if VLPs can be a tool to monitor membrane fusion uh, in, in addition to entry. So uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 VLPs that we have generated, we have uh, labeled these VLPs with a lipophilic dye, which has a very long name that you see here, but its short name is DID. And essentially, this is a fluorescent dye when it is incorporated in, in uh, viruses in the lipid envelope. Uh, the dye is quenched, so there is really no fluorescence, and fluorescence is at baseline level. But when there is uh, an, uh, an, an event that uh, ruptures or causes any kind of alteration in, in the lipid profile or in the lipid envelope, then this dye is dequenched and we can start seeing that there is increased fluorescence. For example, here, in, in presence of a little bit of detergent, you can see that because the envelope is rupturing, the fluorescence is increasing about 600 fold. So uh, we have done this, uh, we've established an in vitro uh, fusion assay and also in, in conjunction with cells, what you see here at four degrees at one hour, when we add our virus-like particles, which are labeled with the ID to cells, we don't really see any fluorescence because the fluorescence is quenched at this point. Although we have shown uh, that I'm not uh, not uh, able to show here that uh, these particles are actually bound to cells uh, with the anti spike antibody. However, at 37 degrees, when the membrane fusion um, is uh, or the membrane fusion happens at that point, the fluorescence uh, that is encapsulated in the lipid envelope becomes um, uh, becomes dequenched. And as a result, we can see significant fluorescence. So now this is what we are using to try to um, uh, screen uh, inhibitors of uh, viral membrane fusion and to see what are the conditions that are um, that are uh, would uh, promote viral, viral membrane fusion and the conditions which can inhibit or um, you know small molecule inhibitors or peptidomic mimetic inhibitors that can inhibit uh, viral membrane uh, fusion. So uh, with this, I'll just uh, come to my conclusion. I think I've taken a little bit extra time. So we have generated quadruple antigen virus-like particles in mammalian cells, which uh, structurally uh, and in terms of antigenicity highly resemble the native uh, SARS-CoV-2 particles. 
and we have carried out biochemical studies which indicate that the conformation of structural components is fairly accurate and that uh, we are currently analyzing uh, the, the immune response generated by the VLPs, particularly the, uh, the CTL response. And uh, what, uh, what also I would like to emphasize is that the sars cov two VLPs that are native-like can be effectively utilized as, as really good tools to, to study the uh, the initial stages of host virus interaction, which includes uh, binding to cells as well as membrane fusion. And these can be used very effectively to try, try to screen uh, inhibitors of these processes. Uh, so with this, I'd just like to acknowledge that all of this work has been done by a PhD student, uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar Kumar, who has been working during lockdown uh, and carrying out all of these studies. And the antigenicity and immunogenicity studies have been carried out by an excellent collaborator, Dr. Tripti Shivastava in THSTI. And these are my other students who have really supported, supported this work. Um, thank you very much for, for listening. And um, perhaps I should stop sharing so I can take questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Banerjee. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, I, I think I could see one question in the chat box, and uh, the question is from Ritamcha. And uh, she's asking that, you know, uh, whether the RBT of spike protein used for interaction with the ACE2 also responsible for interaction with the neuropilin, or does it use a different part of spike protein for, for uh, facilitating the immune? Yeah, actually, the, the portion that has been shown to be important for interacting with the neuropilin receptor is this S1, the cleavage region in S1. So this is this this is why the send our uh, CN uh, rule peptides are, are good inhibitors. So that is the part which is this uh, comprises of an arginine or lysine followed by XX, like which can be any amino acid, and then another arginine or lysine. So essentially. Um, RXXR. This this portion is what really interacts with neuropilin receptors. Neuropilin receptors are uh, overexpressed in in vasculature and also in in uh, high amount in in uh, cancer cells, and they are known for binding to these uh, send um, R uh, peptides, which is why we are trying to utilize something like this as as an inhibitor. So we're trying to develop peptidomimetics uh, peptidomimetic inhibitors. I hope that answers the question. So, any question, please? Uh, anybody? So, uh, uh, I was just curious to know, Professor Banerjee, that you know, this U8709, I think this is then about either trichelipical cell line or what is cell line, or this cell line probably you're using as a model, which actually expresses the neuropilin receptor. Uh, yes, so uh, the binding of SARS coronavirus has been shown in U, uh, I think U251 type cells, which are also neuronal cells, uh, which uh, is essentially uh, overexpressing neuropilin receptor. So the neuropilin receptor, uh, sir, is found in large amounts in uh, epithelial cells of the, uh, in respiratory and olfactory epithelial cells, essentially. So uh, this is supposed to be supporting the uh, ACE2 mediated entry and also in case of, um, I guess, uh, neuronal components because this virus is has been found in cerebrospinal fluid. So the viral um, uh, invasion of the CNS is also a, a possibility and probably happens because all of these, um, you know, uh, symptoms that we see, loss of sense, uh, of smell, loss of taste, uh, confusion, these could all be related to uh, neuropilin mediated invasion of the of the CNS. But this again is, is something that is, uh, I don't think it has been completely established, although there's no data at this point supporting it. So, so that is why we're using U87 MG cells as, as kind of a um, you know, cell line, which has neuropilin, large amount of neuropilin, but very less amount of AC2, so that we can study specifically neuropilin mediated entry. So, if there's any other question, please. <coughs> so, uh, I think uh, if, if, if there's no question, uh, we would thank you, Professor Mani Dika for a very meticulous and uh, illustrative presentation. 
and also you know we are very thankful to her for joining us on this uh, on this occasion thank you professor benan thank you sir so uh, now we have uh, our next speaker professor hem chand jha so professor hem chand jha is an uh, assistant professor and head discipline of biosciences and uh, biomedical engineering at iit indore he did his phd from bits pilani his post doctoral research was on viral oncology at university of pennsylvania usa dr jai is the recipient of prestigious ramanujan and ramalinga swami fellowships from government of india since 2016 he has started his research group at iit indore working in the field of host pathogen interactions including eb virus and uh, helicobacter pylori associated co-infections in cancer progression his group also works on drug discovery in cancer and infectious disease in recent times jha volunteered in covid-19 testing at mgm college indore his group also revealed the presence of 5600 mutations of coronavirus surface protein recently his group has also reviewed the possible antiviral therapies which can be used against sars cov2 i now request uh, professor jha to uh, to kindly like deliver his presentation thank you professor singh and uh, soma and all organizing committee members iit uh, roorkee as well as indian university uh, society to giving me opportunity uh, is that uh, my slides are is visible uh no uh, no 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 we can see your side so so last one year uh, during this uh, covid pandemic whatever uh, we wanted to try to understand and uh, uh, during the this about the sars cov2 i am going to uh, discuss that in the brief the contents of the my uh, factors affecting sars cov2 transmission uh sars cov2 interaction to the host so we we have done in the one uh, the reviews in experience at mgm college because that time uh, the first wave during the first wave uh, only few labs are uh, working as well as testing was also not uh, appropriate at the in and one of my colleague we went there and then start the rtp set multi actually the these clinicians as well as the those labs are have have to so that is also i'm going to share and then now uh, our approach uh, for uh, sars cov2 led multiple organ failures because initially the uh, european countries usa or many other countries have lots of uh, um, uh, casualty so we try to understand why uh, these uh, mortality is so high in some of the cases and some of the countries and then impact of gastrointestinal and symptoms in covid-19 because uh, last year as well as this year also we know that uh, uh, some of these uh, sars cov2 have oral fecal route entry and then what what could be the mechanism about that and the probable liver dysfunction among covid-19 cancer patients so we had one collaboration from the kims uh, kalinga institute of medical uh, sciences uh, odisha where two of my students were collected uh, 1200 uh, patient samples all data like ct scan as well as uh, um hematological and the biochemical parameters and there we found some of the unique cases uh, either uh, for the like some neurological disorders some uh, cancer patients as well as the malaria covid co infection so that those things i am just going to uh, brief and then investigation of mutations in covid 19 as mentioned that is just appeared last uh, uh, month so basically from january 2020 to the july 2020 whatever the reports available like on the ncbi about the uh, sequence of the protein e m and s all uh, we had them um, approximately 20000 the protein sequences and then we compare from the wild type like how these changes occur and uh, if it, this is happening at least in the spike uh, what could be the consequences in the binding pattern with the structural modeling that we have done uh, as such uh, drug repurposing and small molecule against uh, sars cov2 some in silico study also we are doing although our uh, lab is a uh, wet lab and mostly dealing with the pathogens uh, viruses and the bacteria but uh, we have we are taking the help of uh, many of our friends and investigation of plant derived compound against uh, sars cov2 that also we are trying to understand i don't think so this uh, slides needed any more because uh, 
One of the just I wanted to say, uh, although this is still a review that we published in the environmental research, the temperature and humidity possibly also playing a uh, role in the SARS CoV 2 spread at least, uh, along with the mutations and other. Because you see, if you just see the last year from March into the uh, before the uh, rainy season, like uh, uh, after the uh, when the rain season just stopped. In our many of these areas, again in the September October, uh, this was high, and when we have a temperature down and humidity is definitely different uh, from the November to uh, February, again things were different. So somehow these things are also uh, important, uh, but in detail a study needed to uh, understand in more detail. I don't want to go in more details, but we have seen the reports from the all countries like uh, Africa, uh, Europe, and many other countries. Uh, the very segregated manner they have shown that. Yes, temperature and humidity are uh, uh, corresponding to the SARS CoV 2 spread in a particular manner. This is also just an introduction to this slide, as all of us uh, all know, like just uh, ma'am, uh, Dr. Banerjee was saying the neuropilin H2, we all know uh, from long time, TMP RSS2, long time on the internet. Possibly these four receptors, uh, till now we understood that they are making a lot of uh, contribution. Uh, and as well as the uh, uh, state of the SARS CoV 2 inside the human body. And now, uh, at this, uh, what we have, I have seen like in the MGM uh, Mahatma Gandhi Medical College indoor, the problem in the uh, right now also we are seeing that, okay, many are false negative. Maybe some of them are false positive, but false negative we know a lot. So, uh, that time when like April 2020, uh, one month we were there, initial, initial. Uh, and that time we have seen that because we know as a biologist or as a microbiologist that all genes are not expressed all the time. Some viral genes are expressed in the initial uh, early infection or they titer as higher in the early infection. Some are expressing in the late infection. Some are possibly in the all the time like as a homogeneous. So just uh, making a, a primer and then uh, just doing the PCR or any other test that could not be as useful as it should be. And that could be one of the reasons. And second thing, the way uh, uh, we, are, we were followed, the uh, RT-PCR, like uh, one wheel, uh, right? And then uh, if out of 40 uh, cycle, 35 cycle is the cutoff. So 34 cycle is uh, positive and 36 cycle is negative. I think this is very doubtful. And that's why one of the reasons I believe, certainly believe that uh, uh, we are not able to control in the way it should be. Because you, uh, so in the in the lab, I don't think so. Any of us doing like a single well uh, RT PCR reaction and then a uh, one time only. We all ask like uh, multiple time, at least two or three bi biological replicate and then uh, technical replicate at least. So in this case also a uh, technical replicates, but then uh, limitations are there. But still, like those people are having 32 to 38. Uh, uh, shitty value. My concern is they should go for again at least with the same sample only testing because it is possible. If uh, today, uh, right now, I am having 34 and uh, uh, in evening I can uh, get it 36 also. So these are some of the concerns. Plus, uh, uh, thing uh, like last year it happened that many of the workers, healthcare workers, also getting infected a lot. Uh, uh, so because of the we are not aware that much of the, either it is how it is used, how to uh, cultivate the virus, so all those stuff. And then uh, the main is the whoever the uh, uh, doing the interpretation of the city values, that person has to be like you know experienced and possibly the, I think the research community uh, may help better and they can uh, like you know. Because we have all many experiences in this kind of uh, experimentation and stuff, rather than the just only simply some labs. Because with most of these places, I we have uh, spoken with other uh, labs also, as well as the other medical colleagues also. They are having uh, facing the problem, and then simply by the idea, like computer, they say yes or no, yes or no, because revisiting the uh, sample and many other things. So that could be one of the reason that uh, today someone having negative after three days, someone having positive, and because of the they were so the today is negative, they spread many places. And this is one of the reasons that uh, spread is too high, uh, even though we are doing the testing and you know, the things. Now we want to, uh, we have done last one year. So basically, initially when we all are in the home, so we try to understand why there's so much death is going on. Even online, uh, and that is the relevance, no good uh, and viral entry into the nervous system, and there is a gut. 
at the time, uh, I think this slide uh, may not need to, uh, but just wanted to say that these ACE2 receptor receptors are possibly expressing in most of the vital organism. And that could be the uh, region that the uh, virus is spreading in many, many, not only the lungs, many. First piece of uh, data that we collected uh, from the Italy, France, uh, France, uh, Netherlands, Sweden, and Spain. But that I think nice. your your voice is breaking, Dr. Ja. So uh, I think connectivity would be a problem. So if you want to know, you can try switching off the video and again uh, talk. First, it uh, looks like voice is not there. Uh, Professor Jha, we have lost your voice. We are not able to hear you. So, uh, what about right now? Yeah, uh, now now we can hear. Yeah, now yeah. we can hear. Fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, basic, uh, we have seen. Um, countries, uh, Italy, France, uh, Netherlands, Sudan, and Spain. Their data was available. And uh, uh, that uh, CVD, like if the 21% were admitted to the hospital, the death was 77% in the first word. Early hypertension, if 49% were admitted, 69% were dead. Similarly, for diabetes and chronic lung disease also. And then uh, we have uh, checked for the kidney, liver, immunodeficiency, and neurological diseases. They are not available for all of them, but still we have seen that these comorbidities are too high. So possibly either the, that time, the, the first wave uh, till the June of the 2020, uh, many of the clinicians don't know and they're just simply using the drugs those are prescribed and possibly those are having this. But as well as uh, we have seen that the country like India and South Africa, uh, South Korea, and where they have the uh, um, anti-tuberculosis as well as the uh, this uh, Japan Institute uh, vaccination, there uh, even the infection rate was higher, but uh, the casualty were less. At least in India, definitely we know that. So possibly these things are also having some uh, um, asymptomatic as well as the giving some more specific uh, uh, titer against the viruses. I want to uh, discuss the probable liver dysfunction among cancer patients. So there we want to see uh, five cancer patients what we got on, uh, out of 1200. One is has stomach cancer, second is bladder cancer, third is glioma cancer, cancer and fifth heart blood cancer. Out of these five, two of them, uh, these lung cancer and heart rate cancer, getting the chemo radiation. And what we have seen that most of these uh, uh, cancer patients, when they are having the chemo, at least these two, their liver dysfunction test is very high compared to the uh, non chemo patients like SGOT, SGPT, and then the GGT, Elton, phosphate. All these parameters are, are very, very high. So, possibly those cancer patients are having the chemo, they may not get a uh, stop for the chemo uh, or, the, or the radiation or anything, because if they get stopped during the COVID-19 treatment, maybe they are getting more worsening and very quick worsening. Similarly, we have seen for their CT scan also, and that the CT score was at 90 by uh, 25, as well as the uh, 22 by 25. And very, very, within seven days, uh, all these patients were diagnosed that are having uh, chemotherapy. They are having non-chemotherapy people. They, they are also died, but in the two or two, three weeks. Uh, to the infection. Now, the, another part of what we want to show the SARS CoV 2 infection, logical uh, uh, possible outcome. There are four ways that we can, uh, we, we can say, uh, based on the various literature as well as the case studies, that these four ways, this SARS CoV 2 virus may enter or may uh, possibly go through some secretions and it may have the consequences. The first way to the blood brain barrier, like endothelial cells, pericytes. And then it may infect the astrocytes, microglia, and do the degenerated neurons. The second way could be the olfactory uh, SARS CoV 2, even the HSV and influenza already known to this way, like olfactory sensory neurons. Just uh, now, the professor uh, Banerjee was asked, uh, telling that is uh, loss of smell, uh, as well as taste. So, this could be one of the reasons also. And then they are going to the olfactory tract and possibly reach to the CNS also. Third way could be the uh, also known for the HSV, uh, 
RRV and the SARS-CoV-2 and some other viruses also by the methodical epithelial as well as the smooth muscle cells. By these also the uh, through the PNS uh, system it may reach to the CNS and then uh, uh, it may have a consequence in the CNS. So the fourth part, as we all know that these days many good research is going on with that gut control the brain. So basically gut uh, secretions are also reaching to the brain and that uh, also has been found in some of the studies, case studies, where SARS-CoV-2 may enter into the stomach definitely and the introcytes and then possibly it causes the uh, cytokine storm and then through the nerve cell of the vagus nerve or the spinal cord, it reaches towards the uh, central nervous system and again it has the consequences. So we need to uh, have some long-term uh, studies for the uh, CNS uh, who are having the SARS-CoV-2 even after the recovery. And not only that, I went there with uh, CNS, then possibly they're having um, uh, utilizing all these immune cells like macrophages, cells, and neutrophil monocytes. And uh, further, it reaches towards the uh, endothelial lining and uh, finally into the CNS. And then uh, they're having activated microglia, demotivated neurons, and possible other outcomes. So these things that we, we wanted to share here. And now, one case uh, case uh, series study that we have seen in our teams uh, study uh, collaboration with the teams that three patients uh, the first patient is 70 year male he has meningoencephalitis infection and then came to the uh, sars cov 2 uh, clinic second one has a uh, uh, parkinson and then it came to the sars cov 2 clinic a third one has a and came to the sars cov 2 clinic out of all three the third one get discharged and till now he's okay it is more than like nine months and the first two were died within even seven days. So what we have seen there, other inflammatory markers are also higher, like D-dimer, LDS, CRP, PCT, relatively. Then the so basically meningoencephalitis or the uh, um, the, uh, 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 the Parkinson one had are uh, having severe uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection as well as other inflammatory. Uh, conditions. So that we have seen in the some biochemical parameters also like uh, uh, lymphomogenesis like WC count is higher in those two as well as the and the neutrophils is also in the higher range uh, and the uh, lymphopenia. The lymph that we have seen that yes, those are having the uh, earlier from uh, prior neurological disorders, very uh, severe neurological disorders, possibly SARS-CoV-2 is also affecting them um, more severely compared to the other. Now, this uh, case study, Palmodium uh, falciparum, as well as the SARS-CoV-2. So, this person has a, a malaria infection in that hospital, and when it uh, came to the hospital, it don't. Uh, and what we have seen is this case, and possibly what we try to say that uh, because they got administered some kind of. Uh, or something and the, for the uh, plasmodium, this corticosteroid was um, like they are not uh, recommending, the medicine uh, clinicians not recommending and possibly that will lead to the uh, large RBC and plasmodium sepidum activated and it's not get controlled. So, and what we have seen uh, that I'm not showing here the data uh, to the time uh, stretch uh, that the biochemical and the other hemochemical parameters are in mix. They are not uh, uh, only the COVID or not only the malaria. So basically that is completely messed up. So the people who are having malaria infection as well as the malaria endemic region, possibly when they have the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, they should get uh, treated a little bit, uh, you know, in the uh, taken care of the malaria infection also, not only the simply treating as the SARS-CoV-2. Otherwise, they may have other consequences and they may not survive. Um, how the study that you mentioned by the processing like mutations and infection uh, that the, we have seen from January 2020 to July 2020 uh, all over the world 22,000 uh, protein sequences and that time you know that uh, this mutation is very uh, uh, popular like D614G and that we have seen yes initially this, this uh, mutation was not there but then it started uh, initially from the April, it is yes, most of these people are having the uh, this, uh, mutations. Even though the UK mutation as well as the South African mutation, uh, what is we just about to know in two, three months ago, that was also present at the time of uh, uh, July also. So that we have seen right now, we will be we will right. So uh, data that we, uh, like based on that, we have seen that most of the S4 are and what three mutations that present 
Based on that, uh, we choose an E protein where we have seen in lab uh, that's 42 muta mutations and the M protein 156 mutations uh, worldwide, as well as for the S protein 5,449 mutations. And uh, that uh, D614G from January to July, 85 times now converted, all of them are having uh, whoever reported. Uh, in, uh, Uh, we wanted to infest RBD uh, region. I've seen that uh, that uh, UK strain, South Africa strain, all of these were already present that time um, from the January to <coughs> July. And this is just a, a structure, a simple structure modeling. What we want to say that what is the difference between the D614 when it's converted to the mutated G614? So basically, the bonding bonding is to get a, a change and these do two hydrogen bond where they bind with the T869 and the T8 first because of the change of one uh, amino acid this get disrupted and get all more uh, infection. Uh, I, I don't know, we have not really, um, done with the second double mutant as well as the we are appearing for the like even triple mutant, but uh, possibly these kind of changes or some kind of a new orientation has been done by that also. <clears throat> so uh, we summarize that part that how the SARS cov took may get entry inside the four ways SARS cov to may get clearing mediated into this to receptor and then early endosomes and through the peak. And one of the clever in raft mediated and then they are using the uh, viral RNA and again uh, all these mechanisms they do and Hard one is the interleukin mediated virus. Fourth one is the uh, PTM, post translation modification in the RBD region. And that may also uh, have uh, through the H2, that affect H2, like that, that's what we have seen D614 to the G614. And they also having the uh, signaling cascade, and ultimately, all these possibly. Lung cell respiratory burst, cell differentiation, cell proliferation, cytorespiratory modification, apoptosis, all the possible mechanisms will appear, or one of them will appear. Now, the, uh, the time is allowed, yes, uh, three, four minutes. So, the drug repurposing, or uh, that also we try to understood that because this could be the uh, safety purposes. So, this we reviewed that uh, how the uh, huge drugs can be uh, and where they are working actually. Either the pro resilient uh, plasma therapy helping the entry, the uh, prevent to the entry of the viruses. Then it's come to the either chloroquine, hydrochloroquine, erythromycin. They are also the initial uh, when the virus is entering possible. Then we talk about the lipunavir, and when the remdesivir, flavonavir, duravir. Uh, they are possibly when the virus gets a replication and something like that. What, what I wanted to say here that I was also getting um, got infected uh, 20 days ago and then had the medication and ultimately HRCT was also showing 32% infected. And then I took the phenopy uh, in the flavip uh, and um, after five days of the course, I was with Clean, uh, like uh, there is nothing in the HRCT as well as the uh, uh, RTP set test. In last five, seven days, I am okay. So, possibly these things are not only that uh, in the literature they are working also. Because these days we have seen a lot of things in the WhatsApp and many other places. Okay, this drug is not working, that drug is not working. But I have seen many of the people that are getting infected, they are getting even in the home quarantine also only. They get a, a, a cure also. If we got tested on the time and uh, we took the proper medication and uh, all the kind of uh, we will get to it. And we are also trying to understand some of the Himalayan uh, plants and activity, and we try to understand in, in or an IT indoor also we are just so last one and a half. So we have seen that yes. Uh, some of the Himalayan drug, they're having potential and uh, they can do a very efficacy uh, as they work. Some in uh, even the, some of these compounds, uh, 
uh, within a few, they are having some in vitro result also because this work actually we are last year, we tell in more than one year before, but as uh, we are not expert of the in silico stuff. Actually, we try to convert many other places and that would uh, definitely a lot of. By that time, uh, we have seen several paper came and they are also supporting these compounds are very uh, uh, promising. They are basically working in the home stay also and in the uh, laboratory also. Here I am the first one in the and I think your voice is breaking actually. So. Okay, so right now? Oh? So? Uh, now, so now I can... Can... Yeah, yeah. so I would, I would like to thank my this team. Uh, all these are the PhD students and they're working uh, day and night uh, and try to understand the stuff. And my collaborator, uh, my postdoc was uh, Arnold Robertson and uh, from IIT Indore, Rajesh Kumar, Anpam Ramchat from Tejo University, Dr. Hedan Parmar, DV University, and uh, Mani from DMV, Dr. Kar from IIT Indore, Dr. Ajay Jain Chopra Hospital, uh, Devi from Chopra Hospital, Ra Dr. Rajesh from uh, Singapore National University. Pawan Dore from Allahabad University, Vijay Tripathi from Sam uh, University at uh, Allahabad, and Dr. Bhiman Mo Kundu and their groups uh, from the teams in Venezuela, from where we are getting the SARS CoV 2. Uh, and, and, and the last uh, IIT indoor, CSR, DST, uh, and the charity, and SIC. Thank you. So, uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, the, thank you, Professor Jha. I think we have uh, time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, any any questions from Professor Jha? So, uh, uh, if, if there are no questions, you know, I think uh, I thank Professor Jha, you know, for sparing time and I think for a very nice and uh, very informative presentation. So, uh, I think this with this, you know, we are like uh, coming to an end of our uh, session one. And uh, uh, there, there, there were you know, kind of six presentations in the session one, and uh, as we have seen that all the presentations you know were very meticulous, thought provoking, and uh, illustrative. This is also you know kind of you know very well you know kind of has enriched our knowledge in our efforts in developing the effective strategies to tackle this you know like a Vines, a COVID nineteen pandemic. Now, I also do thank, you know, all the speakers, all the panelists, and also all the attendees, you know, for sparing time and uh, joining the event with us. So, I think we are now uh, going to, like, have a lunch break from 1 to 2 o'clock, and I wish, you know, kind of, uh, we would have organized a lunch over here, and I think all of us would have been here together, and I think there would have been more deliberations and discussions among us, but I think let us hope that, uh, uh, we should be optimistic and that is going to be this pandemic is going to be controlled and going to be over. So let us you know work together for this. So uh, I thank all of you again. And uh, with this, you know, kind of we are going to have a lunch break and our session two is going to start at uh, two o'clock. So I request all of you to kindly join session two. So with this, I think we come to the end of session one uh, for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Singh, for uh, kindly chairing and moderating this uh, session one. And uh, I thank you on behalf of uh, all the participants, panelists, and organizers at IIT Roorkee for giving us your time and uh, chairing this session beautifully and taking the time out from your schedule to do this. I am very thankful to you and deeply indebted. Sir, I would like to now inform the panelists that we will be taking a short break of one hour for lunch and during this time uh, you are please welcome to log off and uh, as uh, two accounts will be here uh, they will be with video off and audio off and you can join back at two o'clock and at 2, p uh, 2 p.m uh, our uh, faculty colleague professor pranita sarangi she will be chairing and moderating the sessions for uh, uh, the afternoon session so I request okay. Professor Sarangi to take care of the se afternoon session at 2 p.m. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll meet again at uh, 
two o'clock and until then uh, we can all sign out and have a nice lunch thank you
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, we will uh, start the afternoon session of today's uh, virtual symposium on COVID immunology, which is being organized at IIT Rurki, Department of Biotechnology, under the aegis of Indian Immunology Society. So, in the morning session, we had talks from various speakers, and I'm sure the audience who have joined in have benefited from the talks, which you must have listened with great interest. And now I would like to open the afternoon session where we, where we have still more interesting talks coming from various speakers. And I now would like to request Professor Pranita Sarangi at the Department of Biotechnology, IIT Roorkee, who is an immunologist, to kindly chair and moderate this session. Over to you, Dr. Pranita. Thank you, Dr. Soma. Uh, so uh, we'll begin the second session of today's uh, virtual uh, session on COVID-19. And uh, since, uh, till now, it has been really a uh, in very informative and interesting session. And we have heard uh, uh, distinguished uh, speakers talking about their um, contribution to uh, COVID-19 research and uh, how things are moving on. So uh, should we wait for another some time for more uh, attendees to join or we should begin? Uh, Dr. Soma, should we wait for some time for more people to come in? Uh, right now, our <laughs> attendees are, there are total 17 attendees right now. And as panelists, we have, I can see there are five panelists as of now. And uh, maybe we can wait for five more minutes. Okay, sure. uh, it's, uh, still one more minute to two o'clock. So right. people are kind of finishing up their lunch. So we'll just wait for another two minutes and then we'll uh, start. Okay. So, Dr. Upasana, what is the situation right now in West Bengal? Bad. Bad, not good. Yeah, we were hearing today from Dr. Shailud. Uh, we heard from him that uh, the West Bengal is showing the emergence of B1618 variant and along with the 617 and uh, it's uh, spreading quite rapidly hospital beds are not available here also now situation is going neck to neck with other states oxygen scarcity everything people are messed up basically yeah my uh, like uh, yeah one of my like uh, my family member, he is in Hazari Bag right now. So I'm also pretty scared. It's close to Calcutta, very close to Calcutta. Yeah. Although the worst affected states are UP, Delhi, and uh, a couple of more, but now West Bengal is also not in line.
maybe we can start some viewers on youtube also so there are a couple of uh, uh, participants uh, logged in uh, in our youtube so we can uh, probably start okay so um, uh, we are uh, in the second session our first speaker is uh, dr upasana ray who is currently working as a senior scientist and deputy head of infectious diseases and immunology at the indian institute of chemical biology kolkata uh, dr ray has uh, obtained her uh, phd from indian institute of science bangalore and completed her post doctoral training from nci nih us she is the recipient of both ramalinga swami from dbt and ramanujan fellowship from dst india and uh, she is also a, uh, a member of uh, indian national young academy of science and uh, she has also been selected as member of royal society of biology she has published numerous research papers in peer reviewed journals and uh, filed three patents her laboratory at iacb focuses on dengue virus and focuses on virus assembly process and virus including virus like particles or vlps with uh, an objective to make a vaccine candidate or for drug delivery her research interest includes studying viral tropism designing antiviral candidates and virus mediated horizontal gene transfer Currently her group at IACV is involved in computational and sequencing studies of SARS-CoV-2 strains prevalent in India along with designing and exploring SARS-CoV-2 VLPs as potential vaccine candidates so i welcome dr upasana ray and uh, request her to uh, present her uh, talk Thank you, Dr. Sarangi. And um, so I'm going to share my slides and just let me know whenever it's useful. Yes, we could uh, see your slides. Uh, kindly restrict your presentation to twenty minutes. Sure. So, uh, okay. So, thank you so much for the time introduction, and thank you uh, for inviting me as well. Uh, although, uh, you know, my title that I have picked uh, of our presentation today is uh, "Vaccine Platforms Based on Repetitive Multiple Discovery of Antigens," and the theme of this is. Uh, is covid immunology i am not a hardcore immunologist though i am basically a basic virologist uh, and uh, also have uh, uh, you know experience and uh, specialization in vaccine engineering so that how i kind of overlap with the theme um and initially i thought of um, giving a thorough presentation on covid-19 vaccine candidates and the immunological aspects but i know that when i saw on the panelists we had uh, uh, eminent scientists like dr shahid jamil and then um, we had varun vadanathi who also works on vaccines uh, which is uh, quite a bit overlapping with what i do so what i decided was yes i will be talking on vaccines but instead of repeating what they have been uh, telling uh, and they have already told about i'll be giving a brief introduction of what's going on with covid-19 uh, uh, vaccine and uh, i'll uh, i'll focus my uh, presentation on vlps uh, but instead of talking about vlp vaccine covid-19 i'll give an example of one of our uh, work is on polio viruses but similar work we are carrying out right now on uh for designing vaccine candidates for covid-19 data we i cannot share at this moment so uh you know okay, we the second half of the entire session so i don't have to give an elaborate introduction of what a vaccine is but very briefly uh, we all know that a vaccine is a biological device 
with biological preparation, that means uh, something that is originating from the original pathogen here, the virus, and it is supposed to provide uh, immunity uh, against a particular disease. So there are three important uh, uh, characteristics uh, when we talk about a successful vaccine candidate. It is supposed to stimulate body's immune system. Uh, and uh, introduce three essential characteristics, uh, that is to recognize uh, the foreign antigen as in foreign uh, antigen, so a foreign object, uh, destroy it and also remember uh, it as foreign so that if there is a future infection, body's immune system can get triggered and uh, uh, we get protection. Uh, so uh, you all know you are experts uh, yourselves uh, sitting here and the panelists as well as the organizers. The B and the T cells are very important uh, immune effective cells uh, when we talk about the immunology of uh, immunology in general. Uh, so these are the cells of the adaptive immune system that carry out uh, the uh, uh, various functions of uh, the immune system, right? So very briefly, uh, you know, the vaccines are of many, many different types and there are different ways people categorize these. Uh, and these are uh, the more generic way that uh, we categorize vaccines. It can um, it can come from the entire organism, uh, which can uh, again be uh, categorized into inactivated vaccine or live attenuated vaccine. Uh, so the, both of these fall under the categories of whole organism vaccines, where uh, the origin is the entire pathogen or the entire virus. For uh, since we are talking in terms of a uh, virus, so the entire virus is used to design the vaccine candidate. Now, there are subunit vaccines where you use uh, different proteins of the virus. There can be gene-based vaccine where you use uh, a DNA template or uh, mRNA as uh, the vaccine candidate. So ultimately, it will give rise to a protein against which we want our body's uh, body to elicit the immune response. So that can come from DNA, which gets translated inside the body to RNA, and uh, then the protein, and then this protein will trigger a stimulate the immune system or educate the immune system to recognize this as uh, foreign. Um, then you have the mRNA. We, I don't have to go into details because now we all know, we have heard so much about COVID vaccines. So we, have, we know about DNA vaccines and we have heard about RNA vaccines, which uh, is also there in the market. So, and the last category that I will be emphasizing in today's presentation uh, falls under virus-like particles or VLPs. So, um, uh, now viruses themselves can be categorized uh, into two different types. Viruses can be enveloped or non-enveloped. So when I say enveloped, that means um, there is a you know, the basic virus structure has a, a capsid. It's a, it's a proteinaceous structure. Uh, that encapsidates inside the viral genetic material, which can be DNA or RNA. So when this uh, this structure is naked, it's a non-enveloped uh, virus. And when the structure is covered by a lipid envelope, which the virus uh, derives from the host cell, uh, where the virus particles are uh, produced. So if there is a lipid envelope uh, on top of this capsid, uh, and this lipid envelope also has the viral structural proteins embedded in them. So those uh, viruses are uh, categorized into a category called as um, enveloped viruses. So essentially, we have two different classes of viruses, and uh, based upon how uh, the, how they are uh, uh, how how they are structured, uh, different types of VLPs are there. So they can be, there can be non-enveloped VLPs where we are using only the capsid as a proteinaceous structure minus the genetic material as our vaccine candidate, or um, uh, the enveloped VLPs where either you can have only uh, the lipid, uh, the lipid envelope with the viral structural proteins uh, that are present on the lipid envelope. So that minus the capsid, or you can also include the capsid as well along uh, with the envelope. So uh, there can be different permutations and combinations you can design your virus-like particles. But essentially, virus-like particles are uh, uh, particles which look like a virus, uh, and uh, they display the viral surface antigens on top of uh, them. and. Uh, they basically are non-hazardous because they are non-infectious in nature or non-replicating in nature. So 
So uh, one of the uh, very important aspects that um, is taken care of by this category of vaccine candidate is uh, the uh, display, the, uh, the kind of display, uh, the antigens, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, the, the way the antigens are displayed on top of uh, these particles. So the, uh, so, the antigens here are displayed in a high density, very high density repetitive uh, manner, and uh, it's a, a comparatively rigid platform. So uh, this kind of platform is has been shown uh, to be uh, a better immune stimulator. Okay, now, uh, so, COVID-19, when we talk about, we have seen there are many, many different uh, groups who have worked and it has been so amazing in the last one and a half years. Um, so quickly, so many groups have come up with different types of COVID uh, vaccines. And uh, we have seen that most of the vaccine candidates have um, concentrated on if, um, on a protein, on structural, on a structural proteins of the virus uh, called as a spike protein, and we all have heard about it. So, whatever uh, different types of uh, vaccine candidates are there in the market now, or are in preclinical trials or in clinical trials, most of them are based on different types or organizations of this spike protein. So. Uh, if I go parallel with the topic that I am talking about today, uh, so uh, VLPs, yeah, so uh, we we have heard of uh, COVID Shield, so it's um, an uh, AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine originally, uh, which was licensed to Serum Institute of India, and here they have used a chimpanzee adenovirus to display. Uh, to to basically encapsulate it inside the, the genetic material or the DNA that uh, encodes spike protein, and so this is one type of virus vectors uh, viral vector which doesn't uh, display the viral antigen on top of it, but it's a viral vector that uh, delivers uh, the uh, vaccine uh, template inside the host cell where, where it's uh, produced and then. Uh, the downstream event happens, but then there are other vaccine candidates. Uh, for example, in co-vaccine. Co-vaccine is one which uh, uh, which is akin to. Uh, it's not a VLP, but it's akin to VLP because it's an inactivated viral uh, vaccine which has everything that a virus has, but in inactivated form. Now there are other candidates where uh, they have uh, used a matrix, uh, and uh, on top of this matrix or matrices, uh, they have displayed the spike protein in various ways. So um, uh, the spike protein they have used either as a monomer or they have used a spike trimer. And I will, won't go into the details of the our DNA protein, DNA uh, form or protein form or mRNA form of the vaccine candidate because that's beyond the scope of this talk. But uh, what I meant to say is uh, the different vaccine candidates, other than the co-vaccine and COVID shield that's there in the market right, right now rolled out. Um, uh, are also based on, many of them are also based on uh, VLP type of uh, vaccine category. Now, uh, so what is important here is to note, as I already told you, the Achilles heel uh, is uh, here, is uh, the high density, rigid, repetitive display of viral surface antigens with makes VLPs uh, as a, a good candidate as a vaccine platform. So what uh, it does, high density surface antigens, the, uh, what is the role of such kind of uh, display? So very uh, briefly, uh, there are two uh, major roles. One is to, uh, you know, enhance the B cell activation. So if you can see, if you see in the right hand uh, side, uh, there is a diagram where I've seen, uh, I have uh, just displayed here uh, uh, two panels. So in the upper panel, you see a virus where the surface antigens are in a very high density uh, uh, um, uh, display. And um, in the bottom panel, you see the antigens are uh, 
located not so close to each other. So it's not a high density repetitive uh, display. But the difference here is now if you look at the B cell receptors, B cell receptors um, uh, are triggered more in case of A rather than B because there are more number of B cell receptors that can associate themselves with uh, the antigens when it's a high density display as compared to when it is not a high density display. So biophysical organization of protein antigens have uh, direct influence on uh, B cell responsiveness and antibody production. The second thing is if uh, the uh, density of uh, the uh, antigens uh, is high, it helps in bivalent binding um, of uh, the IgG. So we know that IgGs or antibodies have uh, two, um, uh, two parts or two segments which can associate uh, themselves to the antigen. So if uh, the density of the antigen is less, uh, only one of them can get associated, whereas if it is uh, a multivalent uh, display and high density uh, display, uh, both the uh, you know, segments can associate uh, themselves. So uh, there is another uh, concept we all know about is the self tolerance or, you know, we do not produce antibodies or immune response against our self antigens. So that's why we uh, that's why we do not produce antibodies against our own proteins. And when we do so, it leads to autoimmune diseases. Uh, so uh, what people have shown over many, many years of research uh, that when a self antigen is displayed in a high density repetitive manner, uh, and the B cell responds differently, so that uh, so the uh, so that crosses the threshold of self tolerance, and now uh, the immune system is active uh, against the self antigens as well. So this is the concept that is used uh, in case of BLP vaccines. Now, I have been very fortunate uh, to work uh, uh, very closely associated uh, with uh, a group at uh, the National Cancer Institute, NIH. Uh, so uh, um, this person, Dr. John Schiller, is uh, one of the pioneers in the field of human papillomavirus prophylactic vaccine, which is a VLP vaccine, which ultimately became, uh, you know, licensed uh, to uh, to different companies, Merck and uh, GlaxoSmithKline, and uh, now uh, we have the vaccine, Cervarix and Gardasil, in the market. But they are basically human papillomavirus L1 VLP vaccines. So. While working uh, with, uh, uh, you know, kind of under guidance of Dr. Schiller, um, he has uh, he has overseen a lot of my work that I was doing at that point of time. I also learned what he did uh, for uh, the HPV VLP vaccines. So what he showed was. Um, that uh, the structural proteins of uh, the human papillomavirus, the L1, which is the major capsid protein, L2 uh, uh, is a minor capsid protein of this virus. Uh, so L1 is able to self-assemble um, uh, when produced in a um, suitable cell. So L1 uh, protein self-assemble to form capsomers. So these are so these are different uh, different hierarchy of uh, assembly process of a virus. So you have the monomers, and you then they assemble into capsomers, and capsomers assemble uh, to form VLPs. And when uh, uh, they have L2 in the system, L2s will also get associated, and it forms uh, another. Uh, form of the same uh, VLP, which we better term it as a pseudovirus, because L1 plus L2, when uh, they are there on the virus, they can transduce in the host cell, whereas uh, VLPs might not transduce, but they are used as uh, used as uh, the vaccine candidate. And L1 is sufficient to self-assemble. If you have L2 only, uh, L2 cannot self-assemble. You need L1 for the virus assembly to happen. Now, if you have a double-stranded DNA, this is a double-stranded DNA virus, uh, which has uh, that. So the length of uh, the DNA has to be 8 kb or less. So when you have uh, a DNA, uh, the DNA also gets encapsulated inside. 
So this is a, what this is the concept uh, they developed in the lab and they used it for development of uh, the papilloma virus vaccine. And this is what I got influenced uh, uh, from. And my work uh, was based on the, the work that I'll be presenting today is based on this concept. So as I said, uh, I just decided not to uh, present on COVID-19 vaccine because there are a lot of people who uh, who have already talked about it and uh, uh, the similar concept I am using right now in our lab to make another vaccine candidate. So instead, I am presenting a work that has been published now and uh, it's, it has been licensed to Biological E Limited at Hyderabad, uh, who will be taking care of for further development of this vaccine. So this vaccine is a VLP vaccine against uh, a disease called as progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It's a, a neurodegenerative brain disease. Uh, uh, caused uh, because of uh, multiplication of JC polyoma virus. Polyoma viruses are double-stranded DNA viruses, and uh, these viruses are uh, non-enveloped in nature. So this particular virus infects brain, and in immunocompromised people, uh, they uh, give rise uh, to or lead to a disease called as uh, PML. And here you see uh, a MRI scan, so you can see the lesion here in white. So uh, it ultimately leads to uh, demyelinating brain disease and it's uh, fatal in nature. And so it's, it's an important disease because uh, particularly uh, people when they get uh, treated with immunosuppressive drugs, so they have to undergo uh, you know, uh, uh, immunosuppressive drug treatment because, because they are undergoing a kind of surgery. So these kind of people have the tendency of developing PML and we do not have any treatment available or a vaccine available. So, uh, so uh, that's the reason this uh, project uh, was to develop a vaccine uh, which can be used uh, as a prophylactic measure or, as well as as a therapeutic uh, vaccine candidate. Okay, so uh, very briefly, um, I already told you uh, about uh, HCV, uh, HPV, sorry, a human papilloma virus. So JC, uh, JCV uh, or JC polyoma virus is also uh, similar to uh, human papilloma virus structurally. So it also has uh, uh, the major capsid protein here, we term it as VP1. So VP1 is the major capsid proteins which can self-assemble into a virus capsid. Uh, so five of the VP1 subunits come together to form the capsomer and uh, 72 of the capsomers, which are basically pentamers of VP1, come together and they form the viral uh, particles. Now we also have the minor capsid proteins, VP2 and VP3. So as I said, minor capsid proteins are more important when you want to uh, engineer a particle which you would like to use it as a pseudovirus uh, so that it can transduce inside the host cell. So in those cases, you will use VP2 and VP3 if you want to develop uh, only a vaccine candidate uh, or the VLPs or VP1 is sufficient. So. Um, as a brief overview of how we developed uh, the VLPs or the pseudoviruses. So uh, when we, when I say pseudovirus, that means a, a VLP having a, a reporter, uh, a reporter uh, plasmid inside, which expresses reporter gene uh, to measure the transduction of, by, of the virus. So pseudovirus has VP1, VP2, as well as VP3, whereas uh, VLPs uh, have only VP1, the major capsid protein, and those are used for immunization purpose. And the pseudovirus is used for the neutralization assays to estimate the neutralization, um, neutralizing antibody titer after the immunization studies. So here uh, we uh, used mammalian expression plasmids encoding VP1, VP2, and uh, VP3 in three separate plasmids uh, and used it in different uh, permutations and combinations as desired, whether we want to make VLP or a pseudovirus. So one important feature here was the use of as a 40 origin of replication because we used uh, the production system for us, the production cell line for us was 293TT cells so these are um, HEK293 cells stably transfected with SV40 large T antigen. So uh, SV40 large T antigen will bind to SV40 origin of replication and will help more and more uh, plasmids uh, to be replicated inside. So there will be more and more production, increased or enhanced production of the uh, viral protein. 
So inside the cell, the viral proteins assemble and self-assemble, and then there are uh, different uh, ways we um, purify them to um, uh, to get our pseudovirus and the VLP. So we could assemble around 23 different uh, variants of this virus. So this, uh, I already told that you co-transfect your uh, capsid protein expressing plasmids uh, with or without the reporter gene uh, uh, plasmid um, uh, by co-transfection into 93 TT cells where uh, these particles are assembled inside. And then we harvest this using lysis. There are different uh, ways. Uh, and then we mature uh, this entire preparation overnight. We use nucleases and ammonium sulfate to precipitate down these uh, particles and uh, digest off any uh, hanging around long nucleic acid stretches, uh, which would otherwise uh, clump the viral particles. And uh, followed by this, uh, we uh, uh, we clarify and we uh, purify the particles using density gradient uh, ultracentrifugation using aridoxinol gradient, which is OptiPrep here. Um, and, and then uh, we screen uh, the fractions uh, using various assays like picogreen assay, uh, which, uh, so it's a reagent that uh, binds with double-stranded DNA, which gets in encapsulated inside the viral particles, and we uh, uh, combine pico green with uh, different other uh, techniques to ultimately get the particles, which looks like this under uh, TEM. So uh, I won't go into experimental details of uh, this vaccine, but we did preclinical trials in mice, which uh, gave good neutralizing antibody titers against uh, 23 different uh, viral variants. And then we also did uh, a human trial uh, with uh, this uh, vaccine candidate. And uh, what we could see, so this particular person was already in comatose condition and uh, after getting uh, permission from her family, uh, uh, we did uh, one trial on her. And uh, you can see here uh, that uh, along with the neutralizing antibody titer, the viral uh, titer went down. Dr. Upasana, uh, I would request you to kindly uh, complete your presentation. Yes, so uh, in two minutes. Right. So, uh, so here you see uh, some of the MRI scans of this patient uh, for a long time, almost one year. We followed this patient, um, different types of MRIs are there. I won't go into details here. So you can see uh, from left to right, uh, the, it shows the progression of the lesion. But when you vaccinate, shown by the bold uh, arrow mark here in red, there is a regression of lesion. This work was done in collaboration with Dr. Sinkwe and Dr. Martin. So they are medical doctors. And uh, so the work got published uh, in Science Translational Medicine. And uh, as I said, um, we obtained a patent in the year 2018 and uh, a year back to, in 2019, it was licensed out to a Hyderabad-based Hyderabad uh, company, Biologic E Limited. So, um, so currently our lab laboratory is also working on COVID-19 vaccine. But I could not present those uh, the data because it's in preliminary stage and it's not published. But it's uh, very much based upon this entire concept that I just talked about. So uh, these are my uh, laboratory members, my students, uh, without which um, are you know as faculties are uh, handicapped. Uh, so they are very hardworking. Uh, uh, Ms. Firoza Begum, who is working on all the COVID uh, work that we are involved in currently, uh, Devika, Sandeepan, and uh, Luya are working on other uh, areas. And um, finally, I want to thank uh, some of our collaborators and people with whom we, uh, we, we worked with, Dr. Buck and Dr. Schiller from NIH, and Dr. Paola Sinkwe, who helped with the human trial, and Dr. Roland Martin as well. Uh, finally, the funding agencies, uh, I work with IICB, so CSIR, uh, PML Consortium, um, and other funding agencies who have funded my work. Thank you. 
thank you dr uh, nice presentation it was a very informative talk on virus like particles and their implication in vaccine uh, development so uh, maybe due to limited time we can take only one question if we have any yeah i uh, if you permit i would like to ask sure so dr upasna i would like to have a comment if you please about the emerging variants which we are saying seeing right now in uh, various states of india suppose an individual who is uh, like uh, getting vaccinated with the uh, government vaccines like covishield and uh, covaxin what is your opinion about, uh, uh, using vlps do you think that in future we will see some sort of uh, uh, rapid two uh, shot sort of scenario with a vlp based uh, vaccine where we just take out the spike protein replace it with a different patient uh, spike protein and use it as an annual flu shot like we do for h1n1 what is your take up the possibility yeah so with any vaccine candidate in that perspective if i talk about whether vlps or in that regard mrna vaccines are much easier to handle with more direct um, way to handle so yes they can be used but as of now uh, talking about the mutants and the variants you know viruses have this inherent, inherent ability or the phenomenon of mutating uh, themselves so they they mutate continuously and we get variants so uh, as of now the reports we have um, uh, it, they suggest that couple of these mutations they have uh, increased transmission uh, so that's uh, the effect that people uh, have seen that they uh, they have the property of increasing the transmission rate but then uh, uh, in, uh, about the vaccine efficacy there is nothing established as of now that they uh, won't be able to protect you against the variants so um, that means the uh, escape variants if you want to um, uh, you know position these uh, mutants as or categorize these mutants as antibody escape mutants we cannot happens then yes there is a possibility of um, using uh, vlps or even mrna vaccines to redesign uh, uh, these vaccines and uh, use them but then that also depends upon whether uh, uh, how often or how often these uh, the covid-19 is going to come back we know we know now or we it is hypothesized that maybe we have to live with it but we are not very sure about it so yes there is a possibility that we have to design uh, vaccines uh, uh, just like influenza annual shots uh, yes uh, so i think uh, there is a possibility for it thank you so much thank you but then you know uh, one uh, final touch upon it is that when we use a whole virus as the vaccine candidate uh, unlike uh, you know the only spike protein or rbd Uh, for example uh, you are using inactivated uh, viral vaccine or uh, similar things then you are using much more repertoire of antigens as compared to singular uh, monomeric or you know peptides or peptide based uh, antigens so then mm, personally it's a, again a personal view that these uh, vaccines should be able to impart um, a much broader immune response it might not be able to protect you fully from the disease but definitely it should be able to pr uh, protect you from progressing from uh, infection to severe infection and is there uh, like uh, do you mind if i continue this line of thought is there anything similar like influenza which has been identified for covid like there is a conserved stock domain for the influenza um, the, uh, the h1 uh, Uh, protein so do we have some sequences known in the envelope uh, the m protein and the n protein which are not of the spike or maybe even from the spike protein which is conserved which you think like which you have been seeing in the sequencing studies which is conserved and we can use it for you know getting more of a conserved response rather than changing the spike every time Yes, so uh, there are regions, and people are working on uh, such areas. There are regions which are, as of now, which we have not seen changing, getting changed much. But it's a battle between uh, not being conserved, how much is not conserved versus how much is exposed as well. So 
So how much exposed it is to uh, the immune system, that is also very important when we talk about uh, vaccines. Um, so it's a complicated issue, but yes, people are already on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dr. Soma and Dr. Upasna for a nice, uh, thoughtful, provoking uh, discussion. So we'll move on to our next speaker uh, of uh, second session. Uh, and uh, next we have uh, Dr. Sunil Raghav uh, from ILS Bhubaneswar. He is uh, currently working as Scientist E and Head of Immunogenomics and Systems Biology Laboratory at ILS. And he has received his PhD from Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi, and has completed his postdoctoral training at uh, Torku Center for Biotechnology, Finland. Dr. Sunil is uh, a recipient of uh, Ramalinga Sami Fellowship from DBT India and has also received funding from uh, other grants such as DST, uh, SNSF Indo Swiss Grant, and SERP. His research at ILS uh, focuses on integrative genomics approach to decipher the molecular mechanism of dendritic cells in the induction of various uh, uh, types of T cell response, as well as immune modulation of dendritic cells uh, and their responses to modulate T cell spe uh, specialization and differentiation. Currently, Dr. Sunil is working on genetic and immunological aspect of SARS-CoV-2 virus involving COVID-19 patient in India. His group at ILS is working on protective immune signatures in human and is also analyzing genomes of Indian SARS-CoV-2 viral strain. So I welcome Dr. Sunil Raghav and request uh, him to present his uh, uh, talk. Yeah, Pranita, thank you for a uh, nice introduction. But I'm not getting here like a share screen option in this. Somehow, it's not active. Uh, let me let me just see one second. Check if it's possible. Or I have to connect through laptop then. <laughs> because I can see, but it's not active, the share just screen. Just one second, just one second. So I think you, sh uh, Dr. Sunil, you should be able to share. Can you try once more to share? Yeah, it's not active. Just a second, maybe I can open this. One. I don't see that active. I'm connecting through laptop because it looks like it's somehow not active in this. But here also, I'm not. Is it? Is it? Hello. Uh, yes, it is coming, uh, but uh, the slides have not yet uh, shown up. We see that you are starting to share your slides, but uh, we have not yet. Uh... Yeah, maybe maybe give it one second more. Yeah. Yes. It's coming now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Please, so maybe, uh, yeah. okay so. 
uh, if it's audible and then it's clear, then I will start my presentation. Okay. Yes, uh, it's clear and we can uh, also see the slides. Okay. Thank you, Pranita, for the introduction and then Soma for uh, inviting me for the talk. So definitely we are going through a very difficult time of COVID and everybody is facing one or the other difficulty in the family. So uh, already my previous speakers talked about like uh, genetics, like uh, Sahih Jamil sir, he discussed about the evolution of different strains that are coming up and they started from Maharashtra, this double mutant, what we call as the Indian variant. And then it further aggravated in Punjab first and then now in West Bengal, it's a new mutation. But we clearly said, see that the Indian variant is very dominant and definitely it's highly infected. And that is increasing in all the places. So I was going to talk about genetic and immunological aspects like genetics as well, as my group is also involved in this uh, uh, COVID genomics consortium for sequencing the samples from three, four states like Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Bihar and Odisha. And we also see that, that this double mutant is increasing quite drastically as compared to the UK mutant. But here in this talk, I am going to talk very specific about one study that we recently did and the results are analyzed. Some preliminary results we already communicated in Mad Archive and others are coming up. So what I'm going to tell you here is we found that in direct context of COVID-19 infected cases where they don't come become uh, like RT-PCR positive and they are not contracting the symptoms as well. So we were interested to look into what is happening, why they are like protected uh, from the infection and from symptoms as well. So we found some in, something interesting that I will present here, uh, the profiling of that uh, immune responses in these individuals and all. So I will go through with a brief introduction because a lot of us are like, Immunology, from immunology background, and I don't need to give that much details, but briefly, if I say that we know that this SARS-CoV virus is a like similar type influenza virus, and what happens, it infects or it uh, like a goes inside our nasopharynx, and that's why it's using the nasopharynx, uh, this swab. So what happens in the nasopharynx, it infects the epithelial cells. And our immune system, like innate immune system, neutrophils, macrophages, and all, they try to clear it. But what happens if the virus load is high? Then our adaptive immune cells, like dendritic cells, what they do, they process this virus into different peptides, and we call them immunogenic peptides. And those peptides are presented at the surface of this dendritic cell through MSC2, for the CD4 T cells, we call it helper T cells, and for CD8 T cells through cross presentation by MSC1. Okay, but I will come in the next slide. What is happening because of these variants in the antigenic epitopes that are basically in the double variant also? We call them immune escape variants. What happened? Those antigenic peptides in the specific domains they get mutated and then they are not presented at these MSC2, or they are not basically recognized by CD8 and CD4 T cells. And that's why we call them immune escape variants. Okay, so what happens, these dendritic cells, our antigen presenting cells, they activate CD8 T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and CD4 T cells. And in turn, these CD4 T cells, they basically prime our B cells for those specific antigenic peptides and educate them to say that you have to produce the antibody against this, these peptides, ultimately to clear the, these SARS-CoV viruses, uh, virus particles. On the other hand, CD8 T cells, they basically express these uh, granjam, perforin, and all molecules, and they perforate these virus infected cells to kill those cells and the virus, and thereby the infection is resolved. Okay. So this is the whole uh, like a linking of innate and adaptive immune response to clear the virus infection. And this is somewhat similar to bacterial stuff also. But in a lot of cases, what happens, like in this SARS-CoV infection, the antigenic peptides are not very strong. They don't generate very strong antigenic response. And in a lot of cases, 
like in double mutant uh, Indian variant, there is an immune escape that leads to milder immune response and slow clearance. So here also, uh, I'm just showing the similar thing that uh, this um, spike protein, as you can see here, there's a trimer of like uh, uh, tr the trimer of polypeptide that makes basically this spike protein. And the antigenic peptides are present on the uh, receptor binding domain that are basically uh, present on the CD4 T cells, MSC2, and they educate B cells to generate antibodies against these peptides. So this is just an example, like a graphical representation. What happens, like in this double mutant, this E484Q, which is basically E484L in case of this uh, African mutant. And in Indian mutant, what happened, it becomes E484Q. And this is basically the immune escape variant. And the other one, this L452R, this mutation, both these mutations accumulated and this is highly infective. This is known to be that this will increase the affinity of this receptor binding domain with the ACE2 receptor. And these two mutations are basically most probably leading to the high infectivity and immune escape as well. And this we call as the NTN double mutant. And you can see here in this graph, this January 1 to April 4, you can see that this red, this is basically the Indian variant on the double the mutant, this one, that is amplified drastically. So this is highly infective, it's very clear. Okay, so coming to the uh, today's talk, what I'm going to tell you exactly is, we took a cohort of uh, individuals to, to understand basically that what, why the direct contacts of COVID-19 infected cases sometimes are protected and what type of immune signatures they have that is basically protecting them from infection. So these are the questions that we raise, why some people are protected from contracting SARS-CoV-2 infection and they don't have symptoms. Do contacts have high titer of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, different type of antibodies as compared to infected cases? And what is their BCR and PCR repertoire at single cell level in the B cells as well as T cells? Is there anything like hyper expanded in these contexts? So this is what, this was the study plan. I will just explain this because this is very important to understand. So what we did here, we took around 24, 25 PCR positive, RT-PCR positive cases, and then similar number of their contacts. And why I am saying that this was very interesting thing, how we got these contacts. So these were the migrants that migrated from Gujarat to Barhampur, and they become quarantined directly after arriving here. And they were in the same bus for three to four days. And what happens after quarantine, these PCR positive individuals, because they got mild symptoms, they were admitted to the hospital. Whereas these other individuals, they were not like PCR positive, they didn't get any symptom and they were in the quarantine center. So we took out the data from there and then we identified uh, that these PCR positive individuals, nearly half of them became, became like symptomatic till 10 days. Like uh, when we collected the samples, they were still symptomatic. And some of them, like 50% of them, become asymptomatic by that time when we collected the samples. This was like 10, 11 days in the hospital. And then contacts we co collected from the quarantine centers. And at the same time, we took unmatched controls from our institute itself of different ages. So in these individuals, we looked into what are their antibody profiles, how is their cytokine profile uh, using the 48 plex cytokine assays? And then we looked into what type of features are coming. So if you look into here, these, these are the antibody titers and we looked into total antibody, IgA, because we know that IgA is the main antibody which is present in the respiratory mucus tract and uh, mucus of the respiratory tract, and then IgM antibody. So here, if you look at these are control, infected and contacts. So if you see in contacts, the total antibody levels are, were significantly high as compared to infected. Similarly, Ig antibodies, you see, they were really, really high in these contexts. And IgM, if you see, they were high, but they were not uh, like a significant between infected and contact. It was near significant. So it shows that somehow these contexts had definitely very high titer of antibodies as compared to infected 
cases and controls definitely they will be higher. If you look at the asymptomatic versus symptomatic differences, even we don't see significance when we compare the antibody levels between asymptomatic and symptomatic. But if you look at these infected versus contacts, antibody levels were really high. When we did the neutralization assay for these like a selected individuals, so we took around uh, 10 to 12 contacts, then symptomatic, asymptomatic around 12, and then controls. You see here that clearly the antibody levels correlate with the neutralization assay also. So there is high uh, neutralization of uh, this RBD, because this is basically surrogate virus neutralization assay. It's not exactly the virus we use in PSL3 to neutralize it. It's a surrogate virus neutralization assay. But you clearly see that in context, you have very strong neutralization activity as compared to infected cases. But there definitely in infected cases, we also see the neutralization activity, but not uh, higher in context. When we look at the this uh, serum cytokine uh, signatures, so I, I will show you the whole cytokine signature as well. But here I am showing only the two, like uh, MIF and uh, IL-7. So you see that the levels of IL-7 and MIF were quite high in these contexts as compared to these uh, infected cases. And if you look at the ROC or AUC curve, you see that there is, that is more than 80%. So it looks like somehow these antibodies in the early case uh, time, they basically somehow do the protective effects. And these are basically a lot of uh, cytokines you see here. And these are the antibodies. If you look clearly here in this heat map, in the right side, you can see that the protective antibodies highly correlating with the, these titer of these cytokines. As compared to negative controls, you don't see the antibodies, you don't see these cytokine levels increasing. Whereas in infected cases, because these are mild infected cases, that's why you don't see any inflammatory signature or any type of clear signature as you see in the context. So it appears that these cytokines are somehow protective and they go up along with the antibody responses. I, I will just show you uh, this uh, recent uh, thing that uh, we tried in our lab. So what we did, we collected around uh, 90 individuals after Covaxin vaccination. Uh, that is day 28, that is uh, before the booster dose and two, 10 days after booster dose. Look at this graph, this is quite interesting. So these individuals which are showing high antibody titers, they were basically infected before with COVID. And then after first dose, they have very high antibody titers already, which goes up further after second dose. But on the other hand, those persons which are not infected, if you look at, they have very low titers of antibody after first dose. But after the second dose, definitely it goes up very high. So it's very clear that Covaxin, uh, uh, when you get the Covaxin vaccine, the, after the first dose, you don't have high titer of antibodies, which goes up very high after the booster dose. Whereas if you are infected, then your antibody titer will go very high after the first dose. So this was quite interesting. I just added it just now. This doesn't correlate with the, this contact and all, but I wanted to show it. So now the important thing was to understand why uh, is this antibody increase and cytokine protective response is really look, coming up at the B and T cell, uh, like in terms of TCRs and BCR also, there is some expansion because definitely if the antibodies are high, there should be clonal expansion of B cells. And are there T cells also showing some responses like that, protective responses? So what we did, we sorted B and T cells from three contexts, three patients, uh, three uh, like uh, infected cases, matched infected cases, and three negative controls, and tried to look into this, uh, what is happening to B and T cell five prime gene expression, as well as BCR and TCR profiles. So these are the clusters for B cells, okay. So these are separated B cells only at a single cell level. So we found four different type of B cell types like knife, class Swiss memory B cells, unswiss memory B cells and plasma cells. Plasma cells, I would say, because we didn't use the marker specific to plasma cells during sorting. So that's why plasma cells, the cells, these are basically only some cells that are coming because of contamination during sorting. And we sorted basically based on CD3 and CD19. So CD3 for T cells and CD19 for B cells. 
So if you look at these are the signatures that are used basically to cluster these B cells into different subclasses uh, using the markers that are specific to these cells. And these are the cell numbers that we basically get after the sorting of B cells. If you look into the uh, in controls, contacts, and patients, so if you see that class with memory B cells, you see that in controls they are very less, but in contacts and patients, they are expanded. And we know that class with memory B cells are the only cells that really lead to the antibody production and all. But we don't see any difference in terms of contact and patient if you look at the fraction of class with memory B cells. These are individual individuals. So three contacts, three patients, and two controls. One control later on we remove because the fraction was they have a large number of B cells. And later on, when we looked into the history of that uh, control, it was basically a strong asthmatic uh, like uh, history. If you look at the expansion of uh, clonotypes in uh, like uh, BCRs, you see that contacts have expanded BCRs as compared to patients and controls don't have. They have all unique BCRs because they are not infected or they are not basically in, uh, showing this. If you look at the IDHA clonotypes and IDHG, you see that IDHA clonotype is more or less same if you look at, but IDHG is expanded more, basically the IgG clonotype as compared to in patients, you see more of IgG. So this shows that definitely they have expanded clonotypes uh, for BCR. If you look at VDJ recombination, you see here that in controls, you have a specific like uh, uh, this VDJ clonotype in asymptomatic and symptomatic, if you look at, you see that there is a switch of this clonotype, IG, uh, HV323 and J4. So you see that they have switched. Whereas in context, you see similar type of profile, but you have some more uh, VDJ recombination happening. The frequency is more for some more of these uh, clonotypes. And this is quite interesting. And uh, we are planning to what uh, doing basically in vitro uh, uh, activation of these uh, B cells from infected patients by antigens, uh, antigenic peptides, and look at these in them also because that will tell that these clonotypes are quite important for protection. Now, when you look at the T cells. This is the, these are the clusters for different type of T cells that we are getting on the base of gene signatures. And these are all single cell clusters. And this is the number of single cells. When you look at CD4 and CD8 subtypes, fraction of the CD4 and CD8, what you see clearly that CD4 memory subtypes are highly expanded in context as compared to patients. Similarly, if you look at the, this, Hello, is, uh, is it audible? Fine, no? Dr. Raghav, I would request you to kindly uh, complete. Yes, yeah, only two, three slides. Okay. Yeah, yes, two, three slides only. Okay. So when you will look at the CD8 effect, uh, CD8 subtypes, you see that there is one interesting subtype that is coming that is CD8 positive Tamra cells. These are basically T effector memory cells. These are highly expanded as compared to other subtypes. And when we looked into the CD8 effector memory clonotypes in these CD8 effector uh, Tamra cells, if you see that that CD8 positive Tamra cells, they have very large expansion of TCR subtypes in these cells. And these are well, well known to be highly cytopathic uh, cells, which express granjama perforin at very high levels. They are well known in autoimmune diseases to uh, secrete very high granjama and perforin. And these are TCR alpha and beta chains, which you see that they are expanded in these uh, tam, uh, Tamra cells, TCR alpha and beta. I'm not showing the whole profile. I'm just showing those which are expanded in these Tamra cells. And you see that in context, you have highly expanded these TCR clonotypes as compared to patients. Patients also have quite expanded, but as compared to patients, contexts are really high. And it appears that these TCR and BCR clone expansion basically leading to the protection. And this is just the gene expression. We see uh, I do, gene expression is not that much important, but we see the protective response here as well. So in conclusion, we say that 
direct contacts definitely have very high titers of virus specific antibody. They have high neutralization capacity as well. And some of the cytokines correlate very strongly and they have very like a ASU curve of more than 80%, which shows that they have the protective signature. And that leads to protect, uh, protection from symptoms and maybe the load of viruses. And CD8 Tamra cells appear to be highly protective in case of contacts or in COVID that leads to protection from virus uh, symptoms or virus infection load. So at last, I would like to acknowledge the students who were involved in this. So currently, Sudeshna is doing all the analysis and Arup set up all the pipeline for the single cell analysis and everything. And Kaushik did all the sorting and wet lab experiments. Now Sriparna is also involved in this, Sriparna and Atimukta. And Sudeshna is doing all the analysis. And these are the funding agencies that I would like to thank. So thanks, and I would like to take three questions if his time is there. Thank you, Dr. Sunil, for such an interesting talk. So due to limitation of time, maybe we can take only one question if we have. So I can just probably ask one question. So, uh, so means you showed that uh, contacts have uh, means high amount of uh, antibody response and uh, cytokines were also protective cytokine were uh, means good levels of uh, cytokine. Mm -hmm. So uh, is it uh, is it good enough to protect them from uh, getting a next severe infection from any of those strains or uh, what? Mm -hmm. How protective it is? So that's the reason. What he said, like basically, we what we need to do now that we are planning because you know now we have profiled the clonotypes tsr tcr and bcr clonotype but still we don't know if they are antigen specific so what we are planning we will activate those b cells and t cells or pbmcs directly with the antigenic peptides a pool of peptides from sars cov 2 and then we will look into what type of clonotypes are expanded further and that will tell that they are really antigen specific or not and then we can correlate directly as yes, they are protected. They already have the memory B cells and T cells, and that will definitely protect them for long run because antibodies are short lived that we know. Okay. And will it have any consequence or effect on their performance for the vaccination? They'll be more uh, means responsive to the vaccines. I think they, they should be uh, antibody able just by first dose. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunil. So uh, we'll move on thank to you. our next speaker. Uh, so as we celebrate uh, the International Day of Immunology and we are having this um, symposium under the aegis of Indian Immunology Society, uh, I next welcome uh, a very active and energetic member of our Indian Immunology Society and current uh, secretary, Dr. Amit Avasti, our next speaker. So Dr. Amit Avasti, who is currently working uh, as an associate professor at uh, Translational Health Science and Technology Institute, Faridabad. Dr. Avasti did his PhD in immunology from National Center for Cell Science, Pune, and completed his postdoctoral training from Harvard Medical School, USA, where he also worked as a junior faculty prior to re his return to India. And he is a recipient of many prestigious grants and awards like uh, DBT Ramalinga Swami Fellowship, Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award, DBT Welcome, Tr uh, DBT, uh, Welcome Trust uh, India Alliance Intermediate Fellowship, and the most recently the GN Ramachandran National Bioscience Award for Career Development. And in 2018, he also became a founding member of Indian Onco Onco Immunology Society. His research is focused on understanding various mechanisms involved in the differentiation and transcriptional regulation of Th9 and Th17 cells. Currently, his lab is contributing to bridging the trials of Russian COVID vaccine Sputnik V by measuring the cell-mediated immune responses using SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell assays. So I request Dr. Amit to uh, deliver uh, his talk and enlighten us with uh, his contribution to COVID-19 research. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Anita, uh, uh, for a very generous introduction. Uh, 
I would like to also uh, just would like to just want to share first. Okay, can you see my slide? Looks like uh, yes. Your, your slides are visible. And I had to just say slides mode. Now it is a full screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. So uh, thank you very very much and. Uh, 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 Soma, uh, a wonderful organization, Soma and team, Sally, uh, uh, and I'm very, very happy to, to talk about some of the very, very general aspect of the SARS-CoV-2 COVID infection, uh, COVID-19. And then at the end, perhaps I'm going to talk about some of the work what lab has been doing uh, in terms of animal model. Obviously, we have uh, generated a platform for testing. We, so we have generated two platform in, in my lab. One is the animal model platform to, to contribute for the uh, various screening of uh, antivirals as well as uh, uh, the vaccine candidates. And the second, second platform what we have established is the human platform in which we are actually testing uh, the immunogenicity for, I mean, particularly cellular assays. Uh, because cellular assays are very, very essential and required now by the uh, FDA USA as well as DCGI uh, uh, India to, to show that, you know, this vaccine is actually inducing uh, a T cell response. Uh, so these are the two things, but I'm going to focus primarily on the, on the, uh, on the animal model, some data. So, so before we, we go, we will, I'll just, because the, the audience are kind of mixed. Uh, I have been told that there is MSc student and some of them are PhD students. So I, I prepared my talk in a way that uh, it should be like kind of in a general terms for the MSc students. And, and then we can go a little bit higher in terms of, you know, uh, research. So it's kind of mixed talk. It's not like a scientific talk. So obviously when we talk about SARS-CoV-2 uh, or any viral infection or let's say any any infection in general uh, bacterial infection uh, parasite bacterial pathogen whatever you call it uh, the the immune system is really really important right so immune immune system play a major major role and and this is perhaps is the key for us to survive in the environment where we live all the time surrounded by a kind of variety of various pathogens like bacterial bacterial pathogens, viral pathogens, you know, yeast, I mean the fungal pathogens, so various, various things. So immune system provides us a remarkable, you know, a system to protect us. And uh, this is how the defense against the, in addition to the, you know, protecting us from the various pathogens, uh, the immune system can also protect us from, uh, self cell which is now becoming tumor cells after like having a mutation so these self cell become like a non self and now immune system can also recognize them and try to eliminate them so basically the role of immune system uh, uh, for us particularly in the higher mammals is is protecting us from uh, not only from the pathogens but also from the various self uh, uh, cells, which is now now in, in kind of growing uh, non physiological setting and and causing tumor. So in in addition to this, what happens if we have no infection or no disease or we are kind of healthy individuals, and therefore what is the role of immune system in that setting? And that that's what we call the uh, homeostasis, where uh, the immune system is kind of kind of making a balance and trying to uh, you know, the normal physiological conditions, it, it is actually trying to help us to maintain the balance. And, and one of the feature of the immune system is to actually uh, destruct the abnormal cells or as well as the dead cells. And, and the example is like, for example, RBCs is one of the cells which is uh, very short lived cells. And uh, this is being generated very frequently in the bone marrow and then after its, its time is over it's actually being dead and therefore these dead cells has to be cleared by the by the by the body because otherwise it, it will create problems so therefore we have an immune system or we have the cells of the immune system which actually takes care of this and that's what happens in the spleen where most of these rbcs actually 
dead RBC, which is having a kind of specific signal, they become apoptosed and they're being now uh, phagocytosed by uh, macrophages, which are living in the, in, in, in the spleen. And then they are being uh, destroyed and, and taken care and, and chopped off into small pieces. And then again, these, these nutrients are being now recycled to generate more cells. So, you know, so immune system is playing a role not only in, in one aspect, but it's also, also playing a role in a kind of normal homeostasis condition. So this is for the for the sake of the audience who are not really very much familiar about this. So I just want to very quickly tell that immune system is actually consists of these major things, the organs, the cells and the molecules. And, and in the organs, we have this variety of organs, as you can see, they are enlisted here. Uh, and I'm going, going to primarily talk about the, we have like primary lymphoid organs like thymus as well as uh, a bone marrow, these are the two primary lymphoid organs. Obviously, bone marrow are the place where the all the precursors of immune cells are being generated, and we call them hematopoietic stem cells. And these hematopoietic stem cells actually lead to the various lineages, uh, whether it's innate cells like uh, macrophage, dendritic cells, basophils, eosinophils. All these cells are generated when they are being provided a specific factor. And, and in addition to this, uh, the, the, the lymphocytes also being generated and these lymphocytes uh, are now in case of T cells goes into the thymus where the T cells become mature. And then as a result, during this process of maturation, the positive, positive as well as negative selection happens. And during this negative selection, all the cells which are reacting to the self antigen in the thymus are being uh, deleted. And this is this is we call central tolerance. And the cells which are which are not really reacting are actually positively selected, and these positively selected T cells from the thymus actually comes and populate the secondary lymphoid organs, which are spleen, lymph node, pious patches, and all. And these cells, the T cells which are coming into the secondary lymphoid organs, they they are kind of not really uh, live very long because they like to they like to see the antigen and they try to constantly. Uh, see if, if any dendritic cells or, or APCs present the antigen to the T cells and the, once the antigen is presented, these T cells start multiplying in a, in a process called clonal expansion and that's how this whole process begins. So when we actually uh, talk about the cells, obviously I briefly mentioned the lymphocyte, the T lymphocyte, B lymphocyte, as well as the natural killer cells, which is a hybrid cells. It, it is having a feature of both uh, T cells as well as the innate cells. And, and these are the cells, uh, natural killer cells, primarily producing tons of cytokines immediately. They, they, they have the granules of these cytokines and the moment they see some sort of either tumor cells or, or viral pathogens, they immediately release these cytokines. And this is how the priming of the immune system begins in case of any, any pathogens. And then you have the uh, APCs, macrophage, uh, uh, monocytes, then you have the granulocytes. So these are the cells playing a major role in the in the beginning or the initiation of the immune response in terms of innate immune response. And, and these cells also produce various molecules, which actually are the effector molecules, which takes care of the, uh, you know, uh, neutralize these pathogens by antibodies or, or complement activation and, and cytokines. So this is just very general uh, view uh, for, for the immune system. So now, now we know that how uh, this virus is being evading the immune system and this immune system is now trying to react something which is enter, which is non-self. And this is, the, this is the beauty of the immune system that it recognizes anything which is a non-self. So when virus is actually entering in case of SARS coronavirus from, from the respiratory tract, it actually what it does, it actually attach to the through this spike protein, and this is spike protein. You can see the virus here through the spike protein. Within the spike protein, you have the RBD domain, and this RBD domain actually interact molecularly to the ACE2. At the same time, you have the S1 uh, protein. I mean, the fragment in the S1 protein, uh, which actually interact with the NRP1. So these are the two receptor which are very, very crucial for virus to adhere to the cell, host cells. And once the virus is attaching to the cell by these two molecular interaction, then you have this TMP RSS2, which actually cleave it. And then this endosomes is actually formed and then virus get into it and get replicated. 
so now uh, you know this is has been shown by these two uh, science paper got published where the uh, they have identified that you know if you have a mutation if you create a mutation in in the domain which is interacting with the nrp1 uh, then rvd alone is not really sufficient enough for virus to enter so viral entry will be there but it will be significantly curtailed and therefore you have very less viral load in this case and as a result you will not have that severe and progressive uh, covid-19 so uh, if we if we further go into uh, this interaction what people are now trying to utilize it so if you have this spike protein and this is like a uh, you know crown of the coronavirus which is like a blue flower and this blue flower is attaching to the ace2 and and then tmprs2 is actually cleaving it so basically what people are trying to uh, utilize this either through making some antivirals uh, which is blocking this interaction you know you either you you block ace2 or you you block like try to identify some antiviral which actually bind to spike protein and as a result this interaction is blocked even in case of vaccination uh, the antibodies which are being generated either in the natural fashion when we are infected in a natural way or we are vaccinated by this whatever vaccine we are having in india uh, the antibodies are being generated against this particular uh, portion spike uh, anti spike antibody or rbd antibody and and as a result this this is this site of the virus is masked and as a result the virus cannot really get inside the cells and when the virus is not getting inside the cells it cannot really survive too long in in in, in without getting into the cells and it cannot really uh, make the viral particle to infect uh, other healthy cells so this is the strategy what we scientists are trying to utilize to block the virus and this is exactly what happens when people do the plasma therapy you know you are taking the plasma from one individual who who just had the corona virus and uh, and thinking that they per that person will have very high antibodies and those antibodies going to neutralize this interaction so what happens when the virus are being virus is 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 being sensed by this process the innate as well as acquired immune system is also now activated uh, by the various process through tol like receptor or not like receptors or or type 1 interferon for example so when the virus is actually being uh, sensed by the innate immune system we know what is the innate immune system innate immune system is a first line of immune response and that actually relies on the mechanism that actually exists so basically this is ready made this is a pre made uh, system we have it is not need to be acquired or being adapted so this is a first line of defense when the virus is entering and and virus getting into it and and immediately you have this innate response and that comes in case of this virus is type 1 interferon right and this type 1 interferon is being produced which try to take care of the virus replication as well as this again linking or activating the acquired immune system which is having a it's you know more beneficial than the innate immune system because it is having a capacity or property to actually uh, uh, generate memory cell response as well as you know it is very very antigen specific so i'll give you some example what is happening this is just like uh, cartoon and this is uh, what is happening when when you have a exposure of a virus the virus actually at the at the time you have the exposed to the virus immediately your innate immune system being activated it actually peak and then the slowly the peak goes down and during this time virus virus start replicating and then you have very high viral load right and during this process the the adaptive immune system is also being activated and this is how when virus is actually getting down uh, you know this adaptive immune system remains up and actually generate more t cell response as well as the b cell response and as a result the virus is being neutralized or virally infected t cells are being taken care by the cd8 or cd4 ctls so therefore viral load goes down and as a result this is how the uh, the immune system evolve in case of covid-19 and now we have been hearing about mild cases as well as the severe cases in case of mild cases the viral load remains kind of low it does not really go very high and this could be one of the possibility uh, people are talking about when you have the viral virus remain low in the body it is having a chance to generate mutants right 
because it is it is kind of escaping it is still there so this, you know this is kind of a scenario what people are now talking about this is a new new trend is, is happening maybe this is a possibility and so you have a low viral load then you have the symptoms and milder symptoms and then you feel better in case of severe cases you have very high viral load and and why this is very high viral load because this happens in case of uh, comorbidity like if somebody is having uh, you know diabetes or cardiovascular or hypertension uh, those comorbidity actually help this virus to grow because your immune system is anyways not really working optimally because of the comorbidity and as a result your certain things which is required to contain the virus is not there and as a result you have this severe viral load and that lead to severe symptoms so if we know about you know uh, this then we can also think about you know uh, how this milder cases can be uh, controlled and in, in case of you have a milder case you have a milder adaptive immune response as well as milder uh, innate immune response but when you have the higher viral load you have very high adaptive immune response because ultimately you have more antigen around so basically it's a very simple thing the the the, the immune cells is having more food to eat in the, in terms of antigen right so if you have more viral load is around more t cell is going to be uh, proliferating and more adaptive as well as in innate immune response will be generated and as a result it is generated to control the virus but at the same time it is also going to induce a lot of immunopathology and that immunopathology is causing you the this respiratory problems what we are now hearing the news nowadays about oxygen and all those kind of thing that is happening because of this scenario not in the scenario of the mild cases right so once we know about this how people try to treat it so there is a way to treat it either you use the antiviral which people are trying to use you know some of these antiviral is not really very specific like remdesivir but people are uh, using it uh, so either you can control the viral load by antivirus antiviral activity uh, antiviral drugs and therefore the virus is not going to replicate too much and then viral load will remain less and as a result your innate and adaptive immune response will not go too high and you will have less severe pathologies the other way of of treating the uh, patient which is happening in most of the cases where uh, you have the lower oxygen and this is what uh, that is steroid therapy so what people are doing they are trying to control the adaptive as well as innate immune response by just providing the uh, uh, steroid right and one of the steroid what people are using is dexamethasone and dexamethasone is is actually control the t cell response as well as the innate immune response it actually suppresses the immune system and as a result you don't have Im immunopathology the problem with this steroid therapy it is good to control and it is good to take care of your oxygen level the moment you have the steroid therapy your oxygen level is start going up again but then the viral load cannot be cleared immediately so if you compare the two group of people in which you are giving dexamethasone and one you are not giving dexamethasone you will see the clearance of the virus is much lower when you are giving the dexamethasone so there uh, the virus actually the i mean test comes negative longer time it takes like 30 days when you get negative of coronavirus but when you don't take the dexamethasone you get even negative in 14 to 17 days so that's the kind of difference because you are actually suppressing your immune system just to control the pathology but the viral with virus will take the advantage to survive longer because of this so you know you have to physician has to balance when and how to actually uh, give this treatment and one of the challenge in india to provide this steroid treatment is uh, we we know that we have a lot of tuberculosis cases right and this tuberculosis cases when you give the steroid this they can they can get reactivated so therefore uh, people who are having this kind of problem tb and they are also having the covid these things has to be balanced uh, under you know by the physicians and this is one of the very interesting uh, things has been shown uh, in the publication that you know people who are having mild to moderate covid 19 uh, they generate tons of interferon and this interferon actually have the antiviral property and that control or eliminate the uh, uh, sars coronavirus and 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 in case of severe to critical covid 19 
the somehow the interferon type 1 interferon response is attenuated and because of this the virus actually survive better and that causes more severe disease and this is a very good actually paper came out uh, 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 last year where they have taken the cohort of the people uh, asymptomatic versus people who came to the hospital um, hospital with a life threatening condition after sars coronavirus infection so people who are actually asymptomatic or mild symptoms they are generating nice interferon response and this interferon response is actually inducing stat pathway and producing the factors which are important for antiviral immunity but in case of these life threatening people what people have shown this is actually 10% and now the data has been extended to 40% i think is going to come out very soon so 40% cases are coming uh, that these people are having the self antibodies or auto antibodies against type 1 interferon and as a result these people are producing type 1 interferon but these antibodies neutralizing these type 1 interferon and as a result the type 1 interferon pathway signaling pathway is suppressed and antiviral Im immunity against sars corona virus is gone so this is i think very important for the people who are actually doing the plasma therapy that when you take the plasma you try to see whether those individuals are having these antibody or you are giving the plasma to the people whether they have these type 1 interferon antibodies right so this is i think very important consideration to actually uh, think about a plasma therapy so when this type 1 interferon what it does it not only control the virus it also actually condition the innate immune system as well as the adaptive immune system uh, this is the peak of type 1 interferon and then it slowly increases the viral load but to control the virus but at the same time it actually induces the t cell response so this is how uh, the role of type 1 interferon for actually linking uh, the innate immunity to the adaptive t cell response and these are the cells actually produced type 1 interferon like pdcs uh, uh, cdcs i think deepman perhaps going to talk about if he's going to talk about because he works on these cells or type 1 interferon and the, the the other thing is this type 1 interferon what the, it does it actually contain the virus but what is also does it actually also enhance this increase il10 and pdl pdl1 expression on the t cell because they want t cell response to control because the type 1 interferon wants t cell not to do the collateral damage and as a result this is a balance which which is required when you have this you know high type 1 interferon you might be having other issue which is kind of related to il10 and pdl uh, t cell exhaustions and then uh, this this sars cov2 again uh, after this innate pathway the dendritic cells actually being uh, presenting the, the the class i mean the class class 2 to the cd4 cells and the cd4 priming the b cells and this b cell actually making these high affinity antibodies to uh, neutralize the virus at the same time you have the cd8 t cells are also being primed and actually help in clearing the virus by uh, killing the virally infected t cell, virally infected cells by uh, recognizing the uh, msc class 1 and that's what they uh, produce perforin and granzyme and as a result these virally infected uh, cells actually uh, uh, killed so uh, so doing this we also try to generate animal models in 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 the lab to try to understand the pathophysiology of the disease as well as maybe testing other uh, molecules for various partners so what we have done we infected the uh, uh, hamster and then we try to see these various pathologies we obviously looked at the lung we looked at the spleen uh, for various t cells we looked at the heart and and serum metabolites as well as serum lipids uh, we also check the extra pulmonary pulmonary uh, you know issues in case of intestine so when you infect the uh, golden syrian hamster and we have done with the two different doses and we could clearly see that the uh, sars coronavirus infection uh, the hamster actually lose weight around 10% which is known in the literature and we exactly see the same thing and the peak of the disease what happens at around day 4 which is also reported by other uh, uh, literature so we are kind of very well establishing the model in a way that how internationally it has been established and when we sacrifice these animals as, at these different time points after the infection 2 4 7 and 14 days and we clearly see there is a lung damage and the inflammation in the lung uh, but at the at 14 days you can see the lungs are getting better because the virus is actually 
clearing itself in the hamster because hamster is not really acute model it's a milder model so virus actually get infected it goes up and then slowly it goes down very similar to the human and when we actually check the spleen size at different time points with the different doses of virus you can see at you know day four day two and do day two, four, and seven, the spleen size actually very high at day four. So we could clearly see a lot of splenomegaly. Perhaps it is because of T and B cells are being proliferated in the spleen. And as a result, the size of the spleen actually increased, which happens in most of the infections. And when actually uh, at the 14 days, spleen size actually come back to the normal as very similar to infected. That means the, the infection is being resolved. Most of these T and B cells are actually contracted and the memory cells are generated. That, so this, that, as a result, the spleen size is actually getting less. And this is also very much evident by the TCID50 that at day 14, the TCID50 is very less as compared to day 4. The, the, that means day 2 is actually peak of the virus and at day 14 the virus is actually getting down and when we collected the serum from from these hamster and we try to do the rbd spike and nucleoprotein ELISA, and as you can see that the, the rbd spike and np are actually up regulated these antibodies at day 14 uh, they start coming from day 7 so that means that is very similar what we see in the human they start coming at day 7 and then they are peaking at day 14 and then they remain very very high to 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 neutralize the virus so it looks like most of these various parameter what we established actually really working fine in, in this case and then we try to see the lung injury as you can see we we could see uh, you know alveolar epithelial injury with the green arrow we have pneumonitis at the the, the red arrow and you can see the black and i mean a black arrow in, that's like mast cells so we could see a lot of mast cells uh, accumulation in the lung and that could be one of the reasons you see these allergic kind of symptoms a uh, lot of sneezing a lot of you know uh, histamine release what is happens in the asthmatic and this is exactly also happening in case of hamster and perhaps also in in, in the humans so maybe antihistamine treatment could be maybe beneficial and we are still testing these uh, treatment in the hamster if you treat antihistamine whether it's allergic symptoms actually goes away or not and we also check various lung injury marker at the molecular level and, and most of these lung injury markers are very upregulated up, up at the peak of the disease, whether it's the eotaxin, surfactant, protein D, um, mucin 1 and all. And uh, this is also very, very similar to what we see in case of, you know, uh, cytokine storm. You can see at day two, most of the cytokines are very high. Whether you can see all these cytokines as a TH1 or TH2 cytokine, all are upregulated, upregulated at day two, and then they slowly goes away. So the, there's a clear kind of sign of cytokine storm, and which is also making sense. Uh, the T cell, which is having GATA3, TH2, and TBET as a TH1 transcription factor, is also upregulated at day two. And the, the transcription factor, which is important for regulation of this inflammation, it actually comes at day 14. So it looks like when you have uh, the, the, the infection actually resolving or the virus actually being cleared, you have more regulatory T cells, which now controlling the other effector cells not to have collateral damage. So it looks like very, very uh, streamlined uh, effector and the regulatory T cell balance in, in this case. Dr. So, Amphit, uh, I would like to request, uh, please, uh, complete your presentation. This is this is my last slide, so much. So what we also did, we we tried to do the metabolomics uh, of these hamster. We collected the serum and we tried the uh, LCMS based uh, uh, metabolites uh, identification. And we found a uh, total metabolite. We studied around three thirty four, and we found. Uh, 82 are differentially uh, modulated, 61 are upregulated, and 22 is downregulated. And when we actually put this metabolite in the format of like pathway analysis, we could see there is a high uh, arginine pathways upregulated in case of you know in in case of coronavirus infection in in in, in hamster. Yeah, hamster. And then later on, what we did, we took these metabolites what we identify in case of hamster, and then we also collected the data from from a paper uh, that that were published in cell where they try to see the metabolites changes in the severe versus non severe patient and then we superimposed our data with the published data and we identify around seven metabolites which is coming as a 
a uh, common metabolite in our hamster as well as those uh, human patient and from this seven metabolites we try to validate two metabolites as a as a biomarker and we could see these two metabolites n acetyl uh, neuraminate or alan alan alantoin is actually uh, up regulated so we we predict that these are the biomarker that can be used to study this hamster model for antiviral as well as uh, you know in in vaccine candidate uh, testing so with this i would like to thank all all the people who has contributed in this study and these are the three most important people who have who has actually generated this model two of them my phd student rajdeep and srikant and uh, jagam is now junior research scientist he has joined my lab as a postdoc but he has done tremendous job and now he's testing most of the vaccine candidate from various companies where the jaidas dna vaccine has been tested in 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 our lab bio e vaccine has been tested in our lab and and various antivirals which are which are coming in the market are being tested in in my lab so thank you very much and i will be happy to answer any question you have thank you thank you very much thank you dr avasti it was uh, indeed a very informative uh, talk for both experts and uh, students and with a very nice presentation about uh, the uh, mouse mod as uh, hamster model which kind of uh, simulates uh, sars cov 2 infection so we can take uh, one question uh, do we have a question yeah uh, so dr amit uh, i would like to hear your uh, comments to the audience particularly the students who have been asking me about that uh, mostly like in india you know the cases are pretty much uh, Uh, increasing day by day, and people are concerned that when doctors are saying that uh, every two three days of a COVID infected patients, they have to do a test of D dimer, CRP, IL six. So, do you want to shed any light with respect to cytokine storm and these markers? Like, what are the immunological uh, implications of elevated levels of D dimer, CRP, and IL six with respect to immunology for these patients? so i think the crp is a very non specific marker it gets it actually gets up regulated in most of the cases even in infection as well as in autoimmune diseases so that's kind of routine doctors actually tested yes about ir6 is obviously is up regulated but you know the the role of ir6 is still kind of remain not very clear because there are two clinical trials but i have seen the data the one is actually showing some result in case of cutting the mortality and and recently two days ago this and the uh, clinical study got published in NEGM talking about this anti i6 therapy is not really working but most of the doctors are actually also using this anti i6 which is i don't know whether it should be continue or not but in case of d dimer this is a very important marker and uh, i think this need to be continuously tested in case somebody <laughs> somebody is having like lower oxygen any time you go below 94 the d dimer what happened in in case of d dimer this is indication of some complication in the cardiovascular system and it actually increases very dramatically so every two or three days doctors need to check in case somebody is having severe symptoms the d dimer is one of the good indicator to to see where which direction the patient is going in terms of severity i think that's very important thank you thank you so much uh, thank you dr avasti uh, for a nice presentation and thank you dr soma uh, for the wonderful question so next uh, i would like to uh, invite dr uh, nimesh gupta Uh, who is currently working as the staff scientist and head of vaccine immunology laboratory at the national institute of immunology new delhi dr gupta completed his phd from jivaji university gwalior followed by uh, his uh, post doctoral training from nih usa and medical research uh, in in som paris at uh, nii his lab works at interface of basic and translational immunology and use controlled human vaccination with japanese encephalitis vaccine and diverse spectrum of disease outcome in dengue as his study model dr nimesh has received numerous extramural grants such as sir dbt ramalinga sami fellowship 
ITO US uh, Human Immunophenotyping Consortium, National Biopharma Mission Dengue Consortium, as well as intensification of research in high priority areas from DST. Currently, his lab at NII is working on the character characteristics and uh, clonotyping diversity of human follicular helper T cells established in response to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Recently, he has also received funding from National Biopharma Mission COVID-19 Consortium for COVID research. So I uh, welcome uh, and invite uh, Dr. Nimesh Gupta to present his talk. Thank you very much, uh, Pranika. Uh, and thanks so much uh, to Soma and the organizers uh, to give me this opportunity, you know, to share the data and some information on uh, ecological memory to start cov 2 uh, with uh, our young friends. So what we will do today uh, is in next 15 to 20 minutes, we'll try to discuss on uh, a bit on the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, as you have been listening to it from the whole day. I will try to keep it uh, a very uh, short and we'll look into the virus infection cycle in terms of uh, a bit of simplified cycle that how uh, it happens and what are the determinants of immunological memory. I will then try to uh, give you the glimpse of some of the data that we have generated uh, in, in SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection in terms of the immunological memory in Indian population. We will end up with some of the key takeaways. So, okay. So uh, I think need not to go into the, the introduction to the SARS coronavirus 2, uh, but something which I would like to raise here is uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, belongs to the, uh, the subfamily of, uh, you know, the coronavirinae, the genre of coronavirinae, where we have a genus uh, of four different uh, uh, viruses, alpha coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses, gamma and delta. And it's only alpha and beta uh, which are known to uh, transmit to humans till date. And if you see the combination of these two uh, genus uh, uh, in the, the SARS coronavirus 2, uh, SARS coronavirus 1, or the MERS, uh, they all belong to the beta family, along with two of the viruses called as HKU1 and OC43. And the viruses that are in alpha coronavirus families, 229E and NL63, these four viruses uh, are known to cause common cold across the globe okay in in the population and they have their share of causing common cold uh, so almost around 30 percent so that's an important information i would like you to keep in mind as we go through the data uh, uh, on, on 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 the coronavirus immunological memory so with this information uh, i think uh, what we know about this virus is that it's a big virus and it has a, a around 16 non-structural proteins of uh, four structural proteins a spike protein, which is shown here in green, uh, has been a target of a majority of the vaccines which are available in market today uh, and those who are in trials. Other than that, uh, the membrane protein or, or the envelope uh, along with the nucleocapsid do play uh, an important role, uh, particularly the nucleocapsid has been shown to have, uh, you know, some roles in, in the early uh, stages of the infection. Now, if we, if we see the spike protein, I just would like to share this pictogram that why the spike protein has been an interesting target. If you see here, the spike protein expressed on the virus, it interacts with the ACE2 receptor on the human cells. And by virtue of this interaction, this virus get inside the cells where it replicates, disseminate in the body, and then create the, the pathology. So if we need a good vaccine uh, for the moment, what we are targeting is we have good antibodies against this spike protein what you will be able to do is that you will be able to inhibit the interaction of the spike protein with the ACE2 receptor. And by virtue of inhibiting this interaction, you will actually control the entry of the virus inside the cell and definitely will control uh, the, the further dissemination. So with this information, uh, uh, if, you, if you see um, you know, that overall implication of the different viral proteins uh, and how they are actually involved in the immune responses that has been, uh, you know, uh, 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 a basis of studies in, in human, particularly now, and we have been exploring those aspects. Uh, something which I would like to uh, to share with our young friends is 
when we want to study the immunological memory to any virus, there are determinants of the immunological memory that you can actually assess. And practically said, when we want to study those aspects in human, you have to have a way uh, that you can at least assess in, in circulation, in blood, because that's what the limitations we have, that we cannot take out the tissues, unlike the, the mouse models where we study in the spleen or in the lymph nodes. So let's go into those aspects about what are those immunodeterminants and you know how those determinants can be assessed and how that can help us to understand the, the immunological memory to these viruses that can help uh, not only to design the vaccines, but also can help in implementing the vaccine in a particular population. So let's see this uh, slowly through this scheme, though uh, I think our previous speakers have talked about it, so maybe it will work like a booster here for you, but let's go through it. Uh, that when you have a virus which enters uh, in our body, uh, uh, you know, there will be the physical barriers as in case of our upper respiratory tract, you know, we have some of the barriers in terms of either the mucus or, you know, uh, uh, some other chemical barriers that can help to actually hinder this virus here itself, which, you know, in a later stage, which can then further cross uh, if was not stopped, then you have uh, innate responses, the innate component that comes into picture and try to actually attack the virus and control its further dissemination. What happens next once you have the innate responses, uh, the next is a very important phase of uh, any virus infection that actually determines and that actually help in establishing the immunological memory is the anti-presenting cells. Those who are taking this virus uh, to, to the area, uh, particularly in the lymphoid tissues, uh, like the secondary lymphoid organs, where that whole crosstalk of the innate response, the innate system with the adaptive system can happen. And what happens here? One of the possibility that this virus uh, can directly go via systemic circulation, activate some of the B cells and have some low affinity antibodies, one of the possibilities. Second, which is very important and it's the key is, is, the, is, the, is the center of actually the uh, uh, humoral uh, immune responses is this particular infection where the T helper cells are activated by the dendritic cells presenting the virus uh, processed antigens. And these T helper cells, known as follicular T helper cells, then crosstalk with the B cells, the cognate interactions where the B cells are also specific to that particular antigen, which is there, uh, uh, you know, uh, recognized by on these TFH cells, lead to a very prominent and optimal germinal center responses, which are the basis of high affinity, a uh, good quality antibodies, as well as a good quality memory B cell responses and the memory T cell responses. So that's the second cycle that happens. And at the same time, we have these antigen presenting cells doing the crosstalk with the killer T cells and you know, inducing the differentiation and having you know, these T cells that are now specific to the antigen comes into the circulation. So when we have this particular activation of adaptive immunity, all these markers are now available in the blood as well as in the tissues, and they actually help us to control the infection to clear the virus, to clear, you know, the virus induced pathology, pathology at that particular step, as well as they have the memory. The memory means they now uh, have the capacity to recognize uh, the virus again if we see it in future. And that is actually expressed in terms of these markers like the antibodies, the B cells, the killer T cells or the T helper cells. So if we follow this particular scheme of how an immunological memory develops against a virus, something which is you know, a, a very uh, a clearly presented is, these are the four determinants uh, you know, that one has to look into to identify the benchmark parameters, to identify uh, some of the correlates of a long-term memory, and also to assess the efficacy of a vaccine to induce some of these uh, you know, uh, determinants uh, for a long-lasting protective immunity. So, Having this particular uh, setup, uh, having this particular information, uh, what we actually asked, so in my laboratory in past four to five years, we have been trying to you know, set up uh, the platform to address uh, follicular T helper cells, their biology uh, and their implications in long lasting protective immunity to flaviviruses like Japanese flyers virus or dengue virus, both in case of infection as well as in case of the controlled vaccination. So what we, uh, you know, sometime in March, uh, when this you know, virus uh, hit us, we try to address some of these questions. And the question that we are asking is very important for us, particularly for Indian population, that how the immunological memory to this virus looks like in, in our population, where we have to have some uh, a, a good uh, pandemic control responses as well as the vaccines. 
the T cell correlates of protection in COVID-19, and the traits and long-term stability of protective T cell immunity, either after natural infection or after vaccination with the rolled out vaccines in our country. So what will I do today is I will try to give you a glimpse of some of the data uh, from what we have done in looking into these immunological determinants of, of a long lasting memory to SARS coronavirus 2 in our population. So what we did here is a strategy which I would like to share that we enrolled uh, COVID-19 patients, those who recovered from COVID-19, a mild COVID-19, and we collected their samples, the blood samples after five to six months of their recovery from the mild COVID-19. In this cohort, we excluded the asymptomatic patients, we excluded the severe patients, and we also excluded any individual who had a known comorbidity. So this was a very clean cohort that we had, and all of them were confirmed by RT-PCR for their positivity and the, the, the symptoms vanished. What we did along with this, we also enrolled some of the individuals uh, which we had already the library with us from 2018 and 2019, prior to the pandemic as a control uh, of the set of samples, both PBMCs as well as CERA. And what we did here to address this question on the immunological determinants that uh, what's about the antibodies, the CD4 T cells, the B cells, as well as the CD8 T cells in terms of memory uh, responses, we, uh, we quickly uh, made some of the assays, uh, of course, the serological assays in the duration of March to October, some of the, the quick point of care assays, which are based on the hemoglutination test to identify antibody positive or negative individuals, and some of the pseudoviruses for SARS-CoV-2 so that we can do the neutralization assays in the BSL-2 facility. The most prominent and the most important thing that I would like to share with our young friends is that something that was more important here was the battery of T-cell assays, right? So a more meaningful data you can only generate if you have a way to look into a very virus specific T cells so that you can pinpoint to those populations that are less than 0 0.0, uh, 0.1%, 0.2% in a total pool and then study that what their traits looks like. So that's what we did. We quickly adapted our assays from JEV and Dengue for SARS-CoV-2 to study the traits, the quantity, the function, as well as the quality of T cells in case of the, the infection and vaccination. So let's now see some of the data, the real world data, how it looks like. So. Here I'm showing you the antibody responses to this virus in a long term. Long term is five to six months, but we now have the data after one year and that does not look very different than what we have seen in five to six months. So the first graph is showing you the spike specific IgG responses uh, on a Y axis and you see these gray circles, they are unexposed. When I say unexposed, they all were pre pandemic samples prior to pandemic individuals who have not seen the SARS coronavirus 2. And these red circles are from the mild COVID-19. A very strong and very stable antibody response to spike was observed uh, at least after five to six months of infection. On a second panel, you see the nucleoprotein specific IgG. And here again, we see a very strong uh, uh, and a stable antibody responses against nucleoprotein uh, in our population after six months of recovery. Of course, there was around 30% to 35% of the individuals who has shown some cross-reactive antibodies to nucleoprotein even prior to the pandemic. We further confirmed that this is not only the binding IgGs that we are seeing after six months, uh, we are, these antibodies do have a fantastic potential of neutralizing the virus. And of course, in unexposed individuals, uh, we were not seeing that. So what we did, we did some more assays on these cross-reactive antibodies and we pinpointed that this cross-reactivity that we are seeing here in our population prior to the pandemic is probably coming from a common cold coronavirus called OC43. So I'm not sharing the data here, but that's what we have took and we took the lead from there and we are studying more uh, details about uh, that particular implication. Next, we asked uh, the question that uh, how the CD4 T cells looks like in this, uh, you know, in this infection. So we took those PBMCs after six months of recovery. We stimulated those PBMCs with the peptide pools of uh, of the SARS coronavirus 2, uh, which are either targeting only the spike protein of the virus or the non spike proteins. When I say non spike, it means everything other than a spike from that particular virus. So we utilize these two pools. Uh, just these are the two contours which are showing you the, the contours in unexposed donors and the contours from the COVID 19. The outcome of the data is that in unexposed donors in the top panel, what you are seeing, there are minimal responses observed in case of the spike specificity prior to pandemic. However, there was a significant, a substantial responses were observed in case of the, the response to non-spike domains of the virus even prior to pandemic. 
as expected uh, what we see a fantastic response was observed by uh, you know the the spike specific or the non spike specific responses by the mild recovered patients and that was very encouraging data we did more analysis into it and i just show you this uh, you know the the stimulation index calculation uh, so this shows that how robust the response was in terms of the t cells either coming from the unexposed donors or coming from the covid-19 patients at 6 months what you see here that these mild patients had a very robust response to the spike uh, and in, in unlike you know uh, the few of the donors that showed the response prior to the pandemic as well but when you see the non spike domain here on this side of the graph you see that there was not a there was not a substantial robustness observed for the t cells targeting the non spike domains uh, against the, the 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 t cells that coming from the unexposed donors the prior to pandemic donors and then we further you know categorized and looked into these donors that you know what is the fraction that we are getting here if you see on this graph uh, the y axis is giving you a percent responders the gray bars are showing you the unexposed donors and the red bars are the mild covid-19 patients the left panel is for spike specific t cells and the the right panel is for the non spike specific t cells so prior to pandemic almost 25% of the donor showed some level of spike reactive t cells and after the the uh, recovery from infection almost 93% of them were having a good t cells even after 6 months but if you see the non spike responses almost 70% of the donors even prior to pandemic has shown a very strong response to the non spike domains of the sars coronavirus 2 that they have never seen before and uh, around 80 to 85% of the donors uh, had uh, the stability in their uh, t cell uh, memory responses to to the non spike domain we further looked into the the different aspects of the cd4 t cells either the prior to pandemic or post pandemic uh, their functions uh, their quality their heterogeneity in terms of th cells of the tfh cells as well as their composition in the memory i will just share some data on the on the functional aspects of what kind of cytokines they are secreting so if you see in these graphs we looked into some of the cytokines uh, required for the t cell activation as well as the t cell help to b cells the the gray bars again showing you the unexposed donors the red are for the the mild covid and uh, the left side of the graphs are spike and the right is on the non spike if you see all these graphs all these data from the different cytokines there was no significant difference observed whether the t cells coming from the the unexposed donors or t cells coming from the covid 19 patients in terms of their capacity to secrete these cytokines suggested that these cells those who are available as a cross reactive t cells in our population do have a, a bit a similar kind of functional capacities in 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 terms of secreting these cytokines we further looked into the you know uh, i'll just share some data on the memory components because we have seen a very strong response uh, to the to the spike domains and very uh, little lower response to the non spike we asked whether their memory components are different but if you see on this graph on the y axis is the percent sars cov2 cd4 t cells specific virus specific t cells and the different compartments of nave central memory effector memory or the thymora compartment for cd4s no difference was observed whether they are targeting spike or the different domains in the non spike part of the virus looks like that even if they have a lower frequencies their component their their mixture of uh, of the uh, the memory component is not very different something which was very interesting you know for us to know uh, and we were very intriguing about what's about the stability of these t cells so we looked into the the durability the stability and the persistence of these t cells after 6 months of the recovery so in this uh, graph what you see on a y axis is the percent sars cov2 cd4 t cells a total cd4 t cells and the x axis is the days from symptom onset what you see here is almost 90% of the individuals recovered from mild disease has a fantastic frequency of virus specific cd4 t cells available after 6 months now we have the extended data uh, on on these individuals uh, and also with other cohorts after one year of the recovery and we have the similar responses of over 90% have a fantastic stability of the cd4 t cells and mostly are targeting very strongly to the spike domain but there are differences in the asymptomatic donors or there are differences in the individual those who were severe and recovered from the disease i'll quickly show you some data on the cd8 t cells it was uh, uh, of course something surprising for us just go quickly on the right panel of the slide uh, this graph is showing you the percent responders so we did the similar strategy stimulated the, the pbmcs from these donors either before or after pandemic with the pools 
what you see that hardly 10% prior to pandemic or 20% after the pandemic have some memory CDA T cells available, suggesting that in this overall immunological memory compartments, if you compare CD4 and CD8, CD8 has a minimal contribution to the SARS coronavirus to specific immunological memory. So when we saw this, you know, uh, the CD4 T cells uh, that were targeting more the spike domain and not other the non-spike domains, we looked into the details of non-spike domains, uh, looked into the non-structural proteins which were there, mostly, uh, you know, enriched, or uh, looked into the envelope membrane uh, proteins and the nuclear capsids. What we found in those T cell assays that it was mostly the nuclear protein which was targeted by the pre-pandemic population uh, in case of our non-spike responses. So we then asked the question, does this cross-reactivity also exist or does this priority or does this predisposition of responses to the spike exist in the B cells as well? Because of course, when we looked into CD4s, we looked into TFH, I didn't share the data, but the TFH responses were also more prioritized towards the spike domain. So what we did, we, we took those PBMCs from the, from the same set of cohort, we expanded the B cells, we enriched the antigen specific B cells, and then we looked into the, the different isotypes of those memory B cells, secreting either IgG, IgM, or IgA. And this panel is showing you the spike specific B cell. The second panel is showing the nucleoprotein specific B cell. And this is just a total non-antigen specific B cells. The whole this left panel is for unexposed donor and the right for the COVID-19. So what's the summary of the data from this experiment is, is here. So first panel, what you see is the IgG secreting B cells, a very strong, a very high magnitude of antigen specific IgG secreting memory B cells exist even after six months from recovery, which was substantially higher uh, than the nucleoprotein specific memory B cell secreting IgG, like what we have seen in case of the CD4 T cells. The IgM responses uh, were not very different and were also observed in case of the pre-pandemic samples. And the IgA uh, again followed the same track, what we have seen in case of the IgG secreting B cells, that they, there are higher magnitude of the IgA secreting B cells after six months than uh, uh, to the spike protein than to the nuclear protein of the virus. So this data further corroborated with our, you know, the, the, the data that we generated on the CD4 T cells, and we further looked into these, you know, uh, the T cells that how they are actually, uh, which compartment they are actually enriched, and that, that is, the work is still going on. So with this information, uh, you know, on the, on the antibodies, the CD4 T cells, uh, the CD8 T cells and B cells, how these whole determinants of immunological memory looks in our population, I just would like to conclude the talk here that the key takeaway is that we have provided uh, that the very first evidence from our country on both the high magnitude pre-pandemic and the persistent immunological memory after COVID-19 in our population. Almost 70% of the examined cohort uh, has shown the SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 T cells, which were actually uh, 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 present prior to, to the pandemic itself. And something which is very encouraging for the vaccines that are actually particularly coming up right now and has been rolled out in our country, that there is a very durable cellular memory that you can see in case of mild COVID-19 recovered patients. And this memory is particularly targeting the CD4 T cells and the B cells that are more enriched. And these memory CD4 T cells and B cells in COVID patients are predominantly targeting the spike protein of the SARS coronavirus group. So uh, with this, I just would like to uh, thank my team members, uh, those who have, you know, uh, extraordinarily working during the lockdowns, particularly Asgar, Anurag, Shilpa, and Someshwar, those who have contributed to this work. We have collaborated with the team in All India Institute of Medical Sciences for the clinical cohort. And I'm also thankful to our collaborator in La Jolla, uh, Shane and Alex, those who have worked with us from the JAV vaccine program and, and the dengue programs, and our other collaborators like Ellen and Ethian, who has helped us to develop this hemagglutination-based assay. And I'm very thankful to the, the different uh, agencies, both national and international, those who have showed a fantastic faith in our programs and has helped us to establish this human T cell immunology program in our laboratory. And with this, I would like to thank uh, all of you for your time and attention, and uh, uh, I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for such an insightful and informative uh, presentation. So uh, we can take uh, one question if we have any, or I can just ask uh, one question. So the, if we have, if you have any updated data post vaccination 
So uh, is there a comparison? Like if you have compared uh, how the responses of exposed uh, uh, individuals it is different from vaccinated uh, individual, maybe first dose or second dose. Is it like significantly any difference uh, you see? If you have so if, if I understood your question, you mean to know uh, if someone who has a previous infection, whether they were different in responding to vaccine than a person who has not seen the virus, right? No, no. So, so my question is uh, like you have shown that uh, exposed uh, or person with mild uh, infection, they have a like a more specific uh, uh, T cell and B cell response uh, in their um, cells, like a, a cell, cell type. So after vaccination, who are not infected, is it like a same as uh, somebody who is exposed or it is yeah. uh, any different? Definitely. So see, uh, uh, Obviously, so that that response, what we are seeing now, uh, an individual who was exposed to the sub coronavirus to whether he was asymptomatic or symptomatic, an individual who has not been exposed to the sub coronavirus. Uh, we are working on those aspects uh, right now. The data that I can share some information with you is yes, there are differences in terms of a robust T cell responses as well as antibody responses uh, to to those individuals, those who were zero positive. But it is not very straightforward. There is a huge heterogeneity in the immune responses and there are differences even if the individual was exposed, what he was, whether he was asymptomatic or he was or he was symptomatic. There are differences there. So soon we will be able to, you know, uh, come up with that observation uh, and then we can share. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, uh, for uh, your uh, nice presentation and very nice and uh, wonderful data. Uh, Thank so, you. Uh, next, uh, I would like to... Um, introduce Dr. Dipyaman Ganguly. So he's our next speaker. Uh, he is uh, currently working as principal scientist and associate professor of uh, cancer biology and immunology disorder at uh, Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, Kolkata. He is a physician with two PhD degrees. One is biotechnology from IACB, Kolkata, and second in immunology and biomedical science at the University of Texas uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, Houston, Texas. He has further completed a postdoctoral training from Columbia University Medical Center, US. And Dr. Ganguly is a recipient of many prestigious grants and awards such as Ramanujan and uh, Sornajanti Fellowship from DST India, Nasis Tropus Young Scientist Award from Elsevier, Mark Young Scientist Award in Life Science and National Bioscience Award for Career Development from DVT. His lab at IACB is working on the interface between infections and systemic inflammation, regulation of innate immunity and pathogenesis of inflammatory disorder. Currently, Dr. Ganguly's group is working on various aspects of COVID-19 pathogenesis and immunology, along with plasma therapy trials in Indian patient. So, I welcome Dr. Ganguly. Please uh, uh, share your slide and uh, deliver your talk. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, I really thank uh, Dr. Grothagi and Dr. Sarangi for uh, this kind introduction and uh, getting me here. It's a privilege talking here also on the day of immunology, when the whole world is looking uh, forward to the immunologists to save it, save the world. We don't know whether we will be able to, but largely we have been able to understand the disease that is causing the current pandemic. And uh, on, on different aspects, different immunologists are working in different parts of the world. Um, so you can see the slides, I believe. Yes, yes, uh, okay. it is. Yeah, so um, without um, uh, introducing a lot about the SARS-CoV-2 infection and the COVID-19 disease, because we have been hearing about it from different speakers uh, from the morning itself. And Amit and Dinesh did a, and Sunil did a very good job in introducing the disease, the immunology associated with it, and the intricacies of the immune response in these patients who are presenting with different kinds of symptomatology. So uh, when the pandemic hit India um, on request from CSIR and due to my own interest in inflammatory disorders and because from the very early days in China, 
uh, there was uh, there were reports of systemic hyperinflammation happening in these patients who are suffering from severe COVID-19 disease. I got interested into it. And uh, at that point of time, um, instead of exploratory research, we thought of uh, trying to uh, help the system by uh, doing some of the clinical trials. So we actually took up two of the clinical trials. I'll just talk about one of them. And uh, so this is a clinical trial, uh, randomized control trial on convalescent plasma therapy. I don't think uh, I have to introduce convalescent plasma therapy. Uh, just for the students, I will just tell that this is all about taking plasma from recovered patients uh, with the infection and transferring it to patients who are not being able to recover fast and or who are uh, succumbing to severe infections and uh, are hospitalized. So the idea is to uh, idea is that uh, you assume that the persons who have recovered from the infection have developed antibodies which are circulating in its plasma in his or her plasma. You take that plasma and that uh, antibody rich plasma will help the patient who are not recovering. And uh, so we, we when we started this uh, trial, uh, I think a whole lot of different groups all over the world started these trials in different countries. And you will hear uh, Professor Arturo Casadeval uh, just after me, and he pointed out the uh, possibilities of convalescent plasma therapy in COVID-19. And uh, you know, in a very nice uh, uh, graphics here in, in JCI in early 2020, and we all of us actually uh, looked into this graphic and with this hypothesis we went into it. So the early convalescent plasma therapy should act as antiviral therapy. Later perhaps convalescent plasma therapy will also show some immune modulation effects. Uh, so we uh, did this program which is which was named PICP program passive immunization with convalescent plasma which was sponsored by Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. The institute I work in, in Indian Institute of Chemical Biology is a constituent laboratory of CSIR. And uh, this actually involved multiple institutes amidst uh, a, a national lockdown. And uh, so there was Medical College Hospital Kolkata Blood Bank, which was given the responsibility of uh, uh, motivating donors, uh, uh, inviting them to donate their plasma, screening the plasma for uh, different uh, things. And we also screened the plasma in our, in our ACB facility for uh, which was like made up for immunological studies where we checked the anti-SARS-CoV-2 specific IgG response and also the neutralizing antibody uh, content of the plasma. And then the clinical trial site was uh, Infectious Disease and Belekata General Hospital, Kolkata, which is an infectious disease specialist hospital, which was um, converted into a Apex COVID hospital in West Bengal and the plasma therapy were there. So uh, there were almost 10 trials on convalescent plasma therapy approved by CDSCO uh, or uh, the regulators in India. I think three of them completed their trial and uh, submitted their reports. I'll just talk about the major two trials. Uh, so one of them uh, the, is Indian Council of Medical Research trial or also called PLACID trial, uh, which was a multicentric trial which uh, recruited patients from almost 50, more than 50 uh, clinical institutions and there, uh, so the and then the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research single center trial that I, uh, we were doing in Kolkata. Now there were basic differences between these two trials. For example, in the inclusion criteria of ICMR trial, of ACID trial, the rather mild acute respiratory distress syndrome patients were being recruited. So you uh, you look at this expression PaO2 by FiO2, which is large, which largely says partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. Uh, and its ratio with FiO2, which is a fraction of oxygen received by the uh, patient or the alveoli of the patient. And essentially, um, I think it's, it's better to uh, get this in, in, into um, your idea that before you're going into the trial, so essentially the disease is acute respiratory distress syndrome where there is a ventilation and perfusion mismatch, right? So oxygen is reaching the alveoli, but it's not being able to oxygenate the blood, the venous blood. Uh, which is also reaching the uh, pulmonary beds. And uh, so they were uh, targeting patients and based on this PaO2 FiO2 ratio, or we also call it PF ratio, uh, there are different grades of this uh, distress or acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. And uh, they were targeting the mild ARDS patients. And, uh, and also their primary outcomes were uh, progression to severe ARDS, 
which was PF ratio below 100 and all cause mortality. On the other hand, the CSIR trial that we ran in a single center had a very unique primary outcome. So one of them was to compare all cause mortality of this uh, uh, for this therapy, convalescent plasma therapy. And uh, in our inclusion criteria, we actually also included moderate ARDS patients, which is uh, having PF ratio of 100 to 200. And we actually ended up uh, recruiting all moderate ARDS patients because we are working in a very low resource single center and uh, with an ICU with a 30 bed capacity. And naturally, uh, most of the severe patients were uh, taking births in that ICU and we, we could only uh, recruit moderate ARDS patients. Most of them had PO2 below 200, uh, almost 95% of them. Now, in the, going back to the primary outcome, our second primary outcome, actually on a request from the CDSCO, because this trial was being done by scientists and clinicians together uh, to identify the immune correlates of response uh, to plasma therapy, if, and if there is there was any, any response to the CPT, uh, convalescent plasma therapy, the, we should uh, look at the immune correlates of that response. Now, uh, so we, we actually assessed uh, 440 individuals uh, who were in that ICU uh, in ID, IDNBG hospital. Uh, uh, almost uh, 320, I mean, more, around 326 patients had to be excluded because all of them were having severe ARDS with PF ratio less than 100. And uh, our inclusion criteria did not include that. And um, so 114 patients matched the inclusion criteria, uh, 34 patients declined um, to getting recruited into a trial. We could, we are, and then we randomized 80 individuals, which was our permission for, and 40 were randomized to standard of care therapy, and 40 were uh, randomized to convalescent plasma therapy, who also got standard of care uh, in addition to plasma. Now, let us first uh, look at the randomization outcomes. Uh, so, looking at the pathogen characteristics, this is the, we actually sequenced the viral isolates from most of the patients. Uh, we could see a sequence of almost 54 viral isolates. You can actually look at these purple dots are the uh, patients who were recruited into the convalescent plasma arm. The black spots are the standard of care arm. You can actually see there is no bias in terms of the clade representation of the viral isolates. Uh, so all three clades that were present at that point of time in uh, the state of West Bengal and the city, uh, 19A, 20A, and 20B, all, all are kind of uh, equally presented in the in both the both the arms. In terms of the recipient characteristics, uh, we actually mapped the comorbidities the patients were having. This is a very uh, unique characteristics of the Indian patients of COVID-19 because the number of patients with severe COVID-19 with comorbidities are much higher uh, in India. Uh, this uh, in, a, in association with the lower case fatality rates in India, you can actually um, perhaps hypothesize that in, if the non-communicable diseases were under check, uh, the case fatality rate perhaps would have been much lesser in India. And uh, so we, we found that almost 60% of the patient um, uh, had uh, metabolic disorders uh, in, in both the uh, arms, and there was no uh, bias in terms of the comorbidity distribution. I'm not going into details uh, for the lack of time. We can actually see, so this is the big sky blue uh, circle is uh, type 2 diabetes. This is uh, hypertension, the purple circle. You can actually see this, these are the most dominant comorbidities present in our patients. Now, uh, going back to the uh, ventilation power fusion mismatch, the way we wanted to follow the patients were uh, by uh, looking at their SpO2 and FiO2. FiO2 depends on the uh, way the patient, patient is given oxygen, right? So either he's uh, on the room air or when the fraction of oxygen will be 20% uh, or 0.2, or you are using different kinds of devices as the need arises, right? And all these devices have a specific FiO2 assigned to them. And based on that, you can actually calculate the FiO2. And uh, SpO2, as you know, you uh, look at the uh, finger with pulse oximetry and find out the saturation of oxygen in the capillary blood, which is SpO2. All of us are having one on uh, in our household these days. Uh, because the PaO2 was uh, what was difficult to do in our uh, low resource setting for every day. Now, uh, this uh, figure, what it shows is, so each row represents one patient. All the blue dots are the RT-PCR dates for those patients. So the red dots are the 
uh, day of any untoward outcome, unfortunate outcome of the disease, uh, or, or other words, death. Um, and all these uh, small boxes represent the day they spent in a hospital. And the color coding from yellow to green uh, actually represents the level or gradient of the uh, SF ratio, that is SpO2 by FiO2 ratio. That actually represents how much oxygen is being given to the patient and how much patient's blood is getting. So it's kind of a surrogate marker for the ventilation perfusion mismatch. And we know, if you look at this figure, we know that if the oxygen being given to the alveoli is uh, uh, nicely um, I mean, used for uh, perfusion uh, of the pulmonary venous blood, uh, then you will get 100% oxygen saturation. But in case of ARDS, we know that there are deposition of hyaline uh, extracellular matrices and a lot of uh, fluid accumulation in the alveoli, by which the ventilation perfusion bed is kind of disrupted and uh, there is mismatch. So we wanted to uh, look at that uh, uh, on a daily basis. Now, these are our primary outcomes, right? So uh, when you, you look at the primary outcome in terms of whether the, the SF ratio kinetics, how the oxygenation was happening in the patients over seven days after they were enrolled, so day one they were enrolled. On day one, they received one plasma. On day two, they received the second dose of plasma of 200 ml, uh, which is the ABO matched plasma from a convalescent donor. And uh, so these graphs show the SF ratio kinetics over these seven days. And you can see, so there are hints of some um, better oxygenation in case of the purple uh, is the, the CPT group. There is better oxygenation, but this is not statistically significant. Uh, neither the post-admission hospital stay duration was different between the uh, between the between these these two arms. Uh, neither post-enrollment and also survival benefits, uh, although there were some indications, but it was not uh, statistically significant. For in, uh, so it, it actually uh, tells you that when you randomize 80, we randomized 80 patients into these two arms, between these two arms, there was no clinical benefit that could be statistically significant. But interestingly, when we were uh, analyzing uh, the data in more detail, we actually noted the patients who were surviving after getting plasma were of significantly lower age compared to patients who are uh, who were meeting untoward outcomes even after given plasma. So that was something uh, very interesting. While this age difference between the death and discharge was not there in the standard, that told us that there may be some response heterogeneity to convalescent plasma therapy in terms of uh, age groups. And so we did a very interesting uh, analysis of the hazard ratio uh, of between these two arms and to, uh, to find out whether uh, there is any benefit in different age groups, right? So here this graph shows the hazard ratio, it plots the hazard ratio. 80 shows that you are actually comparing all patients below 80 years of age. 70 tells you all patients below 70 years of age. Well, uh, this is a post hoc uh, subclass analysis. Definitely, it's not that statistically robust compared to a pre specified subclass analysis, but actually it uh, derived very interesting data. And so in our, because it's a very small number of patient that we were doing our trial on, um, so we could not, um, uh, so we, we found a one, one edge uh, cutoff where uh, there was statistically significant difference. So which is uh, this place with 67 years. Now this 67 number is not of that importance because it, it depends on the structure of your, or the number of your uh, sample or uh, the cohort size, right? And how you are, uh, doing it. But what was uh, very, uh, very much notable is a kind of a sigmoid um, uh, configuration of this hazard ratio curve. You can actually see in the higher age group, the hazard ratio is close to one, while in the lower age group, the hazard ratio comes down. Maybe they are not statistically significant because in lower age group, we did not have a lot of patients, right? Now we cut, took this cutoff of age 67 years and compared our, all our outcomes. So this is the oxygenation outcome. You can actually see after getting two doses of plasma, there is very fast mitigation of hypoxia in these patients. Um, well, the standard of care patients are also catching up um, because we, our protocol was for two plasma donations and uh, transfusions. Um, so I don't know, there may be, uh, one may hypothesize that uh, with further plasma uh, transfusions, the 
better oxygenation could have prevailed uh, for longer period of time. Now, when you look at the hospital duration, post admission and post um, enrollment, the, I'm just showing the post admission um, uh, hospital discharge data. You see that the patients who received plasma were significantly earlier uh, discharged. And also, in terms of the survival benefit, they, have, they were much, uh, I mean, they were, CPT was much more beneficial in this age group. On the other hand, the other, the higher than the 67 year age group, these benefits were not at all there. So that actually told us that there may be some response heterogeneity in response to CPT in, uh, in these patients. And to find out the second outcome, which is our immunological correlates of uh, response to convalescent plasma therapy, we wanted to have some parametric um, uh, surrogate for um, the tissue oxygenation or the tissue response to therapy. And for that, we actually took the area under curve of the SFR or the SF ratio kinetics. I just showed you the seven days um, SF ratio kinetics. We just took the area under curve for all the patients, each patient. And that was a surrogate for their tissue oxygenation measure over these seven days post enrollment, right? And it was very um, uh, robust, uh, the parameter, because when we compared uh, between uh, the AUC high group, uh, we call it AUC, AUC high group and the AUC low group, you can see the AUC high group where the area under card was higher than a certain um, the cutoff, they were actually uh, surviving, all of them were surviving. So now when you uh, look at this age, age classification, um, again, below 67 years, you can see there is significantly high AUC uh, in, the, in the patients who are receiving uh, convalescent plasma in this age group only. But in the other age groups, it was not really that apparent or significant. And as you can expect, the plasma is meant for uh, transferring passively antibodies. So when you um, try to correlate the IgG content of the convalescent plasma with this AUC parameter, you can actually see there is a very nice um, correlation, almost linear correlation between these two. So that tells you that yes, the antibody present in the convalescent plasma is kind of driving a major part of this um, uh, betterment or clinical benefit in this in these uh, patients. And then to uh, find the immunological correlates, we actually looked at 48 different cytokines because the systemic hyperinflammation in COVID-19 is largely characterized by a whole lot of uh, cytokine. I mean, it's a, it's a cytokine deluge in the systemic circulation. It may not be called a cytokine storm compared to the bacterial infections, but still there are uh, major representations of uh, pro-inflammatory -pro cytokines in the plasma, uh, like IL-6 and MCP-1 and things like that. So these are the uh, correlation network. I mean, so we found that these cytokines are actually making modules uh, which are some cytokines are actually more correlated than others. So there are um, inherent modules within the cytokine um, uh, architecture. So we looked at 48 cytokines, then only selected 36 of them, uh, depending on that, or at least 70% of in 70% of patients, this uh, cytokine was detectable in the plasma. And so when you look at these 36 cytokines, you can actually see um, that the, the, and these are, the two uh, arms, so the randomized into two arms. Uh, we, we found that we ended up randomizing um, patients in the CPT, uh, which actually had a much, much higher representation of IL-6 high groups, right? So IL-6 cytokine was much higher. Anyway, so when you go to this uh, our, our second time point, which is third or fourth day, depending on different patients, that means they have already received two plasma or they have not been received so in the SOC group. Uh, and then look back on this cytokine uh, deluge in the plasma, you will find that in, in case of convalescent plasma therapy, there is much higher quelling of the cytokine storm or the hyperinflammation in terms of circulating cytokines presence in the plasma. And that was very interesting. So that told us that CPT is somehow also playing a role by uh, suppressing the, uh, the systemic hyperinflammation. And uh, so we actually uh, derived an uh, index for this coiling of cytokine storm, which is CCS 1.5, at least 1.5 fold uh, cytokine uh, reduction in cytokine in each patient. And uh, so it actually uh, denotes how many cytokines had registered at least 1.5 fold reduction in the, uh, between T1 and T2, right? So uh, day one and day three or, three or four. And then you, can, you don't really find that the, this 
attenuation of the cytokine dilutes is very different between these two age groups. But interestingly, and also in the um, in the below 67 year age group, you actually see that this attenuation of the cytokine deluge is nicely correlated with the tissue oxygenation parameter, which is SFR7 DLUs. But interestingly, in the age group of above 67 years in our cohort, we don't find any such correlation. So that tells you that the CPTs, uh, so the convalescent plasma therapy is doing whatever it's meant to do. It's actually doing also anti-inflammatory function, but the aging lungs in the higher age group patients are not being able to, the tissue response is not being able to, I mean, it's not optimal. So the tissue response is much less. And which is not surprising because it's always known that aging lung actually responds to different kinds of therapy in different clinical contexts um, in a much um, a lower uh, ability or efficacy. And uh, that may be because of, because the damaged lung epithelium is not regenerated properly, maybe because of depleted, depleted stem cells in the aging lung. Anyway, so when we look at this, uh, so we wanted to find out whether both antibody and the cytokine attenuation effect are actually playing a role here. So we did, ran a multivariate regression model, and you can actually see uh, that uh, it, both of them are actually playing a, a nice role. Then we um, we also uh, did a, a proteomic study of the convalescent plasma that was being given with the idea that uh, the convalescent plasma may also have some anti-inflammatory proteins which are circulating in the convalescent individuals. And when you look at that, you find that uh, there are, so we could identify almost more than 200 proteins in the convalescent uh, samples. And uh, you can actually find all the uh, black lines show that they are positively correlated with the cytokine um, uh, reduction. Uh, some are negatively correlated. And that tells you that they, so those negatively correlated ones are anti inflammatory factors. Then we try to find out which are the anti inflammatory factors which are uh, having most wide anti inflammatory role on multiple cytokines. And we actually selected a whole lot of them, a whole lot of proteins. And some of them are very interesting proteins. For example, I'll point out SARPIN D1, SARPIN A1 is actually alpha 1 antitrypsin, which is already um, linked mechanistically with uh, COVID 19 severity. And this is complement factor H. Uh, and uh, so, and also these proteins are not really playing a role just because of abundance, because their median abundance in the convalescent donor's plasma is very much distributed. Okay. Uh, so how much time do I left? Am I Actually, I would like to request you to wind up your uh, finish. Up. Okay. 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 So I'll just, uh, uh, so this is uh, one part of the study has been published. The other one is uh, in preprint and is being reviewed by another journal. And uh, interestingly, uh, very soon after we actually uh, published our preprint, another study in uh, New York City, which was done by Albert Einstein, uh, they also found a similar age subclass based heterogeneity of response in, in response to convalescent plasma therapy in their uh, um, trial where they actually recruited 146 individuals uh, into two arms. They actually found up an age part of 65 years. And uh, they also find that above 65 years, this beneficial effect was again uh, absent. So that's uh, interesting. So it actually tells you that aging long perhaps uh, is a deterrent in convalescent plasma therapy benefits. Maybe that's why uh, a whole lot of uh, clinical trials are actually uh, generating different kinds of data. I'll go back to PLACID trial. But as I said, the PLACID trial, they, are, they were actually recruiting mild ARDS patients, and also they could not um, measure the antibody content of the plasma that they were transfusing with. So that may have um, uh, kind of excluded them from having a benefit to benefit uh, getting the Easter. Uh, very recently, the recovery trial convalescent plasma therapy um, the data has also come out. Uh, again, in the recovery trial, they were again um, recruiting all sorts of patients. Their uh, recruitment criteria was hospitalized patients of any age uh, if they had clinically suspected or laboratory confirmed SARS CoV 2 infection. That means a whole lot of mild disease uh, patients were also included in this analysis. Perhaps that's why, again, the benefits were not registered. So, uh, we are now going through a second wave in the in India. In the first wave, we have seen the most of the severe ARDS patients or moderate ARDS patients were older uh, in age group. And uh, in the second wave, we are seeing a whole lot of young patients uh, who are being affected by ARDS. 
and there is a left shift in the age distribution. And so it it's, uh, it's remains to be seen whether CPT will be more useful in the second wave when more younger patients are getting ERDS. And uh, in my personal reading of the uh, domain, I think the moderate ERDS patients who are not severe, but SpO2, FiO2, FiO2 ratio below, I mean, more than 100, and who are aged less than 65 years, perhaps will benefit from CPT in a low resource setting, because it will actually lead to faster mitigation of hypoxia, will perhaps impart some survival benefit, and also faster discharge freeing up the beds uh, for others to take up. We know we are actually uh, badly uh, lacking on bed availability. So I'll just uh, perhaps end here. Uh, the rest of the things I'm not going to talk about. So we actually could um, identify some of the biomarkers which can predict a disease course in COVID-19 from this same uh, clinical trial data. And so uh, maybe in some other occasion we can, we can discuss about it. Thanks. Thanks, you. Thank you, Dr. Ganguly, for uh, excellent uh, data on plasma therapy i'll just ask one question so uh, this therapy like we have been discussing about different strains uh, like mutated strain so uh, does this uh, plasma therapy affects uh, like a, it affects in a positive way uh, to different like a patient infected with different strains mutated strains of virus yeah, so there are immune escape variants and non-immune escape variants, right? So in case of immune escape variants, uh, so you would expect that the uh, recovered patients with uh, earlier clades or earlier strains, those antibodies will not be that efficient. But I personally believe the, re the reduction in efficacy in the laboratory setting for all these variants may not be applicable in the real life scenario. Perhaps still in the real life scenario, the antibody titers will be enough uh, will reach enough threshold to protect against the variants as well. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we would have seen a whole lot of uh, reinfections with the variants uh, already in the second wave, which we are not seeing. We are we are seeing some of them, but not a lot of them. So that tells you that in a real life scenario, the titers that are reached in real life patients uh, are still enough. Uh, to uh, fight off the variants, but we don't know. We have to, uh, in the laboratory setting, it has been shown that a lot of variants uh, we are not amenable to these older antibodies. Uh, but it remains to be seen. Uh, we'll have to uh, look at other data that will be coming up from the second wave that we are trying to generate. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ganguly. Uh, so, uh, next for the keynote uh, presentation of uh, the second session. It is an uh, honor to introduce and have among us an internationally recognized and highly accomplished scientist in the field of immunology and infectious diseases. So we have uh, Professor Arturo Casadeval, who is currently working as a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology and infectious diseases at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Alfred and Jill Sommer Professor and Chair of the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at John Hopkins University. He, is, uh, he has received his PhD and MD degree from New York University and has received his uh, board certification in internal medicine and infectious diseases. After completing his postdoctoral training in cell biology from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, he subsequently became a professor in medicine, microbiology, and immunology at, at Albert Einstein. Since then, Dr. Kasutival has served as chair professor in many institutions and has been on editorial board of uh, board member and president of many journals and American uh, societies uh, that uh, all the scientists would uh, dream to publish, uh, like uh, uh, JEM infection and immunity. And uh, in fact, he is the uh, he is the founding editor in chief of uh, MBio. And it is actually such a long list of uh, accomplishment that if I start reading out all his uh, uh, all the uh, lines, then probably I'm going to take uh, 15 minutes of his uh, presentation. He is an elected fellow of uh, American Association of Advancement of Science and American Academy of uh, Microbiology, National Academy of Medicine, and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In response to coronavirus disease uh, 2019. 
Dr. Kasadeval is currently pioneering and investigating the use of antibody containing blood serum from patients who have recovered from virus as a passive therapy measure in critical patients. So, Dr. Kasadeval, I welcome you uh, for the keynote presentation of the second session of today's symposium. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarangi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I I got up very early and it was very much worthwhile uh, to listen to all the presentations and to follow Dr. Nguli, who's been very influential uh, with his work. And I'm actually going to be mentioning some of his work. So thank you for inviting me. So I want to begin uh, talking about this with the, from the point of view of the history of immunology. One of the problems in the past year is that the great history of immunology uh, that is, the principles of antibody therapy were largely uh, forgotten. And many of the trials were designed without taking into account uh, the fact that antibody is most effective when given early that you and that you have to give enough of it. So, uh, one of the things that we set out to do was to write out the actual three principles of antibody therapy. These were well known in the past, but were never written down because they were common knowledge. The one is the specificity principle. You must have antibody to the organism that you target. Believe it or not, this has been a problem in some of the trials that there hasn't been enough antibody. The quantitative principle that you must have sufficient antibody to the targeted microbe. And the most difficult one is the temporal principle that one antibody preparations are most effective when given prophylactically on early disease. And this is being known for over 100 years. Here in the bottom, you can see data from 1913 on uh, the recovery of meningococcal meningitis after giving serum. And you could see the big difference in mortality between if you give it in the first three days, if you give it after seven days. So the United States embarked in a major experiment, which was to use convalescent plasma to make it freely available. Uh, during, uh, and since March 2020, half a million patients have been treated in the United States. It, it remains under what we call emergent use authorization, which means that any physician can write for it in hospitalized patients. How did we get here? The uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, created first a program, which is known as the Extended Access Program, I'm gonna, and it generated some of your data. And then that program produced some efficacy data that was used for them to allow the emergency use authorization. Uh, there was also uh, some of the early studies suggested efficacy, but the, the data today is that the observational studies have produced largely positive results and the randomized clinical trials have been mixed. And I'll be covering uh, some of that. And let's try to explain why that may be the case. In the United States, this gives you a sense of the amount of plasma usage. Plasma usage follows the curve. The more cases you have, the more that have been used. But hidden in this data, and I will return to it, has been that physicians in the past few months have been using it less because they have been very influenced by some of the negative randomized clinical trials. And I think that is a mistake, and I will come back to that. So, two major questions everybody wants to know. Is it safe and does it work? So the safety issue was settled early. Uh, and that was uh, thousands of patients were treated here in the United States. And the, the information was that given one unit of plasma was really no toxicity greater than what was known for plasma. There were occasional transfusion reactions. Uh, but in generally, the, the, the more, that is the transfusion related acute lung injury or surgical artery overload were minimal compared to what is even in the literature. So the, the most important thing was that no one has seen the phenomenon of antibody dependent enhancement, which was a major immunological concern at the, be, at the beginning of last year. And that is very important because that uh, means that plasma cleared the way for the vaccines and cleared the way for monoclonal antibodies. Had there been antibody-dependent enhancement, 
it would have been a lot harder to deploy the vaccines that elicited that antibody. So uh, that is a, a part of the story. So the question is, is it working? So there are seven lines of evidence that I'm gonna go through it. Mechanism of action, animal studies, what it's called the extended access program data analysis, greater than 10 observational studies, greater than 10 randomized controlled trials. Here is where the data is mixed, experiments of nature and population data. So is it working? Mechanism of action, well, this is an uh, immunology audience and everybody knows that antibody can neutralize virus. And this has been documented by hundreds of studies and it's been documented in, in randomized clinical trial, including the very important Agarwal et al. trial that was published in the British Medical Journal, that if you give plasma, you reduce the amount of virus. And the question has always, that is not an issue that is for debate. The question is, is that sufficient to be clinically significant? Animal studies. Animal studies have shown that if you give convalescent plasma from an animal or even from humans, uh, that it can uh, be used uh, for treatment. This is an important part of the experimental development of plasma. In this case, many of these experiments have happened after it's been used in humans. So a few words about the extended access uh, protocol. This was what the FDA allowed to be done in the United States between April of last year and, and August and over 100,000 patients were treated, and that data was collected. There is no negative control because everybody was treated. So the question was, if you go into the data, can you find evidence for uh, efficacy? And two major findings. If you give it early, the mortality is lower than if you give it late. So there the control are early and late. And then, but more important for scientists, and I think everyone in this audience will realize this, that in science, a dose response is a very important piece of evidence. And what you can see here is that the patients who got uh, doses with high antibody were less likely to die than those that got low doses with antibody. And uh, this was roughly about a 35% reduction in mortality. So uh, this we, we published this in the New England Journal of Medicine in January. This was Primarily done at the Mayo Clinic, Michael Joyner was uh, the lead author. And it's been confirmed by a smaller study that was done in Israel that it's the idea of a dose response. And a, a large study from Argentina that is still in preprint that has not been published, looking at 4,000 patients, again shows that if you give it early, mortality is much later, much lower than if you give it late. Now, the the extended access program database here in the United States has been has been a bit controversial. So the issue of safety has not been uh, uh, has been accepted, but the issue of efficacy has been more controversial. And the problem is that physicians are not used to looking at dose response data. They are basically looking at randomized control trials, and so there has been less unanimous acceptance. And for many physicians, the, not having a control group made it difficult to evaluate the data. So observational studies, lots of these, most of them are positive. The first one was done in Mount Sinai Hospital. I should say that this, there were, this were preceded by studies from China su suggesting uh, efficacy in, in Chinese patients. Here in the United States, we have the one from just to show you two of these so from Mount Sinai Hospital, that if given early, uh, before people get intubated, there was a, a difference in survival. And probably the, the uh, test the study was done at Methodist Hospital in Houston. And what you can see is that if you give it within three days, there is a big difference in mortality. If you give it after three days, there is no difference. Uh, uh, again, and what they were able to do was able to identify a critical 44 hour window for plaque administration. Now, think about it. When people get admitted to the hospital, it's going to be like a normal distribution. Some people are very sick, some are not so sick. So, what this is just a, a proxy for earlier in, the, in therapy. But I think the, the take home message is consistent with all that we know, including 
going back to Flexner in, in, in 1913. Therapy is most effective if given early. So randomized control trials. So here is where the issue has been more. There are now, as of last night, I, there were at least 12 uh, out there. And if you can begin to, about nine in 12 of them had, had fewer deaths, but most of no significance because they were not power for significance. Four out of four have clearly documented viral uh, clearance, but we don't know whether that's significant. Uh, six out of 12 have shown clinical improvement, but the problem with clinical improvement is that it can be subjective. And two of 12 reported no benefit, including the very influential recovery study that was done uh, in, in the United Kingdom. So I think let's look at, at, at six of these randomized controlled trials, once life for each. Uh, I wanna you know, congratulate my Indian colleagues because India has been at the forefront of generating very, very important data in this uh, pandemic. And we are all learning from one another uh, and we're having to work that would have taken decades has now been compressed into one year. And it's no surprising that some, some studies are gonna come in positive and some negative because in fact, we're learning a lot of the variables. Learning. So the first one is the Agarwal et al. Indian inpatient study. This was the first randomized controlled trial. It was completed by last September. There was uh, no effect in mortality. There was a, a symptomatic improvement and plasma was shown as an antiviral. Now, people were very disappointed by the lack of mortality. But I will say to you is, this the plasma worked as well as remdesivir. Remdesivir has never been shown to have an effect on mortality. And yes, it is a, it's an accepted part of, of therapy, at least here in the United States, it's been approved. Then uh, Dr. Ganguly uh, discussed uh, the the uh, the Ray et al. study, which I, I think is extremely, extremely well done and influential. Uh, again, very interesting. Uh, the subgroup analysis show that the younger patients more likely to benefit. Now, it may not be age. It may be simply that the disease progresses slower when you're younger. So what appears to be is that the patients who were greater than 67 were sicker uh, when they were treated. But the other uh, really, really important work that, that came from that is that we have evidence for the mechanism. And that the mechanism of action appears to be in modulation of inflammation. What kills people with COVID is inflammation. And plasma is uh, through mo multiple mechanisms that was covered by Dr. Ganguly and others uh, in the symposium uh, has, uh, has uh, anti-inflammatory properties possibly that in, through vi antiviral mechanisms and others. So then is the Argentine. Argentina produces two really important studies. Uh, one of them is very early treatment. These are people who are elderly, likely to get into trouble, uh, treated within 36 hours, and they get an effect of about 60 to 70%. That is, plasma stops progression of the disease. I understand that in Argentina, people that are over 65 are now being treated with this as outpatients. Uh, and they again see evidence of a dose response. People who get high tidal plasma do better than those who don't. And then they also published an, an uh, in-hospital study uh, in which they see no difference in mortality, similar to the Agarwal uh, results. Uh, there is a hint that convalescent plasma helps, but you know, a lot of this is late treatment. And if the other thing, problem here is that, that be, no fault of their own, when you do a, a small number of patients, randomization doesn't necessarily work very well. And they ended up with more sicker patients in the, in the convalescent plasma group. So recovery is the big uh, one that has influenced a lot of doctors. It's the largest trial. It's open label using tighter plasma. They find no mortality difference. They, but the number itself tells you how sick this cohort was, because they having 25% mortality, 24%. Uh, this uh, was a relatively sick group, uh, and 93% of the patients were taking steroids. Now, this is an immunology conference. 
what do steroids do to antibody function? If you look at the subgroup analysis, you can see at the very bottom that, it, that there was a suggestion that those who are not on steroids were more likely uh, to benefit. Those who were not receiving oxygen were more likely to benefit. And, and again, they see a hint that if you treat early, you are more likely to get a benefit. Uh, the concern that steroids interfere with antibodies. Well, there is an enormous literature in immunology that antibodies, steroids inhibit phagocytosis, inhibit ADCC, complement activation, and downregulate FC receptors. Now, people say, but as steroids are now standard of care. I say, that's okay. It may be that if you're going to use them both, giving the plasma first, and then the steroids may be okay, because antibody works very quickly. Whereas steroids first and plasma later may be more of a problem because the steroids end up shutting a lot of the uh, of the ways in which antibodies work. This is a paper that is in preprint form, is in review, and will hopefully be out soon from Colombia, Brazil. So um, this is a randomized, double-blinded control trial using regular plasma in the control. Very well done. In contrast to recovery. There is, they found a, a about a 40% reduction in mortality with administration of plasma. So what you see now is that the randomized clinical trials are coming in. They're coming in, some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Uh, and um, clearly what it's sh showing you is that we don't understand all the variables. But positive data is very diff difficult to ignore. If you do an experiment and you get a negative result, all you know is that you got a negative result. You can't conclude the experiment, the, the process didn't work. And that is a very important thing when thinking about uh, these clinical trials. Uh, there is now in, uh, hundreds of cases of immunosuppressed compromised patients treated with, uh, with, with plasma. This is an important part of the story because these are like knockouts. You basically have B cell defects. If you get COVID, you cannot clear it. If you give them plasma, they allow clearance. The, uh, the problem is that these are isolated cases, so you're not going to get a randomized controlled trial. But here, an Italian group managed to get seven of them. And what you can see is that the, the administration of plasma, which is the arrow, lead lead to, to clearance of the of the. So you see the 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 efficacy of plasma working as an antiviral. So if you begin to put all this data together, uh, this is a paper, everything, everything in COVID is obsolete by the time it gets published because things are happening so quickly. So this trial, which I don't think has been published, or this study that we carried out with the Mayo Clinic, it, you can see that most of the studies are on the right-hand part of the, of the graph. And the reason for that is that, so most of them are showing efficacy, not all reach significance, but when you look at it in the big picture, it does reflect that, that people tend to benefit with plasma. So what are the potential causes for, for randomized uh, control uh, differences from the observational? One, one possibility is observational bias. This is why we do randomized control trials. But, it, but it's, it could also work the other way. Some people don't like plasma. <laughs> and yet, most of these tend to be in the direction of benefit. Uh, the mortality reduction benefits are usually found in subgroup analysis. When people go back into the data and look at who got treated early, many of the randomized controlled trials include sicker patients, while the observational studies separate versus early versus late. Some randomized controlled trials have used suboptimal plasma. Early in the epidemic, the, the tests were not there. People had to just take what was available. This is very common in epidemics. The same thing happened during the Ebola crisis in West Africa. You simply don't have the means when you first start to test as you need to. Uh, many of the randomized controlled trials were designed without the benefit of observational data that efficacy requires early use of high tidal plasma. And one data, one piece of data that I wanna make you aware because this is something that we could affect right now is this study that is in preprint form. Uh, this is follow up from that 100,000 patients that were studied in the United States. They were able, since they know where the patients were and you know where the plasma came, you could look and ask the question, does location matter? 
And the amazing thing is, yes, plasma seemed to lose efficacy of, of, of in the United States when it was collected more than 150 miles from where it was used. Uh, and many of the randomized controlled trials have set up a national repository. So what the implications of this is that in a big country like India, what's, what's the plasma of one, one part of the country may not be as effective as the one that is locally. And that makes perfect sense because we know that every community already has some variants. And that even though we're measuring only neutralization, a lot of the other epitopes may be very important. So I think that what this means is that if one is going to use plasma, local plasma is better than distant plasma. So what happened in the United States? Well, the the, the doctors embrace plasma, but they mean very influenced by the negative studies. And we have been trying to counteract this, uh, and I'll show you some of the consequences of this. Uh, the country response has been highly variable. Some countries allow the use only randomized controlled trials. Others, like the United States, are being freely allowing it to use. There has been little guidance from committees because they're usually used to dealing only with randomized controlled trial data, and in which case it's been mixed. Uh, local hospitals uh, guidelines in the United States predominate, but there is highly variable usage panic. If you go to New York City, one hospital is using plasma on everyone. If you go to another hospital, they basically say, well, you know, we, we're not using it because of the randomized controlled trials. So uh, I can tell you that the month of May is likely to bring a lot of information. We have two randomized control trials at Hopkins. One has been, now been completed and the data has been analyzed. But here we anticipate that there may be a lot of new data in the next few weeks. I warn you though, I suspect the data is gonna be a repetition of what I'm showing you, which is there is gonna be positives and there are gonna be negatives. And there is gonna be, and this is complex therapy. Uh, and the question, and I want to show you what happened in the United States. So I show you before that plasma usage followed the number of cases. But when you look at the usage of plasma per admission, it's been going down. So in, in October, 40% of all the patients were treated with plasma. Today, about 10% are treated with plasma. And mortality is going up. So if you look at a population level, you can see a negative correlation, uh, an inverse correlation. The more plasma that gets used, the lower the mortality. And we are estimating, and the preprint is there, you can read it, that in the United States there has been 30,000 excess deaths from the retreat from plasma. And uh, when this data, I can tell you that this preprint has been out for about 10 days, and plasma usage has already began to rise again. So just to, uh, uh, this is an immunology talk, I don't, you know how antibodies work. Lots of, of effects by which they could be doing this. Uh, convalescent plasma is a highly heterogeneous uh, product. Um, this was documented early in the pandemic. This is our studies here. Uh, but the important thing is every unit is different. Every unit has different neutralization, complement activation, ADCC, and phagocytic uh, capacity. Um, so, in generally, the neutralizing titer is what you is what is being correlated with efficacy. But it's important to know that we haven't correlated the other activities yet, and it may be possible that some of the other things are more important than neutralization titer. Um, this is uh, the work from Dr. Ganguly's lab, uh, which are very very influential because we have more of a mechanism. We know that it reduces titer, but we also know that it's reducing. Uh, that is changing the inflammatory constellation in these patients. The patients with COVID died of, of, of inflammation. Plasma reduces inflammation. You have a mechanism of action. And, the, and this is an early study from Mount Sinai in which they use C-reactive protein, which is just a single marker, and pretty much the results are the same. So convalescent plasma ha may have very different uh, results when used early or late. If you give it early, you give it an antiviral uh, that uh, to stop the infection. If you use it late, less evidence that it functions, but there are some studies out there suggesting that even late patients can benefit and it may be functioning primarily as a modulating immune function. Although there is also evidence that the first antibodies that you make are not very good. Whereas the antibodies that you make in the convalescent period are better. 
So even when people have antibody and they get convalescent plasma, they often clear uh, the virus. So the summary of available data is that it's been associated with viral load, reduced viral load, reduced inflammation, reduced respiratory demand. And when you put all this together in a percentage of individuals, this improves survival. Uh, in the United States, we finally got some guidelines about a month and a half ago. Uh, and the guidelines are the obvious. If you're gonna use it, make sure that it has antibody. And two, that it's most effective if used thoroughly. There are also guidelines emerged, European Commission, uh, even after recovery, suggested that early transfusion with high titer neutralizing antibodies, and Brazil has put out um, guidelines, again, uh, suggesting high neutralizing antibodies and within 72 hours of symptom onset. So everyone is gravitating to this, that if you're gonna use it, use it. So the situation today is that convalescent plasma in the United States is available. Some co other countries are using it greatly. I'm at 11 o'clock my time. I'm gonna have a call with Uruguay. Uh, we're discussing how they're using it over there. Uh, the emergence of variants highlights the challenges to vaccines for new possibilities from plasma. Uh, convalescent plasma has cleared the way for monoclonals and, and vaccines. There have been no major antibody dependent enhancement concerns. Numerous randomized trial, clinical trials underway. I think we're gonna learn a lot more, but it, but I think expect the knowledge to be gradual. Don't expect that there'll be one trial that says, ah, we know how to do it, because this is complicated disease and this is a complicated therapy and we're learning how to use it. Um, but physicians and patients need to be aware that the efficacy of plasma is dependent on tighter amount and physicians need to give it early and to seek early care. So going forward, we face five epidemics in the first 20 years of the 21st century. For each of these epidemics, plasma was used or considered. When the next epidemic occurs, there we will be using plasma again. And I think the most one of the important lessons that we learned from this pandemic is that medical memory is not doesn't last very long. And that what we need to have for the next time we do this is off the shelf randomized controlled trials and that these need to incorporate the three principles of antibody therapy, need for specificity, enough quantity, and early use. So my last word uh, is my the closing words. For convalescent plasma, positive data cannot be easily dismissed. Negative data can be explained. Uh, the key to success, I think, is to follow the principles, uh, that to give plasma that has anti sufficient antibody that has antibody and to use it as early as possible. We need to figure out how to make this work because we, we're gonna be dealing with COVID probably for a while and plasma remains relatively safe, cheap, and it's available wherever there are recovered patients. And it's the only agent that keeps up with the variants. If you have somebody with variant uh, COVID who recovers, you have variant plasma and you could use it uh, to treat other. And the important thing is that the math is in the positive direction. One person who donates can treat two or three, two or three other patients. Uh, so I think that as immunologists, as physicians, that we need to, to continue to try to make this uh, work and to try to understand it because uh, humanity, this is a therapy that is available everywhere for humanity and, uh, and it could potentially save a lot of lives. Thank you very much. So I got to stop sharing. Figure out. There we go. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Casadevall. It was uh, indeed a very informative uh, presentation, and especially following Dr. Ganguly's talk, it was uh, uh, as we could understand and uh, get more information out of it. And in fact, I had a question for Ganguly, Dr. Ganguly, whether uh, it, the time matters when it is going to be uh, uh, like a given to the patient and because of time constraint i did not ask and in fact your presentation made it uh, very clear uh, that uh, how time is uh, dependent on the efficacy of uh, plasma therapy so we would uh, like to take uh, some more questions from the uh, participants may i ask one question please uh... 
Good morning, uh, Dr. Kasadeva. Yeah. Uh, so my question is whether um, this age-based classification and post-hoc subclass analysis uh, you have been doing on the uh, other other trials as well. For example, the recovery trial they have done it, but again uh, that was a very mixed up mixed up result. But in your um, uh, RCTs that you are concluding. Are you also having pre-specified subclass analysis based on age? Uh, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think that it's, uh, it was not pre-specified because we did not know about that beforehand. But let me tell you my own view. My own view is that this idea that you should only believe pre-specified stuff to me that's not the way we do science. You know, you should look. Okay, you should look. You have data there. You look at it, and this idea that that, it, that if you put it down before you begin the trial is more valuable than if you find it afterwards. I don't know where that came from, but I I rebel against it. I think that we will do we will do the analysis that you suggest, which I think I think both you and Lizanne Porowski study in New York had the same result, but Lizanne has gone thinks that it may be two factors. One, that the disease goes faster in the elderly. So you're just basically further along, so less likely to work. And the other thing is that she had a lot more steroids in the elderly, probably because they were sicker. Okay, I got it. But we will do, we will do the subgroup analysis and we don't have a problem with subgroup analysis. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, I'll uh, ask one more question. So during our presentation, there was a, like a thing that came up that uh, presence of uh, antibodies to interferons uh, in some plasma could uh, interfere in efficiency. So do you have any particular strategy to include like a, which plasma you would uh, use for treatment or therapy and which not? So, uh, so I'm aware of that data. That data has now been available since last summer. And I think just to remind everyone, the finding is that among severely ill patients, a, a small minority has antibodies to interfere on. I don't know if that's clinically significant. We, we're all immunologists. If you know very well that we all have autoimmune antibodies, and if you now rev up the immune system with massive inflammation, you're going to get some antibodies to DNA, to histones, things like that. Uh, to me, causality has not been established. This is an association. But we are not too worried about it because we, we are basically taking plasma from people who recovered. That, and so they recovered. They, so if they had some of those antibodies, they probably are a very low amount. And two, remember the plasma is diluted about 15-fold when you give it to a patient. This is why you need to use high titer. These antibodies are generally found in low titer. They're found in, in uh, they're there. So I think we need to take it seriously, but I think that the overwhelming clinical evidence doesn't, is not, doesn't suggest that this is a, a, big, a big problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying uh, our doubts. And, uh, Thank you very much for your valuable time. I know it's uh, like you have to wake up very early for the symposium. It was worth are... it. <laughs> <laughs> we are really it grateful was worth it. to be a part of our symposium. So oh, thank you. I... Thank you for having me. And it was a pleasure to to meet all of you and to meet Dr. Ganguly, uh, which I greatly admire your work. Thank you so much, Professor Kasarov. So uh, we'll move on to the uh, last speaker of uh, today's symposium, who is Dr. Uh, Amarendra Kumar. Uh, he is currently working as a research uh, scientist at the Department of Pathology, uh, Ohio State University, USA. He has received his PhD in biotechnology from IGIB, New Delhi, and his postdoctoral training from Vanderbilt University, US, uh, where he also worked as a research instructor. His research interests include genomics, microbial, and cancer immunology. His research focuses on understanding development and function of innate-like T cells and mucosal-associated invariant T cells in autoimmunity, infectious diseases, and cancer. Dr. Kumar is also involved in various COVID-19-associated research work in partnership with industries, 
primarily to develop immunomodulatory compounds to mitigate COVID-19 associated hyperinflammation. Further, Dr. Kumar is also participating in various multi-centering collaborative efforts to understand immune responses induced by COVID-19 vaccines in cancer patient. So let's hear from Dr. Kumar. Uh, uh, Dr. Kumar, please uh, deliver your lecture. Okay, so my screen here. Uh, I hope you all can see my, uh, okay. Yes, please. Uh, start. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, as visible. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Pranita, for uh, for the introduction, for the kind introduction. Um, and a very good evening to all of you. I know I am the last speaker uh, before you guys uh, go to retire, so so I'm not going to uh, take uh, much of your time. Uh, also, uh, although as Dr. Pranita informed you, I have been working uh, on uh, several COVID projects. Uh, I won't be pre presenting any uh, any of my data today because uh, there is industry collaboration involved and and the work uh, is still in progress. We hope that we will be publishing soon, and and you might uh, you know uh, get to read them uh, very soon. Uh, however, I took this opportunity to kind of uh, learn a little bit more about uh, a COVID-19 associated cytokine storm and certain strategies that are uh, you know, in, in, in progress uh, you know, to combat it because it seems it's, it's extremely important uh, that we uh, you know, contain the cytokine uh, associated parameters uh, uh, to kind of contain COVID and, and also uh, associated uh, long-term effects. Um, so uh, basically, uh, cytokine storm uh, is, is a constitutional uh, definition. It, it contains, uh, you know, uh, a group of symptoms, uh, and there is uh, a systemic inflammation, and that leads to uh, a kind of uh, a multi organ dysfunction. And if it is not treated or if there is no therapeutic intervention, then it leads to multi organ uh, failure and, and death of the host. Uh, there are a wide range of clin clinical and uh, laboratory abnormalities that can be observed in cytokine storm. However, uh, elevated uh, circulating cytokine levels, uh, acute systemic uh, inflammatory symptoms, and, and, and secondary organ dysfunction that are often related renal, hepatic, or pulmonary are the common uh, features uh, in involved. And you know, after initial uh, debate, it's now pretty much uh, you know widely accepted. That cytokine storm is is also associated with COVID-19 uh, mortalities uh, that that are uh, happening. Uh, PowerPoint is hanging. Sorry, uh, I can see the PowerPoint is not moving forward. Can you see it moving? No, actually, it is uh, still in cytokine storm slide. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you know the the, the origin of cytokine storm terms uh, or, uh, cytokine storm was you know coined to explain uh, you know uh, graph, the features of graft versus host disease and and in this context uh, it, the the primary cytokine involved was interleukin one but subsequently uh, uh, you know it was known that cytokine uh, storm is associated with uh, with iatrogenic uh, you know it, it can be triggered by iatrogenic factors. Uh, that is induced by, you know, CAR T cell therapy um, and other uh, other drugs. Uh, cytokine storm is also associated with several, uh, you know, pathogens such as bacterial sepsis and Epstein-Barr virus, uh, you know, associated hematophagocytic uh, lymphohistocytosis, uh, uh, etc. Also, uh, you know, cytokine storm uh, is features of several of the monogenic or autoimmune uh, disorders such as primary HLH uh, or autoinflammatory uh, symptoms. Uh, I think it's important to uh, make a note here that uh, although cytokine storm is easily identifiable in, in, in you know, uh, in, in uh, you know, its elevated levels in the absence of pathogens, the line between a normal and the dis, uh, dysregulated uh, response to severe infection is blurry, uh, especially considering that uh, some of the cytokines actually play a role in clearing the, uh, uh, the pathogen or the infection. Um, so, uh, during infection, uh, uh, that the host recognizes uh, uh, pathogens, which leads to recruitment of, of uh, pro, uh, uh, you know, inflammatory mediators and 
and pro-inflammatory cytokine responses, including interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. And this inflammatory response leads to pathogen clearance, uh, thus allowing uh, for, for the host immune homeostasis to return to normal. Uh, in some individuals, though, uh, the, path uh, the pathogen proliferate, and, and that triggers a hypercytokinemia that leads to tissue damage and potentially uh, death to the host. As you can see here, uh, there is a pro-inflammatory phase uh, wherein uh, cytokines like TNF and IL-1 are induced, followed by interleukin-6, and, and there's an anti-inflammatory phase where, where these cytokines, some of which kind of, uh, um, kind of um, uh, um, uh, get rid of, uh, of these pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, or their uh, you know, circulating levels uh, are induced. Uh, but in some uh, minority of subjects uh, who, who are you know, showing severe symptoms uh, associated with COVID-19, uh, the pro-inflammatory phase can go on and, and even though there's, uh, you know, the anti-inflammatory anti cytokines are being detected in the circulation, uh, the high levels of these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, can cause, uh, you know, cytokine-associated uh, symptoms. Uh, so, uh, both viral and, and, and host factors uh, uh, can affect uh, timing of interferon gamma response. Uh, uh, I mean, if there is a low viral dose, uh, then, then IF and gamma can be induced early, and that leads to uh, very, very efficient uh, clearance of the virus, and there is mild disease. However, high viral load, or you know, individuals who are immunocompromised or older host, uh, the, the if interferon gamma response is delayed, and that leads to uh, viral persistence and inflammation. Uh, you know, when IF and gamma response is insufficient to control uh, initial viral uh, replication, then late onset interferon gamma can cause uh, severe inflammation and, and lead to lung injury. Uh, so uh, there's one publication that I have not put here, and, and you know, it just came out from China, where they have uh, done you know, single cell sequencing of millions of cells, and, and then they reported that the major uh, players in the cytokine storm uh, were probably macrophages and megakaryocytes. Uh, and I know throughout the day, you must have seen this car cartoon and, and this pathway repeatedly, so I'm not going to go into details, but I just put it here uh, to give an idea that, uh, you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, probably uh, can trigger multiple uh, PAMPs and, and, and damped pathways uh, leading to uh, enhanced inflammation and secretion of uh, inflammatory cytokines that are associated uh, with cytokine storm. Um, so uh, this table describes uh, types of cytokine storm uh, and the causes and, and the major pathological cellular or, or cytokine drivers. And it's extremely important to determine what are the major pathological cellular and cytokine drivers because that determines uh, the, the, the therapeutic approaches. And, and for COVID-19, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few, few examples. This is still a uh, you know, work in progress uh, and, 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 and uh, some therapies are being tried, uh, you know, taking lessons from, from the previous uh, cytokine storm, uh, and, and we hope that uh, better strategies can be developed in future. Uh, you can see here, although there are different uh, parameters associated with different uh, kinds of cytokine storm, there are, there may, the major players, uh, you know, seem to be interleukin-6, IL-1-beta, TNF-alpha, uh, you know, uh, innate like cells like macrophages and, and, and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, and uh, as I just mentioned, it, it, it's extremely uh, important to identify key players uh, and, and define cellular and, and you know, um, uh, cytokine parameters associated with cytokine storm. This paper by uh, Robert Carriccio et al. Uh, kind of uh, is an attempt in the same direction. So there, is, uh, uh, there are two forms of cytokine storm. Uh, I mean, the 2004 HLH criteria and H, H score and, and macrophage um, um, uh, macrophage act activating uh, 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 syndrome uh, have rely on very well uh, defined, uh, uh, well established criteria to, to uh, uh, define uh, occurrence of cytokine storm. So there were earlier studies, uh, I forgot to put the reference here again, uh, that showed that, uh, uh, you know, COVID-19 cytokine, as, uh, you know, could not be classified according to the two 2016 uh, MAS uh, classification criteria. And in, in this publication, uh, Carriccio et al. found 
that COVID, uh, you know, cytokine storm also does not meet the 2004 HLH criteria and its score. So they go on to propose a new predictive criteria for uh, uh, defining uh, COVID-19 associated cytokine storm. And, you know, I just flashed this uh, slide, uh, you know, I'm not presenting uh, to you all the clinical parameters because, uh, you know, I want to focus on the immunology and also I'm not a clinician, but, but for, for those who are interested in getting the clinical details uh, may, uh, kind of uh, go and uh, study, read this article. Uh, however, you know, um, um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so, so uh, also, uh, you know, so the other point that I want to make was that this is, uh, uh, I think, still in progress. And even according to the uh, author's admission, uh, it, this study needs to be followed with a larger sample size. So another study, uh, uh, you know, uh, th this is a meta-analysis, uh, and 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 a literature search was done to collect cytokine levels uh, from patients upon infection with viral pathogens that, that are mentioned here. And patient data was used uh, to highlight uh, the conserved and unique cytokine responses uh, caused by the viruses. And yellow uh, here, uh, you know, indicates increase of of these cytokines uh, in in more more often than not in those studies. Uh, and green is 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 mixed results. Uh, as you can see here, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has has different parameters. For instance, it's not associated with uh, elevated levels of uh, IL-12. Uh, I, I mean, uh, IFM gamma. I mean, there are mixed reports here. Interleukin-10, interleukin-2, and IFM gamma are uh, sometimes associated uh, with with uh, SARS-CoV-2 associated uh, severity, uh, and in, in some studies they are not. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, these studies would be followed up and, and, and of course, there might already be some more studies that might have come up uh, that, that are, you know, uh, trying to better define the COVID-19 uh, associated cytokine storm. Um, and so how do we uh, tackle that problem? And actually, uh, the field has taken up this challenge. And as this graph shows to you that, you know, beginning from March, immunomodulators have been dominating the clinical trial landscape. And I think uh, the effect of the initial trial with dexamethasone probably uh, provided some, some early kind of uh, uh, enthusiasm and motivation. And, and then, uh, you know, you just heard uh, neutralizing antibody and, and the convale uh, convalescent uh, therapies, uh, you know, that, that also have been uh, kind of increasing, uh, you know, increasingly being tried and tested, and they also have uh, immunomodulatory role at, as, uh, as the earlier two presenters uh, just discussed. So, uh, you know, as corticosteroids uh, have been used at, as anti-inflammatory agents in several different cytokine storms, uh, and for instance, uh, dexamethasone uh, shows some effect uh, in patients, uh, you know, receiving uh, ventilation and oxygen support, but not without it. And also, as we just heard, there are other, uh, you know, um, you know, side effects associated with corticosteroids. So, so again, uh, you know, uh, the, since uh, interleukin six and IL one, uh, as, as I mentioned, are are some of the key cytokines associated with uh, a different uh, kind of cytokine star, and their levels were also found to be consistently elevated in COVID nineteen patients. Uh, their the inhibitors uh, have been tried, such as. Uh, you know, IL-6 inhibitor, uh, tocilizumab and, and uh, sarilizumab, uh, they have been, again, uh, kind of uh, mixed results. Uh, you know, um, a few studies have suggested, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, that uh, they might be uh, kind of preventing uh, some individuals uh, from developing a severe form of disease. Uh, in COVID-19 space, apparently, uh, at least, uh, in, uh, you know, interleukin-1 uh, inhibition seems to be showing better results than interleukin-6. And, and uh, you know, the suggestions are that because uh, IL-1 is upstream and it will also control the production of interleukin-6. Therefore, the effects are more pronounced. So, so there are other, you know, therapies that are being tried and, and uh, you know, aerosolized type 1 gammas because they are the ones that are associated with uh, uh, you know, viral clearance. Uh, this is very exhaustive, and I'm just showing you uh, uh, another slide to show. You. I mean, this is very, very uh, old slide. Again, uh, it's not a kind of possible to put all the clinical trials, but you can see here that there have there are you know number of clinical trials that are ongoing and about to complete, and and they will probably bring better picture about 
the effectiveness of you know treating with uh, individual cytokines but it appears that uh, there may have to be uh, you know some sort of a cohort specific or at least individual specific uh, you know uh, criteria uh, that requires to be built and and based on which you know you know individuals are supposed to be uh, administered with uh, different uh, you know cytokine inhibitors or or combination therapies uh, i want to kind of spend uh, a couple of minutes on 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 on, on the effectiveness of blocking uh, and kind of uh, using a soluble cd24 uh, that's the that study that I'm associated with, uh, you know, uh, so normally uh, dams are uh, attenuate uh, pro-inflammatory TLR signaling by forming a ternary uh, uh, complex with uh, uh, sialylated uh, CD24 and, 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 and SIGLEC G uh, in, in mice or SIGLEC 10 in, in, in humans. And this, uh, you know, CD24, SIGLEC G10 and, and, and damped axis uh, you know, they, they kind of uh, control inflammation. During bacterial infections, it was found that, uh, you know, uh, sialidases that are released from the bacteria kind of they cleave this uh, interaction between CD24 and, and uh, SIGLEC G, and that leads to uh, enhanced uh, production of inflammatory cytokines. And sialidase inhibitors were then uh, found to be effective in controlling the inflammation. And there's one example here, uh, as you can see in uh, sequel uh, ligation, uh, uh, ligation puncture induced sepsis model, uh, the absence of CD24 and SIGLEC G kind of enhances mortality of the mice. Uh, you know, so only 70%, uh, sorry, 70% of the mice uh, that are wild type uh, have both CD24 and C uh, SIGLEC uh, G. Uh, they have, uh, they survive. They survive, however, almost 100% of the mice that, that lack either CD24 or CD24 die. There is no difference in the bacterial uh, load in the, in the blood. However, as you can see here, the inflammatory cytokines uh, uh, are, are significantly, significantly higher in the CD24 knockout or CD24 knockout. So there is a company uh, in, you know, known as Oncoimmune that has developed a soluble form of CD24 uh, where uh, the extracellular fraction is uh, from uh, kind of uh, CD24, uh, uh, human, human CD24 extracellular domain and, and, and uh, you know, uh, IgG, uh, human IgG uh, FC uh, fragment have been fused. Uh, and, and it's been shown that CD, this uh, soluble CD24 FC interact with uh, SIGLEC uh, 10 or G and, and damps and then suppresses damp-induced uh, inflammation. And it's been shown uh, to confer protection in mouse models of BRAS versus host diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, and, and other models of autoimmunity. Uh, and it's actually in, in, in clinical trial in several of these auto, uh, uh, you know, autoimmune diseases as well as in cancers. Um, uh, so it also protects uh, you know, uh, mice from developing severe uh, pneumonitis. Uh, so, so in here, uh, uh, monkeys are infected with simian uh, immunodeficiency uh, virus, and once mo monkeys develop signs of disease, uh, they were randomly divided into you know two groups: one that received normal saline and one that received CD24. Uh, as you can see here, five of the uh, uh, of six monkeys uh, who re uh, received normal saline developed severe uh, you know uh, accumulation of cells in the lungs, while only two of the six in the CD24 FCT did. Uh, you know, group uh, show uh, some accumulation of cells in the lungs, four of them are kind of show normal profile. And also you see the survival parameters here, uh, almost five of them kind of, uh, you know, go on to survive while, while here. Uh, I mean, survival parameters are also different. Uh, uh, CD24FC uh, as a non-antiviral uh, uh, immunomodulator uh, uh, in COVID-19 treatment, uh, has been tested, and as I just mentioned, uh, I'm associated with this study, and, and this study, the, the, we are trying to understand the immune parameters that are altered in COVID-19 uh, in, in patients that uh, receive, uh, you know, soluble CD24 FC uh, through intravenous, in, just one intravenous injection. Um, so we heard about, uh, you know, uh, there's another process that is, uh, you know, being uh, tried, uh, tried uh, which is to cytokine removal by uh, blood blood purification. Uh, you know, continuous uh, renal replacement therapy uh, as a type of uh, hemofiltration or uh, hemo 
dye filtration method uh, has been shown to be beneficial in, in, in removing inflammatory uh, you know, molecules uh, from circulation. Uh, however, more recently, use of sorbent technologies uh, such as cytosorb uh, heme adsorption have attracted much attention. And you know, uh, it's being uh, it's probably a standard of care in 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 in, in the field of cancer in, in patients that develop a cytokine storm uh, during the, the CAR T cell therapy or, or adoptive T cell transfers. Another approach that is that is uh, you know uh, I mean we just heard that convalescent plasma therapy. Uh, can also kind of down modulate uh, some of the inflammatory parameters and uh, you know therapeutic plasma exchange uh, you know there, there are studies that are trying uh, therapeutic plasma exchange where uh, you know fresh frozen plasma from donors are uh, are used and that also is kind of showing some effect in cleansing uh, you know you know the the cytokines from the circulation of the patients that go on to uh, develop serious uh, severe uh, covid symptoms so, uh, in summary, uh, studies have shown that impaired uh, responses of type 1 uh, gamma in early stages of COVID-19 infection play a major role in development of cytokine storm. There are other factors like genetic and, and uh, you know, host or, or pathogen associated that might, uh, you know, result in uh, enhanced inflammation and cytokine storm, but one of the key is, is late onset of type 1 interferon. Um, so much of the mortality is associated with cytokine storm syndrome in patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19 pneumonia. And it's extremely important to, to define COVID-19 cytokine storm uh, to be able to design uh, you know, therapeutic intervention because we have seen in another study that some of the patients uh, you know, who, who uh, actually recover uh, you know, after reaching the severe st stage of COVID-19 they still have high circulating level of cert certain uh, COVID-19, I mean, cytokine storm associated cytokines, which may have long term implications uh, as those uh, cytokines might cause, uh, you know, other uh, pathologies such as diabetes and uh, other, uh, you know, complications associated with, uh, with the heart. Uh, and there is a vast array of anti inflammatory therapies that are being explored to dampen cytokine uh, syndrome to save lives. And I, I think there is hope. That uh, it, through through to the uh, treatment of cytokine, uh, you know, um, utilization utilization of cytokines, uh, the cytokine storm and and the severe COVID, uh, you know, severe COVID uh, nineteen associated symptoms can be controlled and and benefit uh, several of the patients. So with that, I would like to thank you all, and and I'm now uh, ready for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amarendra, for a nice uh, presentation. So, uh, you mentioned that uh, um, there is a, like macrophages play a very important role in uh -huh. uh, this uh, COVID-19 driven cytokine storm or the ARDs that mm -hmm. particular uh, means mechanism we have known about sepsis and cytokine storm. Are they exactly uh, can be implicated in uh, COVID-19 driven uh, hyperinflammatory response, or there could be specific uh, kind of uh, mediator or cellular changes? Uh, if, if people are like, uh, if you are aware that you uh, could mention, means like so a like, specific uh, macrophage phenotype or any particular mediators to be specific. Yeah, so looks like, uh, you know, uh, like I just mentioned, interleukin-6, interleukin-1, TNF, in, and, and IFM gamma, uh, you know, are supposed to be the key uh, cytokines that are, uh, you know, upregulated in multiple studies. Uh, and uh, regarding the cellular mediators, I think it's not yet very clear, although I just mentioned to you a study from China. Uh, that that kind of did a massive uh, single cell sequencing of uh, a billion and a half you know cells from probably probably 200 uh, individuals or something, and they came to this conclusion that macrophages are one of the key players. Megakaryocytes uh, also play a role, but some of the structural cells can also play a role you know, in promoting the inflammation in the recruitment of the macrophages. 
to the lungs and 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 you know uh, stimulating them so i mean that is something which is being investigated uh, you know uh, in the clinics particularly uh, the clinical parameters and stuff like that as i just uh, showed you one example i'm i'm sure there are many more attempts with with uh, bigger samples uh, to define you know the clinical and laboratory parameters uh, together with the, the inflammatory cytokines and that might uh, you know result in uh, formulation of uh, similar criteria as mas you know they might fall into the mas criteria uh, you know more studies can probably uh, you know change the scenario where i just uh, uh, mentioned to you that they do not follow the mas uh, 2016 ms criteria but, but yeah so the unique features still need to be characterized they are not very you know people have not added the own uh, some very unique feature as per my information but maybe there are clinicians here who can uh, you know show much you know, better light thank you thank you very much so do we have any more questions uh... So, if we do not have any more question, then uh, we'll uh, wind up the second uh, session of uh, today's uh, COVID-19 immunology symposium. And uh, I thank all the speakers and panelists uh, and all the participants of second session. And I will now hand over to Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarangi. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to give a brief vote of thanks to everybody. A very good evening to everyone. I believe we had a great on COVID-19 immunity today. I am thankful to all the participants for attending this symposium although virtually i am sure that all the participants attendees and audience members must have benefited immensely from this virtual symposium on covid-19 immunology which was held at iit roorkee today first of all i would like to extend my thanks to the sponsors of this symposium iit roorkee and indian immunology society especially to professor sunil arora dr amit avasti and Dr. Costa. I would like to especially thank Professor Ajit Chaturvedi, Director IIT Rurki, for his inaugural speech and continued support since the inception of this symposium idea to ensure that we could hold this symposium at IIT Rurki according to plan successfully during this difficult time. I would like to sincerely thank all the speakers and panelists for kindly accepting our invitation and giving their valuable time to us for this virtual symposium. I am extremely thankful to our keynote speakers, Dr. Shahid Jameel, Dr. Vinita Bal, and Professor Arthro Kasadewal for gracing this virtual symposium with their keynote lectures. I would like to individually thank all the speakers, Dr. Raghavan Vadrajan, Dr. Prabhuta Kundu, Dr. Manidipa Banerjee, Dr. Hemchandra Jha, Dr. Rajneesh Giri, Dr. Upasana Ray, Dr. Sunil Raga, Dr. Amit Avasti, Dr. Nimesh Gupta, Dr. Dipyaman Ganguli, and Dr. Amrendra Kumar. We are indeed fortunate to be in presence of such reputed and renowned guest speakers today. And I thank all of you for your enthusiastic participation and talks today. I'm also thankful to Dean Srik, IIT Rurki, Professor Manish Srikhande, and head of the Institute Computer Center at IIT Rurki, especially to the IT team members, Mr. Sandeep, Mr. Deepak, and Mr. Salim Javed, for providing us with all possible IT support towards organizing this event successfully. I'm also thankful to Mr. Rohit at the Media Cell IIT Roorkee for helping me to publicly, publicity and advertising this conference. I would like to acknowledge the head of the department, Professor Pravindra Kumar, and all the faculty colleagues at Department of Biotechnology, IIT Roorkee, who have helped 
in organizing this conference. Special thanks to my co-convener, Professor Shelly Tomar, Chair and Moderator of Morning Session, Professor R.P. Singh, and Chair and Moderator of the Afternoon Session, Professor Pranita Sarangi. I'm indebted to my PhD mentor and guide, Dr. Devinda Sehgal at National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi, for his guidance and support for organizing this conference. I would also like to thank the student team, Dr. Manisha Shukla, Pankaj Chandle, and Jyotish Kumar for helping me in poster presentation and doing varied background research. And lastly, I thank all the audience members, students, and participants present here who have joined us today for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, we can uh, stop now. And uh, it's been a Thank long you. day. Yeah. So uh, I hope that we can all meet in person sometime soon. And then uh, it will be a much better conference. Thank yeah, you so much for a wonderful yes. conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all.